is April 20, April 28, 2020. Uh, we're starting this meeting at 9 a.m. And hopefully, hopefully we'll be done before 4 p.m. We'll be looking to move through this. Uh, just a couple of things to mention as we get going here. Um, we probably will, when we break for lunch, we'll break for half an hour. Um, and if, if when you come back on, if you're still munch on a couple of things, that's just fine. I don't think anybody's going to care. So um, the next, next thing I want to mention is um, next our next meeting, uh, which will be on May 14th, our funding meeting. We're going to want to discuss and, and possibly pick um, a summer tour uh, location and time that, that maybe we would go look at, at one of the projects that we're funding. And so I would just remind council members to keep that in mind and, and maybe be thinking of something for our next meeting uh, or a couple of projects that you might have in mind that maybe we'd want to go visit as the summer tour. So keep that in mind. Um, before we actually get in on the full, full meeting here, I just want to mention uh, that uh, funding situation because of the you know, current COVID environment that we're in um, really hasn't changed. Uh, we're mostly working, well, we are working with restricted dollars um, from license sales. And so we're not really being affected um, by possible future uh, funding shortfalls, except that um, we're still a little fuzzy on this as to whether or not the additional 400,000 that the legislature has agreed to let us use for this next fiscal year, um, that that might be on hold, but um, like I say, that that's again, restricted money, that's not general fund money. And so um, uh, we, we're, we seem to think that that's gonna still take place. So um, with that, is there any questions so far from anybody? Okay, I don't see any. So I think what, what we're gonna do at this point, uh, I wanna make sure that the, everybody on the Habitat Council introduces themselves. And so I'll call your name. And when I do, please kind of announce who you are and, and who you represent. Um, and we'll go through the roll call that way. And after which we'll, we will go to uh, approving the minutes from our previous meeting. So with that, um, Randy, maybe uh, since you're the new guy, Fit, sitting in for Drew, you can tell us who you are first. Randy, go. Yeah, I can go forward. I'm, I'm sitting in for Drew Christian today. My name's Randy Opplinger, and I'm the Cold Water Sport Fish Coordinator for the division. Thanks, Randy. Justin, you're up. I'm Shannon, I represent wildlife. Thank you, Justin. Tyler Thompson? Tyler Thompson, I'm the Watershed Program Coordinator uh, with the Department of Natural Resources. Okay, uh, Jack. Jack Ray, the waterfowl representative. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Darren. Uh, Darren West. I'm with Mule Deer Foundation, and I'm representing Big Game. Perfect. Thank you, Darren. Dwayne. Dwayne Reading. I represent Upland Game. Thanks, Dwayne, and Paul Burnett. Uh, Paul Burnett, I work for Trout Unlimited and um, represent uh, co or represent uh, fisheries, aquatics, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. And I also want to just welcome any and all of our other Division of Wildlife or other staff that are joining us today. Uh, you'll probably get to hear from many of them as we go through a lot of these. Uh, and I would ask you that as you um, come on, uh, and present a project. So remember to introduce yourself and tell us what region you're from and and, uh, and tell us what your job is. So great. With that, um, Daniel Eddington, anything else we need to review at this time? Or Danny? Um, no, this is our approval of last week's minute. You know, it's approval of the current agenda. Okay. Um, Danny, anything, anything from you? Um, we sent out the minutes from the last meeting as well. I... Okay, 
All right, so with that, um, we will look to approve the agenda. And so um, I will look for a motion to do that. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. This is Paul Burnett. Thank you, Paul. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? This is Tyler, I'll second. Thank you, Tyler. Um, all the council people can join in and if they uh, approve, uh, say yes. All yes. Together. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Are, there, are there any opposed to that? Okay, the motion carries. Um, <clears throat> so we have an approved agenda and the next um, item of business is to um, approve our minutes from our previous meeting. Um, Daniel, you want to pull that up on screen briefly? Okay, um, we had a full agenda, our last meeting uh, with our combined uh, Blue Ribbon and Habitat Council meeting. Are there any questions about the previous meeting in the minutes? All voting was accounted for. And so I'll look for a motion at this point to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. This is Jack. I'm Thanks, Jack. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? This is Paul Burnett. I'll second. Thank you, Paul. We have a second from Paul. All in favor, say yes. 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 Okay. Are there any opposed to approving the minutes from last meeting? Okay. There are none that are opposed. So with that, the motion carries. All right. I think we're ready to jump into projects. Um, like I say, we'll look to take a break at about um, 11 a.m. Uh, we'll take lunch at around noon for a half an hour. Um, and then we'll move back in, in, into projects. So um, with that, we're gonna jump into um, Northern Region Projects, project number uh, 5248. Burnt Beaver Phase 3. Go. This is Nate. I'm the Habitat <laughs> Restoration Biologist for the region. I'll be presenting all of our projects today. And starting with Burnt Beaver to try and make things standardized for Daniel. Let's go to the map, finance, and then images for all the projects to start. Well, I'll just go through that order. So. This is a project, the third phase, we've been working with the Forest Service the last couple of years to try and do something to address the beetle kill on the north slope of the Uenas. And this particular area has a herd of bighorn sheep as well that we're trying to help facilitate their movement from the, the high country to the low country, summer to winter. And something interesting, about this project is we've started working with the Mule Deer Foundation and they've helped with a stewardship to have someone administer contracts and help the Forest Service and the Division of Wildlife increase our capacity to do good work in, in projects like this. So the treatments you're seeing highlighted here are just prep work for the burn and to the linear lines are trails. The road through there is the North Slope Road, and you can see Hoop Lake. And this, if you turn on the adjacent projects, you can see the previous phases, if you're interested, that we've done to, to do prep work. There's some lop and scatter in the green, and the blue is logging practices to continue to prep for this burn. So the plan with the Forest Service, unless the COVID-19 really derails us is to, we'll get this stuff done, burn some piles this fall and come back and, and do a large scale burn by a, a helicopter and the helitorch next year is the plan. So if you wanna go to the 
the finances, I guess. We're asking for money to contract the the treatment areas you saw there, the, the Cabell Ro Creek Road and Burnt Ridge Trail. Those are those linear features. And then Cabell Meadows, that's the, the block you saw there. Um, and you can see the bottom line there con for contractual services. That's for the stewardship agreement with MDF. And just want to point that again and let everyone know how valuable that is to us to we can't be more than one place at a time so that this kind of is allowing us to do that and if we go through the images and documents unless you want to show the habitat council ask all, all big game deer elk moose bighorn sheep so we can go through the images and if you wouldn't mind starting on the typical sheep migration image, and then we can go through there. So I, I know a lot of you have seen this, but I think it bears pointing out again, you can see the red hot spots are where sheep congregate in the summer and the winter. And then there's basically no use in that thick tree cover in between. I just imagine those sheep are panting with their tongue out getting from you know, open ridge to above tree line as they move up from winter to summer range. But interesting enough, interestingly enough, there was one ewe that wintered up high this year by Gilbert Peak. She, our best guess is waited too long and then there's just too much snow for her to move, but the collar shows she's still alive. So that would have been an interesting winter at 10,000 plus feet up there. Um, and then if you just scroll through those, I'll talk about them. The next one is just an intensity index. Shows that if we do have an ignition up there, it'd be a fairly intense fire. And so by being able to control it, set some of our lines beforehand, and then purposely ignite it, we're hoping to avoid a, a catastrophic event, if you want to use that word. Go to the next one. It's just a picture of a collared sheep on the North Slope Road there. Our biologist took this picture. Um, Justin, you may wanna get this guy a camera from newer than the 1970s, I don't know. Just a side thought there, keep going. This is what we treated in the last phase. You can see just opening up, creating a defensible space for these edges where we can, we can start a fire and have control of it. You can go through these fairly quickly. Same thing here. You can see the the feller in the background there. Hit the next one. These are some of the decks they've built, and we'll hopefully burn these this fall. Is the plan? And I think that's the last one. Maybe there's one more. Oh, there we're piling those decks there. That's the last one. So that is the the burnt beaver project phase three for us with the Forest Service on the North Slope. So any questions? Yeah, I got one. This is Justin. Can you fax me that picture? What's a fax machine? I'm Can I kidding. email it to you? <laughs> sure. Now, this is a great project. I love it. Thanks for all your efforts up there. This is good work. Okay, are there any additional questions for Robbie on this project? Okay, if not, we're gonna go through the roll call. And like I mentioned before, all of our voting will be um, in it, motion it, so we made individually. Justin? It, do you want a motion first before we go to a roll call? Yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> so yeah, I'll entertain a motion at this point. I'll make that motion that we tentatively approve this for funding consideration. Okay. Okay, Darren, that was you, right? Yes. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin made the motion, so you're good. Tyler? I vote yes. Okay. Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren seconded the motion, so we'll move to Dwayne. Yes. Thank you, Dwayne and Paul. Uh, I vote yes. Okay. Uh, the voting is unanimous, the motion carries. Okay, we'll go to the next project. Uh, 5253. You, mi 
You oh. missed Randy. Randy, you're right. Sorry, Randy. Yeah, I'll give it a yes. Okay, thank you, Randy. I apologize. Thanks for the, the fix there. Um, the motion is unanimous and carries. Okay. Apologize for that. Okay, we'll go to the next project. Uh, 5253 Red Rider. Robbie, is this you still? It's Nate, but good, good enough. It's Nate. So oh, Nate. let's let's get a drum roll on this one. It's a long day. Um, so this is a project we've developed with the Forest Service and helped plan and have done a lot of lobbying for a project like this with the Forest Service. So this is to improve summer range on the cache. Um, prescribed fire, some of this has been logged previously, again, to, to kind of set up these lines. Those SITLA blocks around it were logged previously. Um, so it's about a 14,000 acre treatment and the plan is to burn a thousand to two thousand acre blocks at a time and two blocks a year potentially three depending on conditions so it could be anywhere from two thousand to six thousand acres a year over the next few phases of this and there is a, a herbicide treatment you can see in there as well well through the forest service and, and through me we'll contract some herbicide treatment to stay ahead of any weed issues that may arise from that. You, you can see the location there, Bear Lake, the edge of the forest, a lot of summer country for deer there, really close to where we've collared, done some fawn collaring work on the unit as well. So if we wanna go to the finance, I guess. We, asking for funds for the operation to to burn these you know thousand to two thousand acre blocks and you can scroll through that and see and we'll go down to the habitat council and again an, an expensive project and we've done a lot of work with the forest and i think really developed some great relationships with them as was seen in our regional rankings most of our high ranked projects were with the forest service this year so Again, 20,000 for forest service and asking for all upland game, though certainly grouse will benefit in this area as well. So we've got some photos and you have to be patient on this one, folks. They're uploading it as a Word document. So go ahead and click on those, Daniel, and we'll give them a second to, to pull up. Oh, they just open on my computer. I must not be as security aware is Daniel. But there's some treatment conditions and desired conditions that go through this. So as you can see on the right hand slide here, there's a little bit of aspen, the yellow, and there's some still green that hasn't turned. But this project was developed with aspen in mind and these fall flights when the leaves have changed colors are really helpful. There should be a second page if you scroll down on this one as well. Again, you can see the the aspen mixed without the conifer. So we're really hopeful and well, we, we know it worked, but just glad that we're able to take this opportunity. And if you wanna just open the next one while I continue to talk to try and recapture these sites to aspen, if, why we still have an aspen component in there instead of waiting till all the aspen has been out competed by the conifer. So this is a picture of what some of the, this is from Elk Valley, which is just a few miles down the road from this where they did a small burn a few years ago. You can see the aspen regeneration there, just thousands of stands or thousands of stems per mile. It's awesome. So if you want to bring up the third one, I'll conclude this project. But this is to, to burn on the summer range in cash. So I'm not really sure what else to say, except we're excited and 
anytime Aspen is involved and you've got a helicopter dropping flaming ping pong balls, I think that's a a recipe for success. So any questions? This is Dwayne. You mentioned it was a hundred percent upland game, but it looks like it's a hundred percent big game. Oh, I, I must have misspoke. It's a hundred percent big game, but if you were so desired, there certainly will be a benefit to grouse up there. There would be, yes. Um, if it comes to the funding part of this and we need money, we can certainly switch some over to Upland Game if there's money there. Thanks, appreciate the support. And I might just mention, this goes for all the projects today, um, I did my best to estimate percentages, but if the project managers or anyone on the council has a better suggestion, feel free to speak up and we can make those changes. I would just like to say thanks for focusing on the cash, um, Robbie, because I'm just kidding. Um, no, but it's, it's that's an area that we've really wanted to um, focus on for deer for a long time. It seems like with their body condition scores, they've really struggled over the last several years. And so populations haven't done well. Um, appreciate the emphasis on that unit. Rob, or uh, Nate, maybe one quick question for me. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting names right here one of these times, but uh, um, in the case for, for burning, uh, where are you at with the clearance process to, to do burns uh, for this project? So, so Jeff Sanaki with the forest is working through that and it's everything is a go except the conditions and there's so many variables in that, you know, wind speed, humidity, wind direction. They actually did a burn up there several years ago where the smoke cleared, you know, straight up in the air and everyone thought it was great. And somehow it ended up in, in Rich County later and they had to cancel the, the Rich High School football game that Friday night because even though the smoke column rose thousands of feet in the air up on the cache miles away, it dropped down into the valley um, and, and just smoked out the entire football game. This was like 10 years ago or so. It's a story they like to tell. But so as, as long as all those conditions line up, we'll, we have the go from the forest to get this going. So, so it's hard to give you an answer, but but there's multiple locations and we've done things similar on the north slope with smaller burns where Tyler and Daniel and Allison have allowed the forest and us to just carry money over and whatever is gets the green light, we can jump on it and take quick action. So that'd be the same plan here. Great, are there any other questions about this project? If not, we'll entertain a motion. This is Paul Burnett. I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration. I have a second. Great. We have a motion from Paul and we have a second from Tyler. Yeah. Okay, so we'll run through the roll call. Uh, Justin? Yes. Justin votes yes. Tyler seconded the motion, so we'll go to Jack. Yes. Yes from Jack. Darren? Yes. Darren's a yes. Dwayne? I vote yes. Votes yes. Paul made the motion, so we'll go to Randy. Yes. Thank you, Randy. Votes yes. So the motion is unanimous and passes. All right. Thank you. We'll move on to the next project, uh, 5319 South Fork Chalk Creek. First, any ap apologies to Paul. This is his project, so hopefully I give, do justice to it. It's a great project, and feel free to jump in at any time, Paul. But if you want to zoom in a little bit there, Daniel, the linear feature with the 
the circles, that's a, a pipeline and trough system that is being installed with the landowner and the NRCS to change how they're grazing and improve that grazing re regime they're doing there. The lone dot just to the west or the left below that little block, yep, that's a culvert replacement that is a fish barrier. So this will allow fish to pass through the South Fork of the Chalk Creek. At the top of the screen, that shape is a juniper project that forestry, fire, and state lands will operate a, a little skid steer with some shears and take juniper out of that area and they'll use some of that juniper for BDAs. At the bottom of the screen, those shapes, there's another forestry practice from forestry, forestry fire and state lands, the coppice cutting. And then the just to the east of that, the small ponds, they're doing some work there as well on some stream structure, that's the stream corridor. If you click the last, yeah, you can barely see it there just above the, the Buffalo Loop. So so that's what's going on in the South Fork of the Chalk Creek, uh, just a really cool area and doing a lot of different treatments to get a benefit in, in all the areas they can attack there. So go to the, the finance page. And a, co a complicated project with a lot of moving parts, doing a lot of good. You can see, you know, art clearance, materials for BDAs, contracting crews for doing installations, juniper removal, helping cover some of the cost for forestry, fire, and state lands, different materials and supplies, and then go to the the council breakout. So, so maybe we should add some sport fish to this. And then while you think about that, we could go through the images and documents. Paul's got a lot of great photos in there. I'd probably go 50-50 sport fish and big game. So just... So that's where they'll do some juniper remo removal. You can see it encroaching into the sage there. And this country is is great winter range for, for deer and elk. S same juniper area project. You can just cycle through there, Daniel. Volunteers doing the, the BDA installation last year. Hopefully they're able to get back out on the, the stream and do that again this year as restrictions are lifted. But anything you'd like to add to that, Paul? Yeah, Nate, thank you very much for uh, presenting that. Um, I just really quickly, um, Back in it was about 2014, 2015, um, this is pretty much all private land up here. And um, we, uh, uh, as, a, as a watershed group, we developed a, uh, a coordinated resource management plan, a CRMP, among all the stakeholders up there. And um, all these projects that we're proposing, is they all kind of stem from that CRMP to kind of uh, uh, achieve several of our goals, which is improving water quality, um, <clears throat> improving the resiliency of the cutthroat trout population, improving uh, winter range, and and uh, and uh, ensuring that the rangeland productivity is is uh, sustained long term. A, lo a lot of these properties up there have uh, conservation easements on them, and um, <clears throat> so so we, as a watershed group, we wanted to put together basically a whole range of projects um, that we that that we can. Uh, accomplished at the same time. The um, the uh, two things that didn't I I don't know why, but the, the two things that didn't end up on the map that I need to add on that map is a a pasture fence uh, to improve the 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 grazing rotation 
on the Fish Creek area as well, which is basically going to parallel that that line with the water system. Um, and uh, the uh, BDA is on Fish Creek, uh, which is going to complement what we completed last year. Um, and also, uh, I'm not sure about the water system. Um, we weren't able to connect with um, UDAF in time to get a proposal in for, for their uh, water, at least for the water development uh, funding. And so this initially was, um, the proposal was to fund it through that um, with WRI. So we'll, we have, we'll have to figure out uh, how to kind of move forward with that. May, that may be a, we may pull that water system part out, but everything else uh, we, we plan to accomplish uh, <clears throat> as, as a group. So, um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Nate, again. Hey, any other questions about this project? Okay. There's no questions and entertain a motion here. This is Tyler, I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion to approve it for funding consideration with the Habitat Council uh, funding at 50% sport fish, 50% big game. Thank you, Justin, we have a second. And so we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin, you'd second the motion, so you're good. Tyler, you made the motion, so we're good there. Uh, Jack. Yeah, uh, yes. Jack votes yes, thank you. Darren? Darren West. Yeah, Dar Darren sent me, sorry, Darren sent me a text. He says he's gonna be in and out for the next little bit. So if he doesn't answer, it's not a mute issue. He's just gone. Gotcha, okay, so we'll move on to Dwayne. Yes. Dwayne votes yes, Paul? Uh, I'm going to abstain since this is my project. Thank you, Randy? Yes. Randy votes yes. Thank you, the voting is affirmative with one abstention and one missing. Um, the motion carries. All right, let's move Eric, on. To I got, the I've got a question on that last project for Paul, if you don't mind. Sure. So Paul, in your proposal, you had requested some funding from the Water Development Fund. I'm just curious if, um, if you requested that through the GIP program or not. We we didn't, we, um, I had a hard time with the the whole COVID-19 situation. I had a hard time getting uh, with the with the family in time to get a proposal together. Um, we were gonna, it was kind of my fault in that I, um, I thought we'd be able to just submit a proposal and it turned out we needed to work directly with a, with a GIP representative and we just, I just wasn't able to, um, get everybody in contact with each other in time uh, to make that happen. So, um, okay. So I guess we we'll pull that into WRI request. Then is that kind of what you're looking at? Um, I, you know, I, I, I put that in this proposal in um, to to focus on the water development funding, and not 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 for WRI funding. So I'll probably end up pulling that out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we're ready to move on to the next project. Um, 5191, UWC Forest Service North Zone. Go ahead. So this project is another project with the Forest Service and the Division of Wildlife. And as great as it is not to enter everything in the database, Sometimes when you're able to pawn that off so you can spend a day in the field, you end up with a name like the UNA Wasatch Cache Forest Service North Zone Watershed Improvements FY21 title. If I could retitle this, it would be Mule Deer Habitat Improvement Project. Um, and it's also phase four of stuff we've been doing around the hardware ranch and left hand fork area blacksmith fort canyon so we we've been doing a lot of work in this country but if you could click on the second lop and scatter tab i, I guess first we're, we're doing lop and scatter 
some road decommissioning, some weed treatments. And this map gets complicated because you have one item and then two items and then three items and different combinations of the two and three items overlapping each other. So I'm just gonna highlight the major categories for you here. So you won't see everything highlighted on the map, but this is lop and scatter treatments that we've continued to do with the Forest Service on the ranch, just juniper removal, smaller juniper removal with a focus in areas with good mountain brush component, bitter brush, service berry, sage brush, and around springs as well. And then if you could click on the affected area, this is where we haven't been able to attack some of the bigger juniper trees that we've been wanting to. So I finally pestered the Forest Service enough to let us bull hog on Forest Service up there. And this is to do the art clearance and future NEPA work required for them to give us the green light to do bull hog work. And then the road decommissioning, that linear feature going up left-hand fork, I think it's the no, it's the road parking area, terrestrial treatment road parking area. You're just gonna be chasing a lot. You can see how things overlap. These are unauthorized routes, they're closing. But if you could go to the top of that window where it says road slash parking area, up. <laughs> it's in left-hand fork where they're doing some improvements to that road and some control and decommissioning of different campsites that have been pioneered in that area. We, we, we can skip that. We've got some pictures we can look at later, but basically this is to close unauthorized route. That's it right there. That's in left-hand fork, do some work and some campsite disbursement. And I'll talk about that more through the pictures. But, but those are the major um, components of that project, lop and scatter, NEPA and art clearance for future burl hog work, um, road decommissioning and unauthorized route, and then some weed treatments as well in and among all these different areas. So let's go to the finance page. It's a complicated map, apologies for that, but I, I hope you got the idea. So, contract for the lop and scatter work, um, contract to have a art crew go through, uh, some equipment rental for the Forest Service to do these unauthorized route closures and some signage, different things like that, some other staff work, um, and then some weed treatments. And you'll see on some of those how we have FY 2022 in there as well, and that's hopeful to just continue these projects next year is the idea. And you can go down to the Habitat Council. And, and this is a big game project. There's certainly benefits to upland game and sport fish, but I don't have any problems claiming this is a 100% big game project. It's, its design is to improve winter and all season use habitat for deer, elk, and moose. So if we can go to the image and documents, just start at the first one and go through. So that's some of the stuff or remove trees that have encroached into some of these sage and bitter brush areas. Keep going. Again, just remove some of these straggler trees that have encroached out into the sage brush. Keep going. This is from the last phase. You can see the cut trees there over the hood of the truck. S still leave juniper on the landscape, but really try and give a benefit to these browse species that we're concentrating on. Okay, hit the next one. Same thing, last year's treatment. You can see the, the cut trees there. Next one. We've also really focused on these mahogany ridges in the winter. These ridges are where the deer, elk, and moose like to hang out. And so remove the juniper encroaching to these mahogany stands. Keep going. 
this is some of the stuff in left hand fork where they're working on the the road improvements and the dispersed camping arrangement so i the forest had a great term for that i can't remember what it is but they it's a picture of toilet paper that somebody left so next one more it's kind of hard to see on my screen but you can see there's toilet paper and trash in there next one there's also weeds you can see the the henbane and other stuff nice campsite where i think that stuff has been abandoned next one is this great looking tent someone left up there for the next person to use so the the forest service plans to move some rock in and create defined camping areas instead of having people putting their trash and excrement in the the river there is the design so so that's the project several moving parts any questions folks have on that one looks like an interesting project um Nate, um, yeah, if there's no, no questions, uh, we'll entertain a motion on this project. This is Paul. Um, I'll make a motion to uh, approve this for funding consideration. Okay, we have a motion from Paul. This is Dwayne, I'll second that motion. We have a second from Dwayne, thank you. Uh, we'll go through the roll call. Justin? Yes. Votes yes, Tyler? Yes. Well, yes, Jack. Yes. Well, yes, Darren. Might be on. Nope. Dwayne made the second on the motion. Paul made the motion. Uh, Randy. Yes. All right. We voting is an affirmative. The motion carries. All right. Thank you, Nate. Two more. Bear River Watershed. Resilience phase one, 5270, go. So this is another project with the forest. If you wanna zoom out a little bit, there's highway 150 and the North Slope Road runs east through that top um, polygon. This is for NEPA and to get um, ship, do the art clearance, get NEPA done and work ahead to do some burning in the forest that they've talked about getting this to a more phases. They just couldn't get back to me on the answer to a map of their future phases and plans. I'm not sure if it's developed yet, but they, they do plan on working to the east from here and hopefully we can meet, meet up with that burnt beaver project. There's just so much opportunity to do good work on the forest service. So that, So this would be, the first phase to then come in and do any kind of mechanical treatments that are needed to set up a, a burn in the future. Um, this project doesn't have any pictures uploaded to it because there's nothing done yet, or but there's dead dead conifer and struggling aspen stands in this area. They did a burn if you do the adjacent projects just south of the the west polygon there that little green square where the mouse pointer is right now call that the Whitney Reservoir burn and that's really awesome to walk through that now and see the aspen gener regeneration through there so just hoping to continue to do um that across the the entire north slope so we can move over to the finance page. So again, this is just for the the art clearance and to get NEPA set up. NEPA set up. And again, this is going to be a project where we receive facilitation help from the Mule Deer Foundation to to fund and administer contracts on this project. So super exciting stuff. And we can look at the the council ask. It should be a hundred percent big big game, yeah. So again, this will be a, a project that benefits deer, elk, and moose on the North Slope, and 
really cool. Some of this country they're treating there, the collars show deer going right through this project and over to fairly close to some of the stuff on the South Fork that Paul's project is treating. So pretty neat how that stuff is interconnected. So no, no images on this project, but any questions? Okay, so if we, if we don't have any questions, uh, do we have a motion? This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to approve it for funding consideration. Okay, this we have a motion from Tyler. Tyler. Second. Second from Jack. Thank you. Go through the roll call. Uh, Justin? Yes. Justin votes yes. Tyler made the motion. Jack seconded. Darren, not sure if you're on yet. Nope, we'll go to Dwayne. I vote yes. Dwayne votes yes. Paul. I vote yes. Paul votes yes. Randy. And I vote yes too. Randy votes yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Nate, last one. Uh, 5310 Raft River Aspen Restoration Project, phase three. This is the second phase of a project with the sawtooth forest up on the Raft River Mountains and some tree removal and burning to increase aspen vigor and create a lot of good habitat along these stream corridors. It's more on the west side of the Raft River range there. Yeah, right in there. Um, these are areas that we had two years ago, a meeting with the Forest Service. So they're out of Idaho, the Sawtooth, and some of our staff went up there, all of our sections and their Forest Service staff. And we spent two days on the rafts developing projects after we had such great success with the, the Lynn Bench project from must be four years ago now. They, they've really tied into WRI and, and what we can provide them in getting work done on the forest. They, they tell us that we get, they get more work done on the small Raft River range than all of the Sawtooth Forest in Idaho because they just can't hire contractors and do the things we're able to do. So, so different treatments here, some pile and burn, some lop and scatter, and burning some piles that have been already created from past treatments. So that's what the the map is and this will be a benefit to mule deer and sage grouse that summer and brood up there and aspen health remove encroaching juniper and some of the mountain brush in areas as well. So we can go to the finance page. This one should be 90 10 for big game and upland game for the, the council ask, but just con asking for money to contract the lop and scatter and the, the cut and pile. And then later the forest service comes and burns those piles. Yeah, 90-10 for big game and upland game. And we've got a few images on this one. So this is what we're trying to treat. You can see, hopefully on your screen, there's a few aspen in there. Some of them have died and fallen over and hopefully you just remove a little competition from that aspen, get some vigor coming back in there. And especially with some of these small scale burns, the results have been promising so far and not in this project, but the, pro the forest is doing another project through WRI their riparian phase is what they're calling it. They are working to move some troughs around and create some fence and new pasture that will help alleviate some of the grazing pressure on these aspen stands as well. So you can go to the next photo. Just another area that you can see a little bit of aspen doing well, a lot of aspen not doing great, hoping to increase the aspen doing doing well 
go to the next one. S same story here, try and get some vigor back in these pretty distinct stands of aspen. They're very confined. Go to the next photo. Should be, yeah, these are some of the treatment areas from the last phase. You can see where the small trees have been cut and piled and they'll come back and burn these piles. There may be one more photo. No, that's it. So that's the project on the rafts. Just increase forest health and basically be a surrogate for forest fire that hasn't been around for so many years and do it in a way that we have control over and get the desired results. Any questions on this one? Okay, it's a quiet group this morning, but uh, we'll look for a motion here. Uh, this is Justin. I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding consideration. Thank you, Justin. This is Dwayne. I'll second that motion. We have a second from Dwayne. We'll go through the roll call. Justin made the motion, so Tyler, you're up. I vote yes. Thank you, Tyler. Jack? Yes. Thank you, Jack. Darren? Oh, Darren. Okay, Dwayne seconded the motion, so Paul? I vote yes. Paul votes yes. Thank you. Randy? I vote yes, too. Randy votes yes. Okay, we have affirmative uh, voting, and so the motion carries. Thank you. All right, Nate, you're off. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Hey, great. Thanks, Nate. great job, Nate. This is Justin. Those are, those are great projects. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to move to Southern Region. We'll start with uh, Project 5198. Um, let's see, Gary, are you online or Kendall? You're, yeah, this is, that you? this is Kendall. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you good. So go ahead. So my name is Kendall. Introduce yourself first. Yeah, Kendall All Bagley, right. uh, habitat restoration biologist out of the Richfield area. Today I'll be presenting a couple projects on behalf of Kelly Cornwall. This will be the first one. It's uh, Monroe Mountain Aspen Ecosystems Phase Five. And with this project, it's similar to the other projects that Kelly and, and Craig and Jason Kling has put together on the Monroe Mountain. Um, we're looking to improve through mechanical thinning and conifer uh, encroachment over 2,300 acres with 312 acres of mechanical thinning and fencing around private lands. 447 acres of beetle kill spruce thinning through a, a traditional timber cell, prescribed burning of upwards of 3,500 acres. And they need to clean up a few piles that uh, they've, they've harvested and stacked kind of uh, east of Kishur, or west of Kasherm there. And uh, that'll be about 700 acres. Uh, seeding around 2,500 acres, and they're gonna install probably around four or five BDAs associated with this project as well. So the Monroe Mountain, uh, obviously it's located in central Utah, uh, south of Richfield, west of Kasherm, east of Marysville. There's been a lot of work done in the past. Uh, I think we're approaching almost 28,000 acres of treated across the Monroe uh, in the first four phases. Uh, so with this five, fifth phase, we're looking to treat upwards of about 6,700 acres um, Daniel's been clicking on on some of the uh, some of the features, so you can kind of see some of the BDAs. You can see where Kelly's looking to do some prescribed burning. Most of it is we've focused a lot on the south end of the Monroe, so we're kind of moving to the north and then cleaning up some spots in the center. Um, this is some prescribed fire that he's got uh, scheduled. Uh, we've done some strip felling up in the top, kind of by Annabella Reservoir and um, up on that north end uh, by Big Lake. So they'll try to clean that up this year and, and uh, get it kind of taken care of and, and uh, finish out that portion up there. But for the most part, this was a uh, number two ranked project in the southern region. Uh, our mule deer are below objective on the Monroe. Elk are on the lower end of the objective. Um, if you want to go to the finances, 
So with the Forest Service, they've been they've been really proactive of trying to get a lot of uh, additional funding. So as you look down through there, uh, we're asking for seven hundred and seventy three thousand dollars for this project. They're bringing almost eight hundred and thirty nine thousand dollars worth of in kind to the project. Um, got some personal services, uh, contractual services, stuff associated with uh, the fire uh, to pull the fire off. If you go down a little bit farther, Daniel, I think they're seeking about 20,000 uh, for the project through Habitat Council. Uh, as you can see, they've got a lot of Forest Service dollars through Joint Chief, uh, through the NRCS this year. And through the watershed, they're looking at 753,000. So it's 100% big game is what Kelly's got put on here. But I do think we got value to uh, to some sage grouse on the lower end, uh, around the fringe, around the, the Burville area. Um, definitely some of the work they've done up uh, on the south end has benefited some of the grouse. Um, also, turkey will, will benefit from them. So, but looks like Kelly's put mainly um, big game. Here's some pictures of some fire that happened last year. I think we possibly burned around a little over 10,000 acres up there, uh, more of a mosaic type pattern. Uh, we were able to seed a lot of that stuff later last fall. Here's some areas that we went into and, and burned, but we did some strip filling in some of those areas, which uh, Kelly and those guys really like where they can just ignite, gives that stuff an opportunity to um, sit and dry out and then they ignite right off those those strip filling portions so any questions and though this is tyler yeah tyler. question for you um with all of the restrictions on prescribed burns this spring uh has that set the project back at all you know i haven't talked to to kelly uh much about that i don't know where they're at i know we can't get a pole canyon very far from the south. Um, There's a fence contractor going in there and to do those letdown fences, and he can't get above um, above the clay pit very very far right now. So I don't know. Uh, I haven't really talked with them about it to to see what their their goals or objectives are. I know they've got some seasonals talking to Craig yesterday out on the ground doing some surveys. So I don't know if it's pertaining to some burns or just kind of getting things ready, but. Uh, yeah, I, have, I I can't answer that question, so I don't I don't really know, but I do know they're they're trying to get up there to, to take a look at some of those areas for sure. Will you check back with them? We're just we're just concerned that if there is a delay that's happening with prescribed burns this spring, that maybe this full amount won't be needed for next year. Okay, so just let us know if there's a funding change. Okay. Any additional questions for Kendall on this project? Okay, if there's no further questions, uh, look for a motion then. This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to approve it for funding consideration. We have a motion from Tyler. This is Paul Burnett. I'll second it. We have a second from Paul. We'll go through the list. Justin. Yes. Justin votes yes. Tyler made the motion. Jack Ray. Yes. Jack votes yes. Thank you. Darren, are you back on? Nope. Dwayne. I vote yes. Dwayne votes yes. Paul seconded the motion. So Randy, you're up. Yes. Randy votes yes. Thank you. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll go to the next one, uh, 5232. Uh, Burville Collaboration Ecosystem Restoration Project. Who's up for that one? Can you hear Gary, me? Is that you? Kendall, you're up. Yeah, yeah, it's mine. Okay. Uh, so the Burville Collaboration uh, Ecosystem Project uh, was put together by Kelly Cornwall and quite a few of us. Uh, Kelly's the, the main program manager on it. Um, this project uh, is located just north of Kasherm and kind of around the town of Burville, kind of one of these last little uh, stops uh, 
mainly put together by forestry, fire, and state lands, BLM, SITLA, private landholders. Um, and we're, what we're doing is looking to do a, a lot of different treatments in this area. So we'll do some two-way chaining, do some bull hog mastication. Forestry, fire, and state lands is going to do some defensible space around some of the cabins. Um, associated around Burville and the town, and then also uh, Elk Mountain Estates up on the Monroe Mountain, just a little bit farther. So uh, it's a great project. Um, it's a great uh, collaboration with a lot of different agencies looking to treat roughly around 4,800 acres of mountain brush and sagebrush grass forb areas. It'll include 10 miles of fencing along the BLM and US Forest Service boundaries. Uh, it'll allow them to put in a boundary fence to kind of hold those cattle through uh, grazing rotation systems between the BLM and the forest. Um, purpose is to improve uh, wildlife habitat, including big game transition and winter range, protect structures uh, at risk of wildfire, reduce wildfire risk to the public and firefighters, and the community of Burville has around 23 structures that need some defensible space. So. They've really tried to partner with us on this and, and put together some, some forestry, fire, and state monies uh, to, to kind of help us out and, and kind of do some of the de de defensible space around Burville there. Uh, we figure we can probably pull this off for about $386 an acre through all of it. Um, if you want to go to the budget, so contractal services, We'll have to do for dispensable space, uh, mastication. Uh, you'll see that contract service in there. Chaining on the forest service, uh, roughly around 860 acres. Uh, some hand thinning will occur on the forest service, and then we'll have some bull hog mastication on the private as well. Uh, aerial seeding contract along with the seed for the for the project. Uh, the private property work through forestry, fire, and state lands on that. Uh, construction of the 10 miles worth of fence between BLM and the forest. We'll go ahead and contract that portion of that out. Uh, I think down on the funding, put, we put $20,000 requested from Habitat Council as well on that. 90-10 uh, split, big game, upland game. We've got some turkeys in that area. Uh, I think would benefit from from some of the work that's going to take place on the forest and on the BLM. I think there's a few pictures in there, Daniel. So these are kind of some of the conditions. Uh, they'll be hand thinning some of the little stuff and then uh, working above there on the mastication. I think this is a picture from the BLM. Some more areas where they'll be doing some mastication work. Next, kind of an overview. You'll kind of see that that's kind of some of the lower country where their treatments have been done. They just want to move these treatments up the up the range a little bit. A lot of wintering deer. This is was number one. Uh, yeah, number one deer project in the southern region, number six turkey project, number four elk project. This project ranked number three in the southern region. Any questions? All right, thanks Kendall. You bet. We have a motion on this project. Eric, this is Justin. I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding. Okay, we have a motion from Justin. This is Darren West, I'll second. We have a second from Darren. Thank you, Darren. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin made the motion, so we'll go to Tyler. I vote yes. Votes yes. Go to Jack. Yes. Votes yes. Darren seconded the motion, so we'll move on to Dwayne. Oh, yes. Dwayne votes yes. Paul. I vote yes. Paul votes yes. Randy. And I also vote yes. Thank you, Randy. All right. Uh, voting is unanimous and motion carries. Thanks, everybody.
Darren, it's good to have you back on. All right, next project, 5229 Ranch Creek Watershed Improvement Project Phase 2. Howdy, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. This, Thanks, Jim. This is Jim Lamb. I'm presenting this project for Mike Golden in the part of the Dixie National Forest. You uh, map that project, Daniel. This is a fairly involved project. This watershed has a remnant population of Bonneville cutthroat trout, and I think that's what started people thinking about doing some treatments in this area. If you'll do adjacent projects just for a second, Daniel, all of the red areas that are going to show up here on your screen are are treatments that they've done in the riparian area in this area, and then the green area is what they did last year: seventeen hundred acres worth of of work. Now back to some of these different treatments that they're proposing for this phase. If you can scroll down and hit a couple of those. They're, they're attacking this several different ways and what they're afraid of is having a catastrophic wildfire event here, blowing out these streams and losing this population of cutthroat trout. Bonneville cutthroat trout are the native trout to this drainage, the Bonneville Basin, uh, which came clear down here. So, these trout lack uh, resiliency and, and uh, they also have whirling disease. So trying to do some pretty good work here to help them. Also right on this map where it shows Dixie National Forest, in those letters you can see the strip logging that was done up on the top of there. That has a pretty good population of dusky grouse that use that area in the wintertime. And this basin down here below, if we could get some aspen back into that, I think that would really help give those guys a boost. We also have sage grouse in the in the lowlands and all of these treatments across the bottom that are working with pinyon juniper that are invading into sagebrush steppe. That would help the sage grouse in that area. You can see the pivots on the left-hand edge of your map. <clears throat> this is Sweetwater Ranch. We have killed elk there, pronghorn there, mule deer there. On all of these foothills should be areas where those animals can have a chance to go. Daniel, if you'll go to images. And just show a few of the pictures we have. This is this is what the upper areas look like where we would like to get our aspen back. There's a couple of pictures of that where that spruce is invaded and created some really decadent stands with some real high fuel loadings. And this is this is where they're afraid of having a fire come through that. And then the last picture he has loaded here shows kind of the lower elevation with the Pinion juniper infill moving down into the sage step. Uh, 1,700 acres treated last year. It looks really good. I don't have any um, after pictures, but it looks really good. We did a tour through there this, this last summer. Uh, finance page. I think what we're asking from Habitat Council is 20,000 of a total of 783,000. This is expensive because we've got so many different components going into work on it. And we're, we're hoping that this phase will prepare us for somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 acres of fire and the 90-10 split on big game and upland game. We've also got wild turkeys that run around in that country back and forth, but I don't have uh, current estimates of how many. Are there any questions about Ranch Creek? I've got one. This is Justin. I'm not entirely sure how to ask it. Um, I, I mean, clearly this is a big game project with some upland game benefit, but it might just be conversation for the council more than anything. Um, a lot of what Jim talked about at the first was protecting these streams for aquatics and that type of stuff. I, I'm not really sure where the balance is on if it's not a direct um, restoration effort for aquatics we probably shouldn't use those funds but i, I do think this is certainly going to help um the, the fisheries component maybe not this year but maybe five years from now when, when we do get some type of event um, i'm comfortable with the funding source the way it is i just wanted to make sure everybody else was was fine with it as well so i think one of the major um <clears throat> potential additions to projects like this that could be um that could provide some significant aquatic benefits would be to 
incorporate um, use use any of the materials that are uh, especially the large larger trees um, that are harvested using a using this method and, and adding them to streams in a strategic way so that there's a you know some large woody debris additions that sort of thing that increase the roughness and the diversity of the the um, aquatic system um, and a lot of systems that 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 component is really missing and um, you know it it definitely takes a lot more um, you know in terms of planning and and uh, design and that sort of thing but those those types of uh, improvements would be would be actually really significant for the for the aquatic system. This is Gary Bez, and I'm going to just weigh in to uh, Paul's dead on, and that's actually what we did do with the phase one and phase two with this project. They focused a lot more right in the riparian corridors, and so that direct benefit to the cutthroat trout really happened in those first two phases. So Justin's summarizing it very well. There's definitely benefit to the sport fish um, as we treat the uplands, but this is shifting more into the big game phase of the, the entire watershed project. I, I love it. Eric, if there's no other comments, I'd make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding consideration. Hey, Justin, sorry to, to jump in. This is Darren. Oh, hey, Darren. I, sorry, I've been, I'm finally done with that other call. I apologize to y'all. Um, Daniel, could you just go back to the species ranking real quick? Okay, thanks. That's all I got. Great, so we, we have a motion from Justin. Do we have a second? This is Tyler. I'll this second. is Paul Burnett. I'll second. Go ahead, okay. Tyler. Uh, we have a second from Tyler. All right, we'll run through the roll call. Uh, Justin made the motion, Tyler made the second. So, Jack, Ray. Yes. Votes well, yes, thank you. Darren. Yes. Votes well, yes, thank you, Dwayne. Yes. Votes yes. Thank you, Paul. Yes. Votes yes. Thanks, Randy. Yes. Votes yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, all votes are yeses, and the motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. We're going to move on to the next one. Uh, Fifty-three fourteen Gooseberry Shared Stewardship Project Phase One. So this, this is Kendall again. I'll be presenting this project on behalf of Kelly Cornwall. So project ID 5314, uh, the Gooseberry Shared Stewardship Project, phase one. Uh, project is located on the Fish Lake, on the kind of on the north end of the Fish Lake, uh, over there just uh, east of Gooseberry. And the project is, will improve wildlife and fish habitat, including big game transition and winter range utilization in a mix, uh, mixed mechanical method to treat roughly around 4,800 acres of mountain brush through, uh, and sagebrush and grass forb areas. The project will also retreat and maintain existing historical treatments to, and provide a one mile of Aspen exclusion fencing. This is a multi-phase project that will be implemented over the next two to four years uh, with the Fish Lake National Forest. Project area consists of mainly US Forest Service land, but also includes 174 acres of private. It's associated kind of with the Bar J um, property up there on around Gooseberry. But the overall purpose of this project is to improve vegetative uh, resilience by increasing abundance of diversity of native shrubs and perennial grasses and forbs, uh, improve wildlife habitat transition and winter range. It's just been an area that's uh, just kind of been neglected a little bit. Uh, we've had a lot of depredation issues in the in the Gooseberry area. Gives us an opportunity to, to uh, do some treatments, uh, provide additional forage, uh, try to hold those deer, those elk out of those hay fields, uh, improve some areas and opportunities for wild turkeys um, that are in that area as well. Uh, great project that Kelly's put together. Um, it did go through a, a little bit of shared stewardship. It just didn't rank very high this year. Uh, there was just portions of it that uh, kind of ranked out. So we're going through the watershed initiative with this project. 
Uh, you can see as Daniel's moving through there, uh, some of the bull hog units, some of the areas uh, we're gonna two-way chain, um, some seeding, some of the vegetation uh, cut, scump, cut stump areas, and some of the wildlife exclusion areas uh, that they have associated with this project. So I know the Forest Service has been out on the ground already flagging some of these sites. I think there's some cultural resource. If we go to the budget finance page, yeah, there's got some, some hand thinning, mastication, uh, the chaining contract, and some of the fuels dollars associated with monitoring. Um, I know, yeah, there's the bar J with the legacy. I think some of this stuff is has been done or is looking to be done with forestry fire and state lands to, to help out on the private as well. So go down to the funding. Watershed initiatives, one, about 1 1.3, and we're looking to Habitat Council for around 20,000. Uh, 90 10 split, that gives us uh, kind of an upland game component as well with turkey and, and some grouse in that area, um, mainly big game transitional zone for elk and mule deer. Some documents that he's got there associated with some of the fish lake EA, um, some of the monitoring techniques that they're using on the rocks, also some of the fuel breaks, um, multi things there as far as uh, deer transects and some of the gooseberry stuff and Brown's hole. So. Any questions on this project? It's a good project. I think that we can probably get it done for about $292 an acre uh, associated with this. Obviously our mule deer are below objective on the fish lake and the elk are on the bottom end of the objective for the fish lake. All right, thanks Kendall. Yeah, the last call for questions or comment on the project. All right, if we don't have any more comments, uh, any idea on a motion here? This is Darren West. I'll uh, make a motion to tentatively approve this for funding. Thank you, Darren. This is Paul, I'll second. All right, we have a second for Paul. All right, we'll run through the roll call. Uh, Justin. I vote yes. Justin votes yes. Tyler. I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Darren made the motion, so we'll go on to Dwayne. Yes. Dwayne votes yes. Paul seconded, so we'll go to Randy. Yes. Randy votes yes. Okay, voting is affirmative and motion carries. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna to move to 5379 Indian Peaks WMA Mule Deer Habitat Improvement Project Phase Two. You're up. All right, good morning, everybody. This is Kevin Bunnell. Um, I'll be presenting this with the help of, of Curtis Roundy. He's really done the most of the legwork on this, but I appreciate him. Got some good me figure uh, out. Got some good birding background noise going on there. That's kind of great. I'm out on my front porch. It's a beautiful day in Southern Utah, so. Perfect. Um, if we could on the maps, pull up the, the, the burn polygons. And then zoom in there a little bit. So this year we're, we're hoping to prep Indian Peak itself. It's um, for a burn, it, it's, an area that's owned um, most of the original Kevin, you're you're cutting out on us. And BLM. Yeah, somebody just tried to call me. Sorry, so it comes through on my iPad. Okay. Anyway, it's a joint. Uh, the burn itself will be a joint project between Division of Wildlife and and BLM. Um, really, what we're trying to do with this project is uh, demonstrate the use of, of fire in, in this West Desert um, habitat type. 
we think we can do a lot of good here, maybe the best way to, to demonstrate what we're trying to do is if you'd go to the images. And then go to the video. And click on that box burn. If we can get that to run. What you're seeing here, this is a project that we worked on with, with the funding for the current year. And you can see that ring that's that's um, all the way around this mountain out. This is also out on Indian Peaks. The idea here is we've, we cut a ring of, of PJ about 200 feet um, wide all the way around this, um, this hill here. And we're hoping that early or early this summer or, or next fall, we're going to light that entire ring and just let it burn to the center. We'd like to do the same thing up on the actual peak. And so we will be prepping um, the peak this year, uh, doing a similar thing, cutting this ring around it. There's already roads all the way around the peak. Um, again, the backside is BLM. The front side is, is Division of Wildlife. We think we can do, this is a, a picture of Indian Peak itself. This is what we'll be prepping for a burn. There is some some remnant aspen stands here. There's a lot of mahogany that, that will lay the fire down. We, we anticipate we'll get a really nice mosaic and make really good, um, some nice habitat. Now the funding, if you look at it, it's a, it's a little bit different. There's some sticker, sticker shock there unless, before we um, kind of explain things. We're asking not for $977,000, but for 570, with the idea being that if we can't, um, do things for the burn, we will take the, the money that's um, awarded to the project and do some lop and scatter and some bull hog down lower on the on the wildlife management area. So um, it's an either or project, not a both, but we're, we're proposing it. Um, we propose it that way, knowing that there's um, some risk in or some some uncertainty in whether we can get a burn pulled off each in a, in a given year. So with that, um, the funding is, I think it was originally put 100% for big game. Um, I know Tyler is looking at this project for some habitat or some um, benefit to sage grouse and using it as part of the, the habitat bank that's being established. So it'd probably be appropriate to add some upland game funding into this. I'm not sure at what percentage we should do that. Um, Curtis? Now that I've bumbled through that, do you want to fix everything that I messed up? Well, you did a great job. Uh, I think the only other thing here is there are some wild horse concerns on the WMA, and we have addressed some of those by having capture crews come and remove some of these horses. But when we get these bigger treatments in place, we're hoping to be able to round up some of the other horses with the BLM capture crews when they come through the area next time. Uh, what happened last time was those horses got into some of these thicker patches of trees that we're now treating and working on. And then they would just stand in the middle of the trees and look up at the helicopter. And so these treatments will also help alleviate some of the pressure from the wild horses that are on the WMA once we get those removed off of there and create a haven for wildlife yeah let just just one more thing go back to the images if you would and and just to the pictures and click on the top the first one that shows up there uh, i don't know if you can see it very well or not but about going right up towards the top of the peak there you can see a line oh, actually that's the wrong picture anyway i was trying to show that that's not it there's a the, the line that shows the, where the Division of Wildlife property ends and the BLM starts, but it's not it's not showing up in that image. I, might, I think I uploaded the wrong one. But anyway, um, I think we can use fire um, out, in the, out in this West Desert eco, ecosystem and do it in a way that, and improve habitat in a way that's more cost effective and we can get larger chunks of land done um, at a time. If you straight up, straight across the valley from Indian Peaks, there's a burn that took place. That, uh, it was a fire or a, a lightning strike that burned, I don't know, maybe five or 6,000 acres about 15 years ago. And it just sucks in, um, especially elk, but also deer in, 
in a big way. And we would like to recreate some of that on Indian Peaks, uh, more with an emphasis on deer because we have a better for or a better forb and uh, brush component there where we can maintain the, the mahogany and, and, and invigorate the bitter brush and the, the sage brush. That's all I've got. Before we go on to other questions, I'll also note that um, we did quite a bit of work with some sportsmen's groups on this, um, especially people out of Minersville, Milford area. We were working with them to try and, you know, people that were super familiar with the historic mule deer habitat on the WMA out here. And part of their input was what we used to design the layout for the lop and scatter and the bull hog polygons that would be treated if the fire doesn't happen. We just wanted to make sure that we weren't going to take out areas that were historically pinion and juniper or used by mule deer, but we wanted to come in and treat the areas and improve them and have mule deer specifically in mind, understanding that elk are there and pronghorn antelope are there and uh, possibilities for multiple uses. But this project was designed specifically with mule deer in mind. Great, any other questions for uh, Kevin or Curtis on this project? Yeah, this is Darren West. Either one of you guys can uh, take this. Is this uh, on the Beaver Dairy Unit? No, it's not. It's on the Southwest Desert Deer Unit. Okay. And uh, what you did mention that it would affect aspen regeneration as well? There, there are some really small remnant patches of, of aspen um, on Indian Peaks. Um, I don't know what how large a potential we have to get, you know, large scale Aspen back, but we should help the little bit that's still there. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I would I would call it an, an overall Aspen regeneration project. There's just not not a lot left. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's great though to if there's some there to save and see if we can expand that. This is Tyler. Kevin mentioned this, so I'll address it. Um, the project from last year, it, we are using that to enroll in the sage rust mitigation program. Uh, that being said, I probably wouldn't recommend adding any sage grouse funding to it just because the upland fund is already over allocated. In the past, we've kind of used sage grouse as a filler for that upland fund if there isn't um, other projects that, that fit that fund better than sage grouse. So. That's my recommendation. In fact, I'd even make a motion if we're done with comments to approve it for funding consideration. Any other comments? I'll second. All right, uh, we have a motion uh, from Tyler and a second from Paul. Um, before we go through the voting, I just want to mention, you know, it's great to have one of our regional supervisors jump in both feet along with our habitat staff down in the southern region and, and assist and, and work together and take on a project and, and, and jump in. So, um, yeah. I, I Eric, Eric, I'm not sure Curtis would agree with you. I think this project been more work for him having me involved than it would be otherwise, but I sure appreciate what I've been learning. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. So, so good job on that, both of you. All right. So, oh. Eric, before, before we vote, I've got one more question. I just want to make sure I heard Curtis correctly. He, Curtis, when you were talking about the wild horses, we're not using um, Habitat Council dollars for the wild horse removals. Is that correct? We're, you're just saying in the past when we've tried to, to round up horses, they've used that tree cover, which has been a um, added difficulty in getting them. We're not using Habitat Council dollars for those removal efforts? That's correct, we're not. We are using Habitat Council dollars to remove the trees that uh, thwarted the effort of horse removal, but the horse removal project was BLM dollars removing them off of our land. Okay, and I just wanna make sure I heard that correctly, so thanks. And just so the council understands, the, the WMA is completely fenced, but the fences aren't 100% horse proof and they get in once in a while. The BLM has been very helpful um, in working with us to keep horses off the WMA, um, but it's not 100% um, successful. 
All right, some good discussion there. Any any final questions on this? Okay, if not, we're going to go through a roll call. We already have a motion and a second. So, uh, let's see, Justin, you're up. I vote yes. Justin votes yes. Thank you. Tyler made the motion. Uh, Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Thank you. Darren. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dwayne. Yes. Votes yes. Thank you. Paul had seconded the motion, right? And so, Randy. Yes. Well, yes. All right. Motion carries. And thank you very much. We'll move on to the next project. Uh, 5187 Mud Springs Phase 3. Go ahead. This project is my project. This is Curtis Roundy, Southern Region Habitat Restoration Biologist. I'll be presenting for Jake Shoppy and the Powell Ranger District on the Powell uh, Dixie National Forest Powell Ranger District. So this is a phase three continuation of projects that have been going on similar to this in the area. We've been going through the Mud Springs NEPA area and trying to uh, pick the low hanging fruit. So this is another low hanging fruit project with 1,913 acres of lop and scatter work and 251 acres of bull hog work. And the lop and scatter work is uh, historic sagebrush flats that were utilized by sage grouse and prairie dogs and as well as big game species like pronghorn antelope, mule deer and elk. And then the bull hog areas are areas kind of up on the little hills and benches that have gone from the phase one more to the phase two, phase three uh, portion and would need mastication there. But the understory in and surrounding those bull hog areas is still fairly well intact. And so we would look to just masticate without seed there. Um, we've done projects similar to this for the last couple of years and been really successful with it. And we would look to continue it. If you look at some of the lop and scatter areas on the map too, it might look like the trees are super really thick in there, but a lot of the trees that you're seeing in there are ponderosa pine. And so uh, what we would do is remove pinion and juniper trees while leaving the ponderosa pine and so areas that look really thick, like what you're seeing on the screen now, part of that tree cover is gonna be ponderosa pine and they would look to leave those trees there. So it doesn't look like your historic lop and scatter polygon with just a few sparse trees, but we are trying to preserve the ponderosa pine, remove the pinion and juniper. So um, in the pictures section, Daniel, there there's a couple of pictures of what the past treatment projects look like. And so you can see the ponderosa pine remnant that was being left behind by a bull hog right there. And then in the next picture, you'll see the sagebrush flat with the pinion and juniper removed and the ponderosa pine left. So that's more of what we're looking to do. They didn't put any pictures in this project of the actual treatment area that's outlined in this project, but same type of stuff, same general area as what those pictures are showing. And we look to have similar results to what we've had in the past two treatments so far. With that, we'll go to the funding page. This project is asking for $10,000 worth of Habitat Council money. And I believe it's citing 100% um, big game. There is definitely gonna be some sage grouse use in this area. There's a lek just to the north of this and they use this all summer long in this treatment area. There's also non-game wildlife um, with the prairie dog usage. So most of your lop and scatter polygons on this project would be utilized by both sage grouse and prairie dogs. I don't know exactly what the council feels like as far as numbers are concerned, but there's definitely more than just big game use in this project. 
that, I'll take any questions you guys have. All right, thanks, Curtis. Uh, any, uh, looking for a motion on this one. This is Jack, I'll move to tentatively approve. Okay, we have a motion from Jack. This is Darren West, I'll second. All right, we have a second from Darren. Thank you, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin. Yes. Votes yes. Tyler. Yes. Votes yes. Jack made the motion, Darren seconded it. So we'll go to Dwayne. I vote yes. Votes yes, Paul Burnett. I vote yes. Randy Uplinger. And I also vote yes. Votes yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Um, next one. Project 4898. Uh, Arrowhead. Hamlin Valley Vegetation Enhancement Project. Go ahead. This is Curtis again. Habitat restoration biologist in the southern region. I'll be presenting this project for you today. It is um, a BLM project. Doug Bayless is the project manager for this project, but it's been um, lots of different people within the BLM working to make this happen for several years now. So those of you who are familiar with this area of the world, the NEPA was challenged a couple of years ago and they went back and redrafted some of the NEPA documents to be able to continue with the project work. So we're really excited. The NEPA is back on board now and we're going to start doing Curtis, work. this is Tyler. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, go ahead. So I had a conversation with Paul Briggs from the Cedar City office last week about the NEPA. And I think what we decided is given that the NEPA hasn't been um, issued yet they still anticipate it might be three four weeks before that comes out and the fact that it's a pretty controversial NEPA document they pretty much 100 percent expect it to be appealed so what we basically decided is for all of these Hamlin Valley projects that are tied to that NEPA we're not going to assign funding to it for this next round so with that I think I'd make a motion Eric to go ahead and table this project all right, sounds good. Thanks, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any, any other discussion on this? Okay, thanks for pointing that out, Tyler. Um, so we have a motion to table this project. T Tyler, do you mean table it until we find out or just for the entire year and we'll revisit this next year? For the entire year, so we're just going to remove it from consideration for fiscal 21 for WRI. I think we should do the same for Habitat Council. Got it. Okay. Okay, we have a motion to remove consideration. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll go ahead and second that, Eric. Okay, thanks, Randy. So we have a motion and we have a second. I uh, will go through the roll call. Uh, Justin. Uh, yes, I think it's unfortunate though. These are, in reviewing the projects, these are great. Um, so I hope to see them next year, but my vote is yes. Okay. So you're, you're to clarify, uh, council members are voting uh, to table the project. So it's yes or no on to table the project for next year. So Justin Correct. votes yes. Okay. And we, the, Tyler made the motion. Uh, Jack, you're up. Yes. Okay, hey, Jack votes yes. Darren. Yes. Darren votes yes. Dwayne. I vote yes also. Votes yes. Paul. I vote yes. All right. And Randy seconded the motion, so we're good to go there. So the motion carries to be tabled and be reconsidered for next year, but not this year. And the voting was unanimous on that motion. Any questions about that? It's a little bit different. Yeah, I've, I've got one. Tyler, Tyler said all projects. So are there other ones that are gonna be um, 
coming forth that we need to work this on? Or are you just talking about your your WRI ones, Tyler? Uh, I don't think there's any other ones for Habitat Council. Daniel, can you confirm that? Or Allison? I would have been presenting them. I can confirm that there are no other Hamlin Valley projects that would be tied to that NEPA that'll be presented to Habitat Council. There are some that were um, presented for WRI only that would be now tabled, but no others for Habitat Council. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't see any. That's why I was asking. So thanks for the clarification, Tyler. And, and Justin, I'll just say I'll just say the same thing that you said. These are extremely important projects in this area, and it, it'll be soon enough that we'll get back to implementation in Hammond Valley. Fair enough. Yeah, and I'll just clarify too. the The motion was was we're, we're voting project by project, and so the motion would have to be just for the one project. So that's that's how we uh, acted on that. So, okay, we're going to move on to the next one. Um, project 5197, uh, Last Chance Habitat Improvement Project Phase 1. Go. Hey, this is Jim Lowe, hey. Southern Region. Curtis, we can hear you, Jim. Go ahead. Curtis is a friend of mine, and I know he would like his habitat dollars assigned to, to me. So just, you know, make a note of that. <laughs> um, let's go to Do map. We know. <laughs> One, this, this project uh, spans two different ranger districts and it's pretty cool the way that it was designed. It was designed from aerial photographs taken in 1939. And what we hope to do is take about 7,000 acres back into sagebrush step from pinion juniper invasion and infill. If you will go to the images, there's a document there, uh, the very last one. Open that up. It's uh, telemetry locations of sage grouse. We were able to put some sage grouse collars on here two uh, a season ago. The green dot is the Tidwell Lack along Highway 72. The black lines are the phases that we've completed in mitogi treatments in the last three years. You can see how well those grouse have been using those treated areas that we did in Mitogi. The blue lines that go up into the upper right hand corner of that image is the last chance project. Hopefully we still have, we've got five colors on grouse right now and I have one more that we hope to put on tonight. We're going to go trap tonight. Hopefully we'll see some movement of those grouse into those treated polygons as we open those areas up. Um, you'll see this image again when we talk about our Thousand Lake Mountain project, which is just to the right hand side of this. But species affected, this is a, a really awesome big game project. We have the Fish Lake Elk Herd is on the lower end of the objective. We had 1500 elk, 1600 elk wander across all of this country this last fall and go out into Cathedral Valley and Capitol Reef National Park because there's not enough groceries in this area to hold them there. You go to map this project tab. Um, I don't think the park shows up in this, but well, out to the east, you can see all that desert country. That's where the, 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 blue, the bluish purplish lavender is Capitol Reef. So the elk come off the fish lake they go through this project area and they go out into Capitol Reef National Park. Um, so we surveyed them this winter. There were 1,600 elk out there. Also, the Fish Lake and Thousand Lake units are both under objective for deer. Um, we have an image. It's kind of a long, skinny image standing at the top end of that one right there, yes. So this is standing up at the top end in the last chance drainage looking east. The area to immediately to our right is the area that we wanna burn, that hillside and restore aspen to it. And all of that country out in front of us, you can see has pinion juniper on some gently rolling hills. We're gonna take off 7,000 acres of that pinion juniper out there. This should be a great project to help sage grouse move into this country. We've got forest grouse, uh, both dusky and rough, that use this area. 
I think the aspen had really helped the rough grouse out. Um, they're not listed on the species because it's difficult to quantify uh, how much that's going to help those critters. It's definitely a good deer project. It's definitely a good elk project. And if there's any questions, we could look at the other, these other images. This is the burn area. This is a this is just the locations without those uh, buffers in. If we went back to the image with the the sage grouse image, that was the document. The two circles on that for those who don't understand what those circles are, are uh, it's in images. Sorry, that one right there. Yes. So the the area most influential on the lek is that is kind of an in between between the red and the yellow. I'm, I didn't get the right size of circles on here. You have a three mile buffer and then you have a five mile buffer that makes the most difference for the birds. So we're definitely gonna get some good help in that five mile buffer, which applies to um, early and late brood rearing for raising chicks. Anyway, any other, any questions or comments for this project? Jim, on your species that are impacted in a lot of your conversation today, um, you have sage grouse and, and also turkeys listed as well, but in the funding, it's 100% big game. Um, I, I realize that we typically have a lot more big game dollars than upland game dollars, um, but do you, do you think there's value in putting upland game there, or, or what are your thoughts there? I think there would be some value in putting upland game, both for turkeys. This is a one of the approved sites for uh, reintroductions of turkeys that we have in trouble. We've brought quite a few turkeys here from valley areas in the last five years. We should probably change that allocation. You, you, you want to give us a breakdown? What do you, what do you think makes sense? 90-10. Okay. We better put another zero on that though. That doesn't add up to 100. That's so much better. Thank you. OK, is there any more discussion on this project or the changing of the allocation? That was Darren West. Thanks for catching that, uh, Justin. And Jim, does this project roll into 5206? Yes, this 5197 and 5206 actually border each other. And on, if go to mapping and then go to adjacent projects, and you can see, you can see those other projects that we've done in the past that fill in that. And then 5206 is gonna pick up this area over to the east. It's another 9,000, almost 10,000 acres over to the east. That's 5206 right there. So yeah, they, they dovetail right together, Darren. Okay, thank you. Great question. So uh, with that, uh, do we have a motion on this project? This is Darren West. I'll make tentatively making a, a motion to, or excuse me, not tentatively. I'll make a motion to uh, approve this for tentative funding. All right, thank you, Darren. This is Dwayne, I'll second it. All right, we have a second from Dwayne. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Justin. I vote yes. Votes yes. Tyler. I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack. Yes. Votes yes. Darren made the motion. Dwayne seconded. So to vote to Paul. Yes. Votes yes. Randy. Yes. Randy votes yes. Thank you. Motion carries at uh, an adjusted percentage, 90% big game, 10% upland game. Okay, next project, 5206, thousand lake habitat improvement project phase one. Is that you, Jim, too? Yep, that's me also. Uh, this, okay, go. This borders, if we go to map this project, this borders that uh, 5197 to the east. It also borders some of those mitogi treatments. If you blow that up just a little bit, that... Uh, the left-hand polygon, the one to the west, you can see how it sits right against 
the mitogi treatments. The, the boundary that we're using on those treatments actually is the same boundary we used for the mitogi treatments. That side of the mountain is primarily a sage grouse portion of this project to help with that uh, Tidwell lek, the Forsyth historic lek, and the sage flat lek. We've got three, three leks across the, the edges of that boundary um, to remove encroaching and infilling pinion juniper, re, uh, restore that back to sagebrush step and mountain brush. It goes up onto the side of the geyser mountain, which is a place that a lot of deer and elk like to be on. Elk are there in the winter a lot. A lot of the elk from the fish lake will come to that. If they get too much snow, then they come around to this east side uh, that borders Capitol Reef, and then they go down into the park, which is what they did this year. Uh, the first time I surveyed elk, in the park was 2012 when I found 100. So when we surveyed in 2019, early 2020, there were 1,600. So those elk have continued to go to the park. And part of the reason is because all of this country across here is, is at least phase two pinion juniper with some of that in the upper elevations in, in phase one. Uh, let's go to images. Uh, down here to the pictures gives you some examples of of what's going on over there. Not that's that's more of that sage grouse stuff that we looked at on the very last project. So we've got some good mountain brush communities there, but the, these small trees are really filling it in. We use some of those 1939 photographs and some 1958 photographs to help us design these polygons also so that we can remove trees that have not been there historically and that are encroaching into these areas of mountain brush and sage. This this area has also got some uh, wild turkeys in it. Quite a few wild turkeys have used use this area now. And it is also an area where we can bring birds that get in trouble near communities because this is a ways away from anywhere. In fact, one of the problems we're having right now with, as, as we work on our final polygons is we can't get over the top of Thousand Lakes yet because there's too much snow. So we have to go back through the desert. So it's a two hour drive to get to the bottom end of the polygon. But we're going to work through that and it's going to be fine. Uh, great benefits to elk and deer. Thousand Lake Mountain has some real troubles with deer. It just does not have enough groceries to raise deer very well. And hopefully, this 10,000 acres of, of opening up and taking back from the black trees of death will help us out. Finance page. I think we're asking for 20,000 20, from Habitat Council. Is that correct? And we may want to look at the splits. This may have been listed as, as completely big game, and we probably want to change that again to a 90-10 split for upland game. Any comments or questions? This is Darren West, Jim. I think this is a great project. This, uh, this area, I think, in my opinion, has been overlooked for a lot of years. And it's the deer numbers are very low there, but the potential for big deer and larger numbers of deer, um, I'd really like to see that happen. So if there's not any other questions, I'll make a motion to pass this on for <clears throat> funding. This Tyler, I got one more question for Jim. Jim, the cultural resource clearance on a thousand acres, um, did you mention, I, I didn't catch that. Is that for a future phase? Y yes, um, we want to come in and masticate some of this country and we're cultural resources are getting tricky because we have so many acres that we want to clear. And so we wanted to have a little bit of money in the bank if we needed it so that we could uh, utilize a window when our archeologists might have a moment that they could come in and clear some of that country in advance for future okay. phases. Perfect, thank you. And I'll second the motion, Eric. Okay, so we have a motion uh, to recommend for funding from Darren and a second from Tyler. Any additional questions really quick before we move ahead? 
Okay, so we're gonna go through the roll call. Justin, you're up. I vote yes. Justin votes yes. Uh, Tyler, you second the motion, so Jack? Yes. Jack votes yes. Darren, you made the motion, so Dwayne? I vote yes. Votes yes, thank you. Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes, Randy? And yes. Votes yes, okay. The voting is unanimous, the motion carries. All right, thank you, we're gonna move on. Um, actually, it's 10.57, it's time to take a break. Let's, uh, let's take a break for uh, 10 minutes and we'll come back and we'll move on to 52.19. All right, 10 minute break, thanks.
Um, let's see, yeah, Justin's back. Andy Tyler. Okay. Looks like we have everybody back. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and go with project number uh, 5219, South Beaver Watershed Implementation Phase 1. Go ahead. This is Curtis Roundy, Southern Region Habitat Restoration Biologist. I'll be presenting this project in behalf of the Forest Service and Steve Flinders. If you look on the map right here where we're looking, you can see a hard fence line. Everything on the west side of that fence line is BLM land that has been treated. And the Forest Service has kind of taken a black eye for that in the recent years. And so they put this project together to try and finish some of the work that stopped at the boundary. It's the, again, the low hanging fruit, which is where we try to reach out first. So this project is um, 2,150 acres of lop and scatter work, and then a riparian fence along Birch Creek to protect the work along the creek from grazing pressure once they reintroduce um, the grazing back in with cattle. So um, if you go to the images, you can see in the images, the, the aerial photo shows the fence line right here and the work that's been done on the BLM side. And you can see it's pretty scarce pinion and juniper in a lot of the treatment area, looking to open it back up. There's an oak component in here. Um, it's been mentioned before, but this is on the beaver deer unit. This beaver deer unit was uh, really bad last year when we were doing captures and looking at body condition score for the deer. They were struggling pretty bad. Plus the, the herd here is under population objectives, management objectives. And so anything we can do to help deer in this area and this lop and scatter is in an area that's winter and transition. So transition from the summer range to the winter range and over winter a little better. Looking at these pictures, you can see there's a browse component that's there. Um, bitter brush, sagebrush, um, get up this slope a little bit more, you get into some mahogany and oak brush. We're looking to remove the pinion juniper and eliminate the competition for those uh, species that are still hanging on in this area. So um, strictly lop and scatter with that one fence component and benefiting mule deer, elk, sage grouse, and Bonneville cutthroat trout are the benefiting species. And um, Habitat Council ask is $10,000, I believe. And um, it is stating 100% big game here. Um, there is a, a sport fish component with the Bonneville cutthroat trout. I don't know that it's a heavily fished area or heavily utilized, but it is a native trout species in the area and looking to do some work along the stream corridor and then fence that stream corridor door to protect the trout species there probably merits some sport fish money being there. I don't know how much, um, I guess I could leave that to maybe Randy or some of the, the fish guys to weigh in and see what they think as far as benefit to fish and if the percentages need to change. But. That's this project in a nutshell. Any questions? <clears throat> Thanks, Curtis. Um, I don't know, any, any comment from Paul or Randy on the fish component there? Um, <clears throat> this is Paul. I, in looking at the, the scale of the project uh, and then the where the fence sits in, I, I could see, uh, you know, 10 to 15% uh, sport fish component for this. Yeah, I agree with Paul on that. 
So I'll, I'd, I'd say 15. Okay, so we'll look to add sport fish for 15% and drop the game to 85. <clears throat> Any other comments on that move? All right, be, we'll look for a motion on this project. Anyone? Uh, this is, sorry, I've got a lot of background noise. Uh, this is Paul Burnett. Um, I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this for funding consideration. It's 85% big game and 15% sport fish. And this is Randy. Okay, thank you. This is Randy, I'll suck on that. Great, thanks Randy. So we have a motion from Paul and a second from Randy. And we adjusted the percentages to 85 big game, 15%. Sport fish, and we'll run through the roll call. Uh, Justin. Yes. Votes yes. Tyler. Yes. Votes yes. Jack. Yes. Votes yes. Darren. Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne. Yes. Votes yes. Paul made the motion. Randy seconded it. So motion carries. Thanks, everybody. And. <clears throat> Project was slightly adjusted to include 15% sport fish money out from Habitat Council. All right, next project, 5223, Government Creek PJ reduction, phase one, go. All righty, jump to images first. I had some fun presenting this a little while ago and there's an image there that we just have to share. It's the very last one. <laughs> Okay, we'll just run through the images first. North slope of the boulder hasn't had much help for a while. Uh, go to our next image. The images show how this infill is just filling in all these little openings. Next image shows you can see some bitter brush there in the foreground and these trees are just taking it over. The north slope uh, should be very productive site because it's not facing that south sun and getting burned up all the time, it has a little bit more water on it. Let's go to the next image. You can see the understory is still in pretty good shape. If we can get on top of it, this next image really tells a nice story. In the foreground on this image, that's a slope that's all mountain brush. There's no. Jim, I think we lost you a little bit. Still there? Okay, I think we lost him. It shows it shows that he's on mute. Right. Jim, yeah. you you're on mute. Jim, maybe jump back out and jump back in if you can hear us. <clears throat> that is a really scenic picture though, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, either Gary or Curtis, are you able to text him or contact him and see if he can, what kind of issues he's got going on? I'm trying to call him right now. Okay, thanks. Um, Maybe in the meantime, is uh, Curtis or any of these other projects yours? No, Maybe I, we jump to, uh, I presented my last project, so it would be Kendall now. Eric, Eric I've got uh, 3439, the Pioneer WMA. Okay, let's move to that one so we can get Jim back online and, and then we'll jump back to Jim. So let's go to 3439. So this project is is kind of a unique one. Uh, again, my name is Kendall Bagley with Division of Wildlife Resources, Habitat Restoration Biologist. And the first phase of this project occurred in 2015 and was completed. And so we've been trying for the last four years to, to complete this next section or the second phase. 
Uh, Daniel, if we just go to the images and let's pull up a map. And it'll be in documents. And you can just pull up uh, just the imagery map, phase two project imagery map. Right there. So this this project come about when um, we actually uh, acquired through a land trade, uh, a piece of Sitla ground. And so it was swapped out and become Division, Division of Wildlife Resources. And working with the Millard County Road Department, Brandon Wingett, they had uh, partnered with us to do some uh, improvements as we, we work up through this Pioneer Road. And it kind of goes through this loop and it accesses a lot of this Pioneer WMA for us. So in 2015, we had an agreement with them and we provided some funding to them uh, and they rebuilt the road, uh, put brand new rock on, uh, re-evaluated re the road, took care of some, a lot of issues that we had with people getting stuck in the spring of the year or the fall of the year and kind of beefed that road up, removed a little bit of the water that kind of comes down there. So. What you see in purple was already completed in 2015. Uh, what we're asking for is some funding to complete the next section that's in yellow, which would be um, about a mile uh, improved. And then they would decommission the upper portion or the east portion of this road and uh, create a new road. The survey's already been done by Monson Shaver. Uh, it was done in 2015. Uh, the two red dots are culverts. Uh, there's a wash that comes through there, so we it put, install a culvert in both those locations and then re reroute this road and and decommission the old one uh, gary besant worked really hard on trying to bring our wma plans up to date working with uh, millard county commission uh, the millard county uh, groups there are, are in favor of of doing this and and uh, the road department's been a great uh, a great partnership in trying to get this done uh, if we go to some of the imageries. Look at some pictures for a minute, Daniel. So this is kind of what what the road they they put together in 2015 for us. So they hauled in a lot of this rock, and and uh, you can see the slope they've put on this on this road to keep a lot of the the water off of it and moving down through rain events or snow events and runoff. Go. Just keep moving through them. There you go. So here's, here's some of the, the in-kind work that they've brought and they've got the graders, they've got the trucks, uh, got the, the manpower to get it taken care of. This is a base, uh, about a four inch base that they've put underneath there and then they hauled in some more rock up on top. What this road's allowed is it's allowed public ass access to be a lot better. Uh, Cody Jones was, was always in the wrong place at the wrong time to try to keep pulling people out of this road or the forest service would get calls or you know, people would get stuck up there and have to walk out. And so it, it allowed travel uh, going up Pioneer Canyon to be better accessible um, to the general public. We seeded some of the edges of the roads once they got done. Here's kind of another little area where they've, they've beefed that road up for us and made a little slope to reduce some of that water. Next. Next. This is kind of what the road looks like that we want to do some work on. So as you see, we get people in here in the spring of the year and, and they just tear it all up and and then they go to the next spot next to, you know, to the side and they tear it up and create another road, create another access. And it just becomes more of a, a problem for us. Uh, but, but with the work that Gary's done, uh, we were able to put these management plans all together and have uh, everything under one one. I guess one management plan uh, with both these properties that we we have there on on Pioneer. So it kind of sets us up for an opportunity to to rebuild the road and work with uh, Miller County and Brandon Wingett to to try to accomplish these goals for us. Let's go to back to images and doc or the document page. And let's there's the estimate, the cost estimate. Daniel, I think it's the third one down. So this is a cost breakout uh, we've put together. Uh, so what we do is we provide through a, 
cooperative agreement, 113,500 and uh, I think it's $580 through a cooperative agreement like we did in 2015 to Millard County. And in turn, they would provide $140,150 worth of in-kind, which include the doter, dozers, the graders, water truck, uh, some, of the, some of the end dumps, uh, mini X skid steers, and a lot of the rock and the gravel we'd purchase from them. Uh, and they'd provide the, the culverts and they'd do all the labor. And in turn that uh, they would continue to maintain the road for us. If we go to finances. So in the finance department, it kind of gives a breakdown of everything. Uh, we're asking for 115,768 uh, in which 113,580 would go through uh, an agreement with them. And I know Gary has submitted this this year th through the Southern region as an enhancement. So um, it's listed there as PR dollars, federal aid. Uh, Gary, if you have anything to add, maybe you could help uh, with a question or if you got anything associated with the habitat uh, enhancement. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily have anything to add other than just that that's one of the funding avenues that we're, we're looking at. And Eric, maybe you have, I, I know you don't have an update yet, but I know enhancements are on hold for the moment. Right, uh, it, it is on the list though. And so <clears throat> it is on the list and ranks. And so, um, yeah, we'll just kind of see how that goes. Um, Daniel, can you show the Habitat Council funding on this? Or are we just looking to approve it? I don't think there is Habitat Council funding on it. Okay. I think the county provides enough match that it hits the the, fed, the federal aid requirements. And so this is more just a, a review process to right. say that it's had peer review. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. I think it's, uh, it, you know, it does look different from a Habitat Council standpoint, but it it's a review process for, uh, to basically approve the PR funding, which it, it would be good. Um, and it is on the division enhancement list, um, but we're not sure where that's going to go exactly. So, um, okay. Any other questions about this project? Hi, this is, this is Paul Burnett. Um, I, it seems like I recall seeing this project in the past. Um, did in the past, did we request, was there a request for Habitat Council funding or is this just a, uh, co continuation of this, this project, or was that just the arc that we that we reviewed? The, the answer is yes and yes. It, we it's, it's another iteration, yes, but it's also we we've, we've been after this funding for several years. Um, it, it had to jump through several hoops before uh, the the director's office would approve it for looking at for uh, the the federal aid stuff because. The, the old management plan for Phil, the Millard County WMAs didn't have that listed in as a year round road. Um, if you go back to the image, Daniel, that you showed at the very beginning, we were left with kind of a, a, a tricky spot um, would be the document that you had the maps. Let's see. Yeah, that one. So, so if you see below that yellow line, um, there's a, a, a section that uh, with, with no, no shading, that's a piece that we picked up in the trade with the Lique Center. And before we picked that up, um, Millard County working with Sitla had already improved the road all the way, similar to what we did up through on the purple line. Sitla had done that all the way up to the, the, where the yellow dotted line started. So it left us in a funny spot. We were kind of with a split management decision where we had a seasonally closed road, which was what that yellow road used to be. And then these two really amazing roads and just kind of this weird conundrum in the middle where it, the, the dots just weren't really connected. And so we made the decision in the, the update of the management plan to, to make that a, a year round road. And we have a desire to see that connected all the way through with the really good road and making the connection. Gotcha, okay, thank you. And, and Paul, as far, as far as the rest of your question, have we put Habitat Council dollars on this in the past? The earlier phase, we did not. Again, it was all PR. 
Thanks, guys. Thank Is you. there any other questions associated with the project? Uh, it's been an awesome job, and, and every year I get a phone call from Brandon Wingett saying, hey, can we get the funding? Do you guys have the funding? We're ready to go. We can bring all our guys in and get it taken care of. So, uh, you know, here's another another stab at trying to get this done uh, for the, the fifth year moving forward, and and uh, hopefully we can try to, to do that. They've been a good partnership to work with, and uh, have been great trying to keep those roads together and, and help with cattle guards and things associated with our WMA. So they're, they're a great partnership for sure. Thanks, Kendall. Any last questions on this? Hey, Kendall, this is Darren West. Uh, is this big game winter range or summer range or transitional range? Yeah, it's gonna be, be more of a winter range. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll winter right there in that, uh, WMA, um, all along that bench. So, uh, yeah, great opportunity there for, for mule deer, turkey, elk, um, moving forward. There's a lot of activity, uh, as far as cougar hunters in the fall of the year and, and access that goes right up that main Canyon of Pioneer. So this is just another avenue to try to connect the two dots and decommission a road that is not in very good shape and, and build a nice one that can be utilized year round. Okay. I just, I, I heard Gary mention that it was seasonally closed and was curious if you <clears throat> thought there may be any big game wildlife disturbance because of this, or if it'll, it'll help out with cougar hunters. I'm, I'm great with that. It's kind so of, Darren, I, I would jump in on that, Darren. It, it's somewhat of a counterintuitive thing to understand and without sitting there around the table with a solid map, um, taking that loop and, and completing it, we feel like decreases the amount of time people are spending on roads in winter range because those two roads are both highly utilized and it com completes a loop. And if you take that loop away and seasonally close it, people are gonna go all the way back down and come back and around and it in increases the miles traveled overall through that winter range. And then in addition, regardless of how we classified it seasonal or not, people were going in and getting stuck. And so making it so people can get through there and get through there quickly, as opposed to being in there, digging and stirring. And we, we felt like it was going to be a better option for wintering mule deer to complete it and have it in good condition than to, to continue with the backtracking and all the way around and increasing the miles everybody has to travel to use that area. Perfect. Thanks for that clarification, Gary. And as you see on the map too, Darren, right here that Daniel's got pulled up, you can see how that, that road to the north, the main pioneer one, uh, they've taken it right to the forest boundary. Um, and there's some turnarounds there. There's a little camping spot that, that people kind of camp along the upper portion of that road as well. So it, it does get used. Okay. Thanks, Kendall. I got a question for Eric Edgley or maybe Tyler. Um, where we're not approving uh, habitat council funds, what, what exactly should a motion like this look like? Because I don't think this body approves PR funding. Is it just that we've reviewed it and we're comfortable with it or what kind of motion are we looking for? Yeah, I mean, that's what yeah, we've I done think... in the past. Just kind of a right. council, of, kind of like we do with conservation permit dollars, projects that are funded with that. Yeah, it just shows that this project has been peer reviewed, even though we're not technically going to use Habitat Council funding. Uh, it gets a review so that, uh, um, anyway, gives us extra confidence in moving ahead, whether through the enhancement process to fund it or other avenues. So we've done this with other things as well. Um, Darren, you had a great question. I appreciate that. And thanks, Gary, for your clarification on there as well. Any final questions on this? Thanks everybody for your support. Okay, so uh, looking for a motion. This is Tyler, I'll make the motion that we approve it for PR funding or that the council has reviewed it and recommends it for PR funding, how about that? Perfect, I like that. Yeah, I'll second that, this is Justin. Thanks Justin. So we have a motion from Tyler and a second from Justin uh, to advance this project for potential PR or other funding.
Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Justin, you seconded. Tyler, you made the motion, so we'll go to Jack. Yes. Okay, Jack votes yes. Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne? I vote yes. Votes yes. Paul? Yes. Votes yes. Randy? I also vote yes. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Uh, Thanks everybody. That's the kind of a different one and um, I appreciate the good discussion on it and uh, that we can move it forward. Okay, uh, we're gonna backtrack a little bit. Jim, are you with us again? Well, yes, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Five, two, two, three. Okay, 5223, let's, let's continue with that project and see if we can get that one kicked through the field goal. Okay, go to images and go to that picture that shows the slope with the, the brush just under the trail, that one. So this mountain brush grows very well on the north slope if we get the trees out of the way. And, and as you go down this slope and hit that tree edge, this mountain brush just goes away. Um, so the goal of this north slope project, this is kind of a, we've not done much work on the boulder and this is a great opportunity for us to get in with the forest service and get this started. And, and this project, if you go to map this project now, We'll, we'll get some perspective as to actually where this sits. So the middle, the middle polygon, the kind of long skinny middle, middle polygon, if you wanna make that a little bit bigger. So we're sitting near Teesdale. We're just south of the Bicknell Bottoms up here on the hill. What we'd like to do is get this area treated to protect our private lands below so that we can use fire in the spruce that's upper, that's, that's higher in elevation. From those areas. The left hand polygon is a, a mastication area that the forest is going to do in house uh, right there along Pine Creek. So we're going to have a little bit of uh, uh, peripheral values to Colorado River cutthroat trout, although we're not actually working in the stream where they live. Um, this is a great project to get us going on the Boulder Mountain. The Boulder Deer Herd is, is below objective and has been for quite some time. The elk herd there could be a lot better if they had a few more groceries to eat. So this project is not a project that's gonna stand alone. It's gonna be a project that prepares us to move into the upper elevations with fire to treat spruce and fir and to restore aspen. On the finance tab, we're not asking for very much from the Habitat Council. I think we're $10,000 from Habitat Council to go towards this project. Uh, the forest has been really, really good to work with us. This is a big game project. Although as we, as we prepare for the future, it's going to move into more, uh, more of those other categories as we benefit the, the fish in Pine Creek and as we benefit forest grouse as we get up into the spruce and fir. Uh, we got some radio collars on deer on the boulder this last winter. We were able to get 120 collars out there and I can't I can't wait for the first two weeks of June to see where those does are so that I can go visit those areas, see where those deer want to be, and let that guide us as we move forward in creating some fawning habitat and some fawn rearing habitat on that boulder mountain. Um, that's probably all for that one, unless you've got questions or comments. Jim, this is Darren West. Um, I just like to comment on this one. Uh, I, I love this project. This this area has so much potential to grow more deer with these efforts and elk, and also I see potential for turkey and forest grouse. But it's it's great to get in, and, like you said, and get a, a footprint in there with the Forest Service. And if we can continue several phases of this, I can only see that unit not only growing many more deer, elk, turkey, forest grouse, but it's just gonna give a lot more public opportunity as well. So I absolutely love it. Thanks, Darren. Any other comments? All right, I, and I also wanna just mention, you know, Jim, you pointed out that you've got 130 collared animals in the area now is that right 120 120 yes um yeah that's fantastic and to be kind of 
keeping an eye on them and see where they want to hang out, you know, in June, you know, um, you know, when they're dropping fawns is just awesome. And so, um, I don't know, Justin, maybe you can weigh in on that. No, it'll be fun to look at that data and see how body condition scores change over time. One thing I was thinking about as, as Jim was um, presenting on this is I know at the end of this meeting, we're going to talk about where we could do a potential field tour this next summer or fall. I think the boulders might be a good option if if the council agrees and if Jim's willing to host us, but we'll, we'll tackle that towards the end of the meeting. Just something to think about. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate that. So we'll keep that in mind. All right. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, host, you, I'll host you and I'll fix you lunch. <laughs> nice. Looking for a motion on this project. This is Darren West. I'll, I'll make the motion to approve this for tentative funding. Okay, we have a motion from Darren. Uh, I'll second it, Eric. Great, we have a second from Justin. We'll run the roll call. So Justin, you seconded. So Tyler. I vote yes. Votes yes, Jack. Yes. Votes yes, Darren, you made the motion. So we'll go on to Dwayne. Yes. Votes yes, Paul. I vote yes. Votes yes, Randy. And yes. Thanks, Randy. All right, uh, voting is unanimous and motion carries. Project carries, okay. So we're gonna move on to uh, skip down to project 5251. Again, talking about Boulder unit some more. Jim, is that you again? Yes, this is me again. Okay, go for it. Okay, our first tab on this one's gonna be map this project. And then if you'll click adjacent projects, I wanna show how this ties in to some of this other work that we're doing around here. So these are the 16 ponds, the black dots. And then if we look at the adjacent projects, we have we have projects out here to the west for, for uh, sage grouse. We have a lot of green dots that Kendall has completed on working on ponds. We have the Boulder Foothills project in red up here alongside the black project, which is uh, the 5223, the Government Creek project we just talked about. So I don't know how you put a value on water on the landscape. This, these ponds sit in an area that can benefit deer, elk, pronghorn, turkeys, Utah prairie dogs, and sage grouse. One of the ponds that we'd like to work on is right is it's on the west edge and it's right along that road if you'll move your cursor up that one right there that's called mud lake that's an actual sage grouse lick so if we were to draw our three mile circle and our five mile circle around that lake, and I, i'm sorry i don't have an image of that we've got a lot of activity for sage grouse that, that could occur in these ponds if those ponds have consistent water now Prior to these ponds being proposed for cleaning and, and uh, lining, they've been working on a pipeline that comes off the forest that brings water out to these ponds. And we're hoping that the pipeline will bring water to these ponds. And after they're cleaned and clayed, we'll have year round water there for big game to use, for upland birds to use. And the, the value, even though there's not a direct benefit to the Utah prairie dog, which is a threatened species, if we can spread grazing pressure out, I can't see how that will not benefit the Utah prairie dog and the sage grouse both in leaving a little more residual grasses and forbs on the landscape for insects to eat, for prairie dogs, or I mean insects to eat so sage grouse can eat the insects and also for prairie dogs to eat for their benefit. Uh, our finances for this, we're not asking very much from Habitat Council. The clay, most of the clay work going in is done by permittees with some Forest Service personnel. Uh, I think we're asking $5,000 from the Habitat Council to go towards the purchase of clay so that we can get that in those ponds. Uh, we, we split it up between big game and upland game. We have the several species of big game that use it. And even though I don't have non-game wildlife listed, as a, a partner there, I think there are, there are some values there to non-game wildlife in, in this project. So any questions? Jim, this is Tyler. 
just curious if you guys put this in for the water development funding that went over to gift this past year. Oh, yes, I have that on my notes right here. Yes, it has been proposed. And uh, we have, I have had conversations with the permittees and they are working through the process with GIP to do their portion to get that funding. So yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. Any other questions about the project? Yeah, Jim, under species, do you think it's worth listing um, the uh, prairie dog just from a WAP perspective? I had a conversation with Keith Day as, as to whether or not I should list that. In, in our conversation, he didn't feel like there's not a way to quantify the benefit there, even though there could be some benefit. So I did not list it because of that. There's a comment, I think, in there from Keith. There you go. Okay, thanks, Jim. You bet. Okay, looking for a motion on this project. This is Dwayne. I'll make a motion to tentatively approve for funding. Thank you, Dwayne. This is Darren. I'll second. Thank you, Darren. Went through the roll call. Justin? Uh, yes. Thank you. Tyler? Yes. Thank you. Jack? Yes. Thank you. Darren, you made the second, and then Dwayne made the motion, so we'll go down to Paul. Yeah. Both yes. Thank you. Randy? And yes. Thank you, Randy. Motion carries. Voting is unanimous. All right. We're going to move on to our last uh, southern region project, South Monroe Mountain Kingston Forche Pond Enhancement Project. Go. So, Eric, that'll be mine. This is Kendall Bagley. Um, this project is, okay. uh, Daniel, if we can just go to the map. I put a map in there. But this project uh, fits the same need as Jim was talking about uh, reclay. Originally, we looked to reclay about 34 ponds, but we've necked it down to about 16. So these ponds are on the south end of the Monroe Mountain on the Forshe and the, the Kingston allotments. And these are going to play a, a critical role. Right now, we have a contract out uh, to do some fencing within these allotments. It's already been awarded to tailor-made fencing for about $180,000 of Forest Service uh, funded dollars. So the opportunity was to work, work with Rick Euler and the permittees to reclay a lot of these ponds. Uh, the benefit would definitely be for, for big game with mule deer and elk and also it kind of ties in nice with uh, some of these ponds located around the hellhole lek for sage grouse and some upland game birds as um, migratory birds and, and also turkeys in this area. Um, so we'd like to clean and reclaim them uh, with the use of some bobcats, uh, use of uh, some backhoes if, if possible to get into these areas. Uh, the, the grazing permittees will, will work with the Forest Service to try to get these done. Um, can you go to some images, Daniel? So this, in the past, these are some of the bags that, that we've provided for uh, the Fremont River Ranger District. Uh, these are mega sacks. They're about 3,000 pounds of the bentonite clay. Next. And then we've also purchased uh, the 50-pound bags of, of the bentonite clay for them. So over the course of, I don't know, five or six years, we've, we've really worked with the Fremont River and done a lot of work on, on the Mitogi and, and uh, reclaimed a lot of ponds out on the Parker Mountain as well. This kind of shows uh, application. So you have the ponds and most of the work's done kind of in the fall of the year when the water's kind of dried up or, or there's less water in there. So you can see them working around with the bobcat, and spreading that clay around. Um, some of the permittees, I don't know why that one loaded opposite, but some more work done by the permittees. So they put the clay in there and then uh, they'll mix it in either with the bobcat or the, like a little mini X. 
and then just allow that to sit over the over the course of of uh, the winter and uh, catch the the snow and the rainfall moving forward. But if we can go to the finance page, so with our budget, uh, we're seeking around sixty eight hundred through WRI. Uh, I was already approved through this project for ten thousand two hundred through GIP. Uh, it's already been done working with Tom Tippett, so I've made that adjustment uh, down below in the in the page. So what we're seeking for the 16 ponds is a remainder uh, $6,800. And there's a split, 85-15, uh, big game and, and upland game. So uh, I did notice uh, on the ECP uh, spreadsheet that it looks like maybe this was funded through conservation permit dollars as well. So maybe that's something we'll have to check on and make sure that is correct but uh, any questions on this project moving forward I think it's a, a good project and it'll help benefit the, the forest uh, on the south end of the Monroe Mountain working with those permittees and, and like I said we've we've got a, a big contract in place to to do some fencing uh, that'll separate the pastures uh, put livestock in different areas so they're not congregated in certain certain places and uh, spread the water out for them and and improve the grazing uh, overall on the south end of the Monroe. Uh, this is Paul, I just have a quick question. The, the water supply on these, are they are mostly or all um, ephemeral type or intermittent type streams um, that have just tilted in or, or just curious about, about the supply? Yeah, yeah Paul, they're, they're all existing ponds. And so what we're doing is we're just cleaning them out, uh, putting reclay in them. So they're catching mainly rainwater, they're catching snow, um, those type of uh, situations to where we can we can grab that existing water that's there. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak to Kendall's comment on the ECP funding. We, just in case anybody on the council is not aware, we are, looking for ECP funding concurrently. So our meeting is with all the sportsman's groups tomorrow. So I will update the spreadsheet because quite a few of the projects are on both, are requesting funding from both sources. So um, if it is funded with ECP funding, we will remove it from the Habitat Council funding. Anybody have any questions on that? Thanks guys for your time today and appreciate all your hard work and dedication to help us out with these projects. Thanks, Kendall. All right, um, any other questions on this project? All right, um, thanks Allison also for updating us on, on um, you know, the other funding options for this and, and uh, how this could move ahead. So uh, at this point, I'd look for a motion on this project. This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to approve it for funding consideration. Okay, with motion from Tyler. I'll second this is Paul. Okay, and we have a second from Paul. We'll run through the list. Uh, Justin? Uh, yes. Oops, yes. Tyler made the motion, so Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes. Paul, you'd seconded, so we'll move to Randy. And yes. Votes yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, so we're kind of at the end of the Southern Region projects. Uh, it's 1152. We could either break for a half an hour lunch now and then start up with Central Region um at i don't know 20 after 12 or we can try to push through a couple of central region projects uh is there any preferences at this point from anyone i say we break for lunch yeah okay so let's do that let's break for lunch uh justin you're not going to be around for a while is that correct yeah kobe will take my place until i jump back on around 1 30 or 2 so Perfect. Okay. 
Um, so it's 1152. Yeah, let's go till uh, 1225. Um, and we'll call it lunch and we'll be back on at 1225. Thanks everybody.
We're going to go ahead, Daniel. Do I have a thumbs up to move ahead? I'm good. Okay. All right. We're going to jump in uh, to central region projects. And so just to let everybody know, we, we went through 20 projects this morning and we have 25 left to go in this meeting. And we're, we're at 1230. We're a little bit earlier, half an hour earlier, because we went to that half an hour lunch, uh, like we talked about. And so hopefully that gives us the time to, to squeeze in those other projects and try to get done by 3.30 or 4 at the latest. Um, so we're going to go into central region projects. Uh, project number 5241, uh, Heber Wildlife West Fork Restoration. Uh, who's on for that one? I am. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, I'm Robbie Agil, a habitat restoration biologist in the central region. And this is a uh, forest service project. Uh, we're really excited to start seeing these forest service projects, especially in these higher elevations and especially a prescribed burn. So this is a uh, 30,000 acre uh, prescribed burn. At least that's the, the large footprint there. It won't actually be that many acres treated, but within that 30,000 acres, they'll treat whatever they can. And if you want to go to, um, I looked at the images and it didn't, nothing really pulled up real well. Um, but if you're familiar with that area, it's just above Heber. And I think that last one on there worked kind of. <laughs> so basically, there's just a conifer that's encroaching into the aspen. And so they're going to target those conifer areas within that 30,000 acres and use uh, ground crews as well as helicopters um, to uh, do a prescribed burn. If you want to go, so species that will benefit, there are Colorado cut, River cutthroat trout in those um, bottoms. Um, there'll be dusky grouse, ref grouse, um, mule deer, and elk. Uh, it's a high priority area for mule deer and elk. And uh, by redu redu removing that conifer encroachment and burning those aspen stands, it'll rejuvenate that aspen and create a lot of a lot more understory as well as those uh, young aspen shoots that are high in nutrient for a big game. So if we go to uh, funding, so we're asking for almost 800,000 total and then uh, 40,000 from Habitat Council. And I believe it's split out 85, 10, 5. Um, that seems about right for, to me. Um, so pretty straightforward prescribed burn. We're excited to see that work being done. Um, the, the Forest Service has been really active in getting the NEPA done. And we're really excited to see that. We really need to improve that summer range for, for big game. So I'll keep things short and quick and get through these fast. So do you have any questions? Uh, <clears throat> this is Paul. I have a couple questions. Um, so I, uh, I recognize the, the value of um, fire on the landscape to a lot of our uh, systems. I'm just curious um, in terms of uh, the fact that this is a Colorado River cutthroat trout population. Um, I think one of the few on the South Fork or South Slope um, and uh, it's, it's fairly isolated. So in terms of its risk to being lost due to fire, it's a, a, it's a higher risk. I'm curious about uh, what um, plans are in place to make sure that uh, we don't um, we don't lose this population to uh, fire response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So uh, Justin Robinson, who is the Forest Service uh, fisheries biologist, is actually one of the leads in planning the project. And I know they identified not only for Colorado, but also for boreal toads. They identified some of those areas and are not treating they're avoiding those areas. And I don't know exactly what he has in 
plan in place to protect uh, the trout, but knowing he is involved, I am assuming that he has done whatever he can to uh, reduce any risks that would damage the stream. And then also the idea is actually doing these lower intensity fires where you don't have a big runoff. So that The idea is to do that so that there isn't a big forest fire that goes in there and then actually does damage the, the fishery. So kind of a so is there a is there a time frame um, that that we're targeting for for the actual ignition? Um, it, I believe it's going to be in the fall or spring, okay. whatever those um, conditions are ideal. Hey, Robbie, have they already done the NEPA? This is Kobe. They've already done the NEPA on this project. I believe so. Yeah. So. But they've already done that. A lot of this should be addressed in the NEPA. Right. Um, your documents is it attached to the project do they ever do that they ever attach any of those to the project to answer some of these questions yeah that, that would be a good idea um i know he had several documents on there but i'm not sure if like maybe there's a map underneath that it looks like Anyway, overall, exciting project for big game. Yeah, obviously, always concerned about the fisheries, the timing, the right way, but uh, seeing so much habitat lost across the state, the conifer encroachment, and then devastating wildfires that damage both the fisheries and, and, and wildlife habitat. I love this proactive approach. Any other questions for Robbie on this project? Okay, I think before we go to a motion, I just want to, you know, also reiterate, you know, kind of what Paul has alluded to is we, we really need to, to make sure that we look out for our aquatics resources on these projects where there's concerns and, and uh, do whatever we can, through, whether it's through the NEPA process or through other things to be sure we don't, we don't uh, blow out these important fisheries. Um, so I don't know, with that, I'll look to see if there's a motion on this project. This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to approve it for funding consideration. Okay. Thank you, Tyler. This is Jack. I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion from Tyler and a second from Jack. We'll go through the roll call. Um, so first name on the list is Kobe. We're looking for yeses or noes. Okay. Kobe, yeah. you're up. Okay. Kobe votes yes. Tyler, you made the motion. Jack, you second it. So we'll go down to Darren. Yes. Darren votes yes. Dwayne? Yes. Dwayne votes yes. Paul? I'll vote a cautious yes. A cautious yes. Okay, Randy? I'll vote yes as well. Okay, Randy votes yes. So the voting is unanimous with caution. Okay, uh, motion passes. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next project. 5175 uh, Stansbury Mountains Watershed Restoration Project. Go ahead. Hi, this is Boyd White. I'm the farm bill biologist in Twila for the Division of Wildlife Resources and the NRCS. And I'm presenting this, um, this project, the Stansbury Mountains Watershed Restoration Project, uh, WRI number 15175. Okay, if you wanted to go to the maps, then you can see from the map that, that this covers quite a bit of the Stansbury Range just uh, west of Grants, west and south of Grantsville, Utah. There's uh, there's going to be uh, 2,309 acres of bull hogging, uh, 2,200 acres of reseeding, um, 2,238 acres of lop and scatter, and 80 BDAs built in the Hickman Canyon drainage. Um, this is a this is an important project. This was going to be a joint chiefs project. Hopefully next year we can get joint chief funding from the Forest Service and the NRCS, but they still wanted to keep going this year um, and do this project as kind of like a first of three years. 
and, it, and this project uh, has a lot of collaborators um, from the NRCS, the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service, the DWR, Forestry, Fire and State Lands, CITLA. There's, there's quite, and some private property owners, there's quite a few involved in this. So if we, if you wanted to go to the funding page, then the biggest ticket item here is, is going to be the last one, the bull hog, um, just a, over a million dollars for the bull hogging. Um, some of this is gonna be a few steeper acres. So we, we feel that it's gonna be a higher price. And uh, so we put in $450 per acre. Um, we'll have a robust seed seed mix going into this. And uh, yeah, so this is a 90% big game, 10% up in game mix that we're asking for. We're asking for $20,000 from the Habitat Council. Any questions? Thanks, Boyd. I actually do have a question. Um, you mentioned the the slopes. Um, do you feel pretty confident that even though they're steeper, you'll be able to find a contractor that will be able to handle those steeper slopes? Yes, I, I feel pretty confident we will. We've we've had some other projects where we've had some contractors do steeper slopes even though they kind of balked at it, they knew going into the contract and it will be announced in the contract what the slopes will be. Um, they still did what they were asked to do, so. Any other questions? I've got a question maybe for Paul and Randy, um, given the the benefit to Bonneville cutthroat trout with the BDAs, how would you feel about putting maybe 10% of this on sport fish? Yeah, we didn't look at the species list, did we? I guess I'll chime in real fast, Tyler. I'm actually, maybe Paul could correct me, I'm not aware of any cutthroat populations out that way, I think. Maybe there's some potential for restoration down the road in the future, but there's really nothing saved right now in terms of Bonneville populations out that way. I'm not either. Um, and I think that uh, in terms of, I mean, just in terms of, I think the, is it the North Willow Canyon has a, um, has a cutthroat, or not a cutthroat, but at least a brown trout fishery, I believe. I think you're right there, Paul. And so I, you know, there would be a potential benefit. I, um, I think I was looking at uh, working with uh, somebody else on and on potentially scoping a project out here. I, I would see a, a, you know, five, ten percent would be reasonable for sport fish. Uh, how has aquatics been in, involved in the, the BDA component of this? Not yet. I was going to take Chris Crockett and go look at it though. Okay. So well, I'll take a, you. I'll take okay. a stab at a motion then. Okay. Uh, motion to approve it for funding consideration with the funding breakdown for Habitat Council at 70% big game, 10% upland game. Actually, Allison, you already changed it. No, yeah, 70 big game, 10 upland. No, 80 big game, 10 upland, 10 sport fish. Allison's changing it as I'm trying to do the motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion uh, to tentatively prove at 80 to 10, 10. For a second. I'll second that, Colby. 
Okay, motion from Tyler, second from Kobe. We'll run through the list. Uh, Kobe, you already seconded. Tyler, you made the motion. So Jack, you're up. Yes. Jack votes yes. Aaron? Yes. Darren votes yes. Dwayne? Yes. Dwayne votes yes. Paul? Uh, I vote yes. Paul votes yes. Randy? Yeah, I'll vote last as well. Okay. Randy votes yes. Thank you. The motion is approved unanimously. Okay. Let's move on to project 5122, Parties Canyon Watershed Restoration. Go ahead. All right, so this is Rob Biagel, Habitat Restoration Biologist again. Um, Parley's Canyon Watershed Restoration Project 5122. So this project actually began as a more of a non-game wildlife and fisheries focused project uh, in Lambs Canyon. If you can zoom in a little bit there. Um, so we had some landowners approach us wanting to put beavers back into Lambs Canyon and meeting with our wildlife folks, we decided that that would cause too many issues. And so uh, we proposed the idea of building BDAs uh, to get those benefits for uh, wildlife without having to deal with the, the problem of beavers. And so that's how the project began. We uh, and the, the idea was to benefit there's Bonifield cutthroat trout as well as um, hope, the hope it's good habitat for boreal toads. So as part of the project, we're going to be surveying for boreal toads and other amphibians. And, um, and then uh, if we don't find them, this potentially could be a, a reintroduction site. So we're working closely with our native aquatics biologist. And then in the spirit of trying to do more of a landscape skill project and not just do a BDA project in Lambs Canyon, I began looking around in the watershed at other people who had projects and, and interest in doing things. And so the Forest Service has been planning, there's a, a new insect, non-native insect called balsam woolly adelgid that is infesting the Wasatch mountain range. And it's extremely detrimental. It's pretty much going to wipe out all of our fur species along the entire Wasatch Front. And it's also going into Strawberry uh, Reservoir area as well. And so the Forest Service is really scared of having an entire Wasatch Front covered in dead conifer. And it's already a huge fire risk. And adding all that dead material will be extremely dangerous. Um, and as you can see, there's the, the community of Mount Air right there and Summit Park. So there's thousands of people who live there year round. And so this is a really scary thing. And so we've been working with forestry fire and state lands as well. So those polygons you see there within Summit Park is basically a portion of the project where we'll work with forestry fire and state lands and United Fire Authority to come in and uh, thin out trees around homes and, um, and buffers around roads going in and out of the community to protect the community as well as firefighters as they go in to try and fight fires in these areas. So that portion of the project isn't really wildlife related at all, but through WRI, we try to do uh, multiple different things to benefit the watershed. And so it's more of a, that aspect of the project is more of a fire um, prevention aspect. And then the big polygon there on the forest, kind of green right now, um, that is the forest is planning to do a, a huge NEPA document to go in there and start uh, thinning all those, can those fir trees that will be dead soon and piling and burning them. And so we're asking for the cultural surveys to go in there and, and do that work. So for really for wildlife and, and fisheries, it's the BDA's aspect of the project. And then of course, by thinning out this, uh, the conifers will be rege regenerating the aspen and uh, increasing understory vegetation for all kinds of wildlife and, and big game, of course. And the there's potential of doing prescribed burns in there in the future if, if everything goes well. And then lastly, 
if you click on the polygon right at the mouth of Parley's Canyon, there's a Myrtle Spurge infestation. If you drive over there, it's just this yellow uh, flowering plant uh, that people plant in their yards and now is spreading up the canyon. And we really need to get on that, otherwise it'll go all the way through the forest and, and that will have large impacts on, on big game as well. And then the polygon above the reservoir is a garlic mustard infestation that we want to get on as well. So we're asking for money to do weed monitoring or mapping to find out where things are, as well as actual treatment of those weeds. So, so it's gone from just this little BDA project to this large landscape scale, multiple aspect project. And it goes to some pictures. Uh, so just kind of, you know, thick conifer next. Just showing the mouth of Parley's Canyon. It's hard to tell there, but there's Myrtle Spurge along that. Next. Another next. It's just showing some of the old beaver dams that were in Lambs Canyon Creek. So we'll be building BDAs near there. No. Same the creek, so it's pretty good condition. It's not really downsized, but we want to create more of that pond habitat uh, for boreal toads. Next, next picture, and this is Salamander uh, Lake. It's at the top of Lambs Canyon Creek, and just an old beaver dam there. So it's ideal boreal toad habitat. Um, so we'll do some surveys and, and improve the habitat and do some introductions if, if they're not there. And it's just showing the conifer encroachment of the aspen. So by thinning this out and potentially doing prescribed burns in the future, will really improve the habitat as well as reduce that fire risk. Next, just showing the thick conifer that's up there next. All the thick conifer around Summit Park. It's just, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Next. And it's just showing kind of what it looks like after you go in and, and thin out that conifer. Let's see. And then let's go ahead and go to the finance page. So I guess on species, um, we can kind of change it right now it's 90 big game 10 upland i think there should be more of a focus on the non-game wildlife since that is really the focus of the project to begin with from our interest from the division and sport fish because of the bonneville cutthroat trout and then of course you know upland there's a lot of forest grouse up there that will benefit and and then there is the, the big game benefits as well. So we're only asking for 20,000 from Habitat Council. And yeah, what do you guys, whatever you guys think is great. So any questions? Um, in terms of funding, um, you know, I've, I'm familiar with a lot of these streams and uh, especially on the East Canyon Creek side, Whole Canyon still supports a, a, a remnant cutthroat, Bonneville cutthroat population, and I know there are Bonnevilles up on the Harley side. So, um, I would I I would venture to um, change the sport fish contribution to probably about I would say 10%. Um, but I'll look to Randy for confirmation on that one. Yeah, I have to put a little thought in that percent a little bit, Paul. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of putting some sport fish dollars into it, but, you know, kind of looking at the funding breakdown, it kind of looks like maybe only about 5% of the total project cost goes towards fishery kind of stuff. So I'm, 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 I don't think we go above 10. I maybe advocate more like five. Okay. I'm fine with that. I have a question. I think Dwayne, is there a way to break off the, the, uh, Free removal in the uh, private home area 
and do that as a separate project than this? See so where that fits into the habitat part of it. Yeah, I guess that would be, um, it's more of a funding question for Tyler and those guys, but I, from a WRI standpoint, we wanted to just, instead of having separate projects, capture everything that's going on in the watershed in, in one. So, but I don't see why you couldn't just not spend sportsman dollars on that portion of the project. But Yeah, that's how we would do it. We don't need to break off a separate proposal. We would just take those sportsman's funding and make sure that they get spent on that portion of the project. Yeah, that would be my recommendation too, is let's, you know, it's not a big chunk of money, so it'll be easy to spend out. Uh, the 20,000 that we might approve here um, on the other values of the project um, and not the, not the forestry fire part. That's a good question though, Dwayne, I appreciate that. This is Tyler. The only yep. the only reason I would advocate for 10% over 5% of sport fish, just looking at the totals, um, sport fish only has about a $30,000 over allocation in their fund right now. And that's before the $400,000 addition has been put in there. So if that $400,000 comes, that's an additional 160,000 or so to sport fish. Um, I think we're going to get ourselves in a situation where we're going to be needing to find places to put sport fish money. Yeah, and this is Paul, I, I, I would concur with that, I, especially, I know I've been working in the East Canning Creek watershed for quite a while, and, and I think there's definitely uh, more than, you know, a thousand dollars worth of VDA work that would potentially go uh, into into that area, so um, I I think that would be fine. And I could support that too. One out of ten. All right, Eric. I guess I'll take a shot at a motion then. Motion to approve okay. the project for funding consideration. And Allison, don't touch it. Let me get this right. <laughs> Seventy percent big game. 10% upland game, 10% sport fish, and 10% non game wildlife. Okay. So we have a motion from Tyler at 70, 10, 10, and 10, right? Right. Okay. Is there a second? Can we include in that motion the, the exclusion of the, <laughs> how the fund was spent that we talked about a minute ago? Tyler? I'm going to I'm going to resist that if you want to make a substitute motion go ahead. I'm not sure how to word it. Um, I um, I would make a motion that we follow the funding as as shown and that we exclude sportsmen's funds from the pro from the wood removal projects in the private home area. Okay, Dwayne, so maybe the way to state that is, uh, I will make a substitute motion and then explain what you just explained. Okay, I'll start over again. I would make a substitute motion to approve the funding as shown and also exclude the funding, exclude the sportsman's funds from the tree removal in the public home area, private home area. So we have a substitute motion from Dwayne. Does Darren West all second? Okay, and we have a second from Darren. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. I'd like um, to speak to that first, if you don't mind. To okay. The substitute motion. So I understand that this council traditionally has had an issue with spending uh, sportsman's dollars on private land. I think in this case, on this project, uh, the forestry management portion of the project will absolutely have a benefit to public wildlife resources. So that's why I resisted putting that into my motion. And uh, just to add to that, Tyler, I believe, um, and, and Robbie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe a lot of the 
areas where there's going to be forestry treatment on private land is actually in some sort of a conservation easement type of a uh, an agreement with the original developer, especially in the Summit Park area. But um, Robbie, you might be able to speak to that more uh, effectively than I can. Yeah, a lot of it is, and it would just be, you know, I wouldn't see any wildlife benefit to the stuff we'll actually be doing in the community itself, but in the uh, in that part that you're talking about is um, it's above the community, but yeah. Okay, so we we have a substituted motion um, from Dwayne and a second from Darren is is kind of where we're at currently. So we're going to go with that, and we're going to go through uh, um, the voting. And I appreciate Tyler's additional comment. Um, but we're going to go through the roll call. Kobe, you're first. Uh, with with Tyler's additional information, mine's a no. Okay, Kobe votes no. Um, Tyler, I vote no. Votes no. No. Jack votes no. Um, Darren, you had seconded the motion as a yes. And Dwayne, you had proposed the substitute motion as a yes. So Paul, you're up. Um, can, can you, can you uh, paraphrase the motion again? Okay, so the motion, uh, the substitute motion that's been proposed is to fund this project at 70% big game, 10% upland, and 10% 10 sport fish, 10% non-game, with the stipulation that the sportsman funding not be used in the neighborhood area that is going to be worked on with forestry, fire, state lands. Okay. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay, so I'll, okay, I'll vote no no for that just because there there is a pretty broad partnership here and and I I think that we should be trying as best as we can to incorporate our broad funding sources to kind of an overall watershed goal. So goal. So I'll I'll vote no. Okay. Randy, you're next. And I'll vote no as well. Okay. With that, we have five no votes, two yes votes. And so the motion does not carry and um, does not pass as currently constituted. So that's so the substitute motion. Now we're back to the underlying motion there. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so the substitute is Sorry. That's okay. So Tyler, you had the original motion and then Paul, was you you were the second? Yes. Okay. So our original motion is to rearrange the funding at funding at 70, 10, 10, uh, and to be spent wherever in the project. Is that fair to say, Tyler? Yes, that's fair. Okay. Okay, we'll go through the voting on this version of the motion. Uh, Kobe, you're up. Yes. Kobe votes yes, thank you. Uh, Tyler, you made the motion, so you're a yes. Uh, Jack. Yes. Jack votes yes. Okay, Darren? No. Darren votes no. Dwayne? No. Votes no. Um, Paul, you were the second on the original motion. So that's a yes. Uh, Randy? Yes. Randy votes yes. So the tally of the votes are five yeses and two noes. The motion carries at five to two. The original motion. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Good discussion.
Can I just get a clarification real quick? It's all private land owned by the homeowners. Sure. Who, you know, bought their lots there, built their homes there. So you're going to go in to admit hundreds of private land properties and get permission to go through and, and take out those trees. Is that what's proposed? Uh, yes, that is part of the project, yes. Okay. Okay, thanks everybody. We're gonna move on to the next project. Okay, uh, next project is 5196, uh, New Canyon Watershed Restoration, phase two, go. Okay, thanks guys. Um, so this one is another really exciting project. The um, Forest Service on the Manti is really stepping up and starting to do large scale NEPA so that we can do high elevation uh, work. And this is one of those projects. Um, if you can zoom in a little bit. And then just there's several different aspects of the project. There's going to be a lot pile and burn. So you click on those, the big blob to the right. So that portion will be 74 acres of lot pile and burn and click on the other one next to it. And then more of a, a thinning practice of the forest. And then down in the bottom there, we'll do some BDA work in the creek. And then at the bottom, mouth of the canyon, it's uh, kind of a uh, just a lot pile and burn to remove the fire risk of a fire going up the canyon. So we're working with forestry, fire, and state lands on that. We're working with the Forest Service, and we've worked come together to create a you know multiple aspect project for for New Canyon, and definitely be a huge benefit to big game, uh, deer and elk, as well as uh, rough and, and dusky grouse, and um, I'm not sure if there's turkeys in there or not, um, but would benefit them if there were. And uh, yeah, so that's the main species of interest there. Um, we didn't list any, uh, there would probably be benefit to sport fish as well. Uh, we didn't list that there, but this just kind of shows the, the habitat there, the conifer encroaching. Uh, next picture, and then just showing what they've done already in, in the first phases. This is a second phase, just showing what it will look like afterwards. So really open it up, open up that understory, get the, um, the good vegetation for, for big game and other wildlife. So finance, uh, fairly cheap project. Um, 168,000 for BDAs, uh, fire prevention and forest thinning practices. And looking at from Habitat Council, 10,000. And it's all big game, but you could probably put some benefits to some of the other species too. Um, any questions? I originally did not see any of the uh, upland in there just because there's not a lot of, there's not supposed to be turkeys up there. There are, but <laughs> <laughs> they they don't like the turkeys in that area just because of the, the, the uh, turkey um, farms. Farms, thank you. Um, and then I wasn't sure how much that stream gets fished. I don't know that I've ever seen anyone fishing in that area, but Paul or Randy may have a better. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any fishery value to it. And looking at the topo map online, it looks like it might be intermittent, at least portions of that stream as well. So I don't, I don't think it supports much of a fishery, if any. Yeah, I guess you could make the case that by doing this work, we hopefully would make it 
perennial, but that's fine. Yeah, I guess in terms of boreal toad and looking at the comments on the proposal, um, it doesn't look like it, uh, they've really been verified here. There's some mapping, um, but uh, I think, I guess I would lean towards um, probably not putting aquatic funding into this one. Okay. Okay, any other questions for Robbie on this? Okay, we'll look for a motion on this project. I'll make the motion, this is Tyler, to send it for funding consideration. Okay, we have a motion from Tyler. <clears throat> I'll second that. Okay, and we have a second from Randy. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Kobe? Yes. Kobe votes yes. Tyler made the motion. Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Yes. Darren? Votes yes. Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes. Um, Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes. And Randy, you made the second, so you're good there. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, next one. Um, so, 5160, Goshen Watershed Restoration, go. All right, thanks. This one's one of mine as well that I, I worked with Chelsea Larson from the NRCS. She actually um, first started this project, she actually got a NRCS grant to do some bull hog work on private land. You'll zoom into the north part of that project. Yeah, so click on that for this northwest, there you go. So that was what the NRCS uh, got partial funding to do that. And then I joined the project and I'm looking at what other things we could do surrounding that project to, to add to it. And so we reached out to the CITLA, let me see that blue chunk there, and Ethan Hallows from CITLA. And we're going to do some bull hog on CITLA as well, as well as uh, there's a lot of cheat grass infestation up there. And so uh, we're gonna try this new granular plateau on CITLA and then that little band that runs along the foothills there as well. Um, just to kind of create a, a fire break there is the idea uh, by removing that cheat grass and getting uh, perennial grasses and, and forbs established. And then uh, we want to do some BDA work down there in Goshen uh, Canyon. If you can click on that. So we're going to work with uh, uh, Bass, Wayne Bass, who owns private property there to do BDAs. And then on the Sitla, and then further up on private. And if you keep zoom out, we actually have uh, an old or a Columbia spotted frog population in leash tub that is really struggling, pretty much blinked out. If you go down by Mona, so it's all part of that same watershed there. Um, actually connects to our burst and ponds, and um, so we just do some some work there as well to try and get that Columbia spotted frog population back. So just working with our native aquatics biologist on that. So um, yeah, just uh, it'll benefit. Uh, we get mule deer uh, in those hills wintering in the winter. They come across, um, and we have chuckers, pronghorn. Um, well, some waterfowl benefit um, and Columbia spotted frog and is a brown trout uh, fishery, so sport fish. And funding sources, we're asking for uh, 10,000 from Habitat Council and it's a 50, 40, 10 looks like. So 
So you could possibly put some sport fish money in there. But um, let's see, I guess, sorry, we didn't look at any pictures. Let's see if you. So it just shows the juniper encroachment there. But we'll be doing bull hog ink work, protect that understory sagebrush for winter use by big game. And some of the cheat grass you can see there. And more of that cheat grass right on the edge of those ag fields and in the foothills, create a fire break. And then we'll just do BDAs, just a picture of some of the BDAs we've done in the past. Yeah, so any questions? Robbie, um, do you know if the Dwayne Bass property is still under walk-in access? It is. Good question. Robbie, I know there are some beaver in this area already, or we've had some nuisance beaver down and around there. Is there any concern that the BDAs will just increase those problems? Is that, I'm guessing down lower where most of those problems are in the... It, they get in there, then they blow out the ditches and they, you know, yeah, um, I mean, I I would guess that it would potentially suck beavers away from maybe some of those more problem areas. Um, we don't have plans on putting beavers there. It would just be to kind of repair that incision uh, over a few year period of time. And then once you get that sediment built back up to fix that incised channel, get that vegetation back, and stabilize those streams. So we wouldn't have any plans on, on putting beavers there or increasing the beaver population in that area. But. Thanks, Robbie. Any other questions? Okay, we'll look for a motion on this project. Uh, this, is, this is Paul Burnett. I'll I'll do a motion. Um, so it looks it looks like there is definitely, especially with the um, the least chub. Is it least chub? I lost yeah. my list. Uh, least chub and are they can are least chub and brown trout? Are they co-occurring? Uh, no, I think the least chub are up um, south of the reservoir. And the brown trout are more okay yeah. okay um so yeah so uh, so i'll i'll make a motion that um we tentatively approve this this project for funding consideration at uh, uh 15 percent sport fish and shoot sorry my uh window just disappeared on me i had the percentages Um, so, so 15% sport fish and 45% uh, big game, 35% upland game, and 5% uh, non game wildlife. Okay, we have a motion to fund that. 45, 35, 15, and five. Do we have a second? This is Tyler, I'll second it. Okay, we have a second from Tyler. We'll go through the roll call. Uh, Kobe. Uh, it's, it's a no for me. I just need to know more about, I don't know if we wanna be increasing big game populations right there. Okay. A lot of orchards conflicts. Kobe votes no. Uh, Tyler seconded the motion, Jack. 
Yes. Jack votes yes. Darren. No. Darren votes no. Okay, Dwayne. Yes. Dwayne votes yes. Um, Paul, you made the motion, so you're yes. Randy. I'm going to vote no on that on the basis. I don't know if there's that much sport fish value there. Okay. Thank you. And so with that, we have one, two, three, four yeses. And one, two, three no's. So the motion carries four to three. Okay, thank you, everybody. Good discussion. Okay, we're gonna move on to project uh, number uh, 5211, Southern Sheep Rocks Habitat Enhancement, phase one. Hi, Go this ahead. is Boyd White. Yes. I'll be presenting this project. So this is in Ott's Canyon on the southwest side of the Sheep Rocks. This is a, a phase one of uh, probably three phases to do juniper removal and BDA work on the southern side of the Sheep Rocks. So we've already started some work in this canyon. And if you turn on the adjacent projects, you'll see that the BLM has, has done quite a bit of work uh, on other projects. And this will dovetail into their, into their project and open this up for sage grouse. It's also a good mule deer an elk project, even though we're not managing elk in the sheep rocks, they do have them out there. So this is a 952 acre bull hog and reseeding and uh, 180 BDAs in a two and a half mile stretch of uh, Otts Creek. Currently Otts Creek is perennial for the first mile um, and then the second mile and a half is uh, ephemeral. So we want to put in these BDAs and hopefully make the whole thing perennial. We'll see how that works. Um, we're planning to contract this out so that it's done quickly and we should be able to see the immediate results. I've also talked to Chris Crockett about going out to look at planting some Bonneville cutthroats in this, in this reach because of the perennial water. I think it's a good place to have a refuge population, even though we might not need it. Um, so I'm planning to go out there with him sometime this spring and look at that. And uh, so if you looked at the species, well, I guess we already talked about it. We can look at the finance page. So most of the cost is going to be uh, the bull hug work, which is uh, going to be higher price since it's in a remote location. It's, it's quite difficult to get fuel out there and, and to keep people working out there. So it's a $550 per acre. Um, does anybody have any questions? This is Jack. Um, I have a question. What's what's the track record in using BDAs like this to turn an ephemeral stream into a perennial stream? We don't know, or I don't know at least. Um, so, so the stream. The reason we think that we can make it. Uh, perennial is because it, it's perennial for a mile and then it just kind of goes subsurface. We think that if we can keep the water in in these BDAs, then we'll be able to uh, keep water in the stream further down. It may not go the whole way to the reach, along the reach, but we think at least three quarters of the way down. So there are a couple of springs that are lower where the, the stream is ephemeral and those springs are perennial. So we're, we just kind of have I, a hope that that'll work. 
is is vegetation management part of it and the drainage to um you know i don't know if removing certain types of vegetation increases the amount of water in the drainage like like what they're going to be removing some of the some of the willows if you go to the the images there's some images of the of Otts creek and there's i mean there's uh willows and and uh, narrow leaf cottonwood there's some birch in there um just click through the pictures it just shows you the kind of willows that are in that area that'll be good for building the bdas so what what kind of vegetation are you talking about removing we're removing a lot of the trees yeah that's that's what i was wondering if you if you have a lot of pj on the slopes i don't know if that consumes a lot of the water that would otherwise be flowing into the stream so we've we've already worked on this in previous years and done some whop and scatter and some bullhog work and we want to continue okay. doing the bullhog work okay so that so that there's more water available thank you any other questions Boyd, I've got a question. This is Eric. Um, what are the uh, water rate considerations in this area for 180 BDAs on, on this project? We don't, and Robbie can probably speak to this, we don't think there'll be any water rights required. Um, but SITLA has a water right and the private landowner has water rights as well. I'll jump in real quick. Um, we, we ran this through Eric Anderson as one of the on our list, and it sounds like he from the regional engineer didn't see any issues on that side of the sheep rocks with water rights. So. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. I think especially with with that large number of BDAs, we have to be really sensitive to the the water right situation and make sure that we're Following, following the lead of the regional engineer from uh, Division of Water Rights on. Um, Good question. Go ahead. So, okay. Any other discussion on this project? Um, did I did I hear correctly? This is Paul. Oh, sorry. This is Paul. I just have a quick question. Did I hear correctly that you're going to be doing is it riparian vegetation removal with this project? No. No. Okay. Okay, any other questions? All right, we'll look for a motion on this project. This is this Tyler. Is I move to approve it. This is Tyler, okay. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Jack and second from Tyler. We'll run through the roll call. Yes. Thanks, Kobe. <laughs> Tyler, you're already a second. Jack, you were the motion. So Darren, you're up. Yes. What's yes? Dwayne. What's yeah. yes? Paul. I vote Andy. And I also vote yes. Votes yes. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, all right. Okay, next project, uh, 5245 Sheep Creek, phase two. Go ahead. All right, so this one is a, another forest service project, uh, prescribed fire up uh, by Sheep Creek. Um, if you're familiar with that area, up Spanish Fork Canyon. And this is the second phase. They did a prescribed burn last couple of years and they want to continue with that effort um, so they have about 5,000 acres almost identified in their NEPA to to burn and they'll just burn as much as they can within that area and let's see if they have any images So this is a tiny image of the fire they did 
uh, last couple of years up there. And that's phase one. So they'll have uh, hand crews on the ground and helicopter uh, dropping um, the fire on top of the trees. And it, it's a good um, technique and they'll do it in the uh, fall or spring when conditions are uh, not too dry that they will have a fire get out of hand. Um, and species benefit will be um, big game. Um, turkeys, we release a lot of our turkeys up there, our nuisance turkeys, and moose, elk, deer. Um, and I, I was not aware that there was Columbia spotted frog up there. Um, I believe there are some southern leather side chubs down below, and I guess the 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 thinking is that by doing this, you avoid having a, a catastrophic fire in the worst conditions possible. You know, you're doing this fire when conditions are optimal and it's controlled, and to reduce some of that uh, fuel load as well as regenerate the the aspen and remove that conifer encroachment. Um, so it should benefit a lot of species. Um, let's go to finance. And we've got a Habitat Council. I think it's 20,000 they're asking. And right now it looks like it's 100 big game. Um, I think you could probably move some of that around uh, with the turkeys and, and other wildlife that's there. So that's all I have. Any questions? If nobody has Paul, I'm just looking at the comments on the um, WRA website, and I'm just curious has 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 there been consultation with Aquatics on this one? I know there was some concerns, and they went back and forth with uh, um, some emails and things like that to to address that. Once again, Justin Robinson is heavily involved in planning it, and he's their Aquatics. I'll just be, I think if you look at those comments, there was some concerns with the fisheries down below. And I believe that has taken place, that consultation. So. Okay. Okay, any, any other questions for Rob yeah. beyond this project? Okay, we'll look for a motion. This is Darren West. I'll uh, tentatively approve the project for funding consideration. Okay, thank you, Darren. <clears throat> this is Colby. I have a second on that. Could we have a, would you entertain a substitute motion to tentatively approve with a split of 80% big game, 20% upland? I'll second that. Okay, so we have a substitute motion from Covey to switch the funding to 80-20, big game versus upland game. And we have a second from Tyler. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Covey, you're already on there. Uh, Tyler, so Jack. Yes. yes. Jack votes yes on the substitute. Uh, Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes. Paul? I'll vote yes. Votes yes. Randy? Yes. Votes yes. Okay. The substitute motion carries uh, unanimously. Okay. Thank you. That one, that one went well. So, all right. Okay. We're going to keep on trucking through these here. Uh, Hey, Project Eric, number Eric, oh, real quick. Ahead. This is Justin. I'm I'm back on. So, Justin, we we voted you off the island quite a while ago. Oh crap! I'm kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you for being back. So thanks, guys. Been fun. See you later. And Eric, you were relieved. 
Okay. Eric, Wait, before we move on, can I just make sure I heard it where I that um, on fifty two eleven Jack did the motion? I just want to make sure I did that right. That is correct. Jack did the motion. Tyler seconded the motion, and the funding was switched to 45, 35, 15, and five. Perfect, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Kobe. Appreciate your time filling in. And thanks for coming back, Justin. We didn't vote you off the island, we promise. Okay, uh, 5186, Willow Watershed Restoration Project, phase three, go ahead. All right, this is Robbie Edgel again. Uh, central region and uh, this is Willow Watershed Restoration Phase 3. So we've done, uh, we're currently working up there right now on some earlier phases of this project and it's it's pretty much right adjacent to that other project we were talking about in New Canyon. Um, but it's exciting to see, like I said before, the Forest Service uh, getting projects done on, on their land in these high elevation areas. And um, it's, like I said, it's really what we need, especially for our big game, as they need that good condition as they go into the winter by improving summer condition of the habitat. It's really going to be beneficial for them. So um, this will be, yeah, I believe it's a uh, lot pile and burn. Is that correct? Yeah, on that. And then and so on the forest, it'll be lot pile and burn. In that big polygon there and then on the private there's some cabins right there they worked with forestry fire and state lands to just do some work to create some buffers around uh, those cabins with fire forestry fire and state lands and then we plan on doing some uh, stream work as well while we're up there with some bdas so uh, trying to just uh, treat all aspects of uh, the ecosystem while we're in the area and um, yeah, it should be a wonderful project. Uh, elk, mule deer, grouse, and um, I guess no turkeys because they don't like turkeys in that area. Um, and uh, I wouldn't say there's any aquatics benefits really. I mean, there potentially could be a boreal toad, but we didn't put that on the list. Um, Yeah, you can look at some pictures. Just showing the conifer encroachment up there. Next picture. Next picture. And just what it looks like afterwards. So we'll have to take you all up there and look at all the work that's being done. It really looks awesome and we're excited about it. Finance, we're asking for 20,000. It looks like it's 100% big game. Um, I guess you could put a little bit on uh, upland game if you wanted to. But any questions? Is there a fishery in Willow Creek? Um, not that I know of, it's pretty small. Um, yeah. Potentially could be something in the future. I guess I wonder if there'd be potential for, uh, instead of EDAs, um, since, since you're doing large scale uh, tree removal, if there'd be a potential to incorporate the woody debris into the stream instead of BDAs, um, given that the materials will be there. Uh, but yeah. I guess I'd, I'd like to know more about the fishery or the fish population anyway in here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't had a chance to, to really look into that much. Um, we just saw the opportunity kind of late in the game to, to add a riparian component to it. Um, so we'll do more of that investigation this, this summer. So. But I love your suggestion of using the large woody material as well. 
I'll mention that to the, we'll put that in the contract to just knock down trees into the stream and while they're there. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. okay. Any other comments on this project? All right. We'll look for a motion then. Does Darren Westall tentatively approve the project for funding consideration? Okay, we have a motion from Darren. Any second? This is Jack. I second the motion. Okay, thank you, Jack. All right, uh, roll call. Justin. Yes. Votes yes. Tyler. Yes. Votes yes. Jack, you had seconded. Darren, you had submitted the motion. Dwayne. Yes. Votes yes. Paul. I'll vote yes. Votes yes. Randy. Yes. Okay, motion carries unanimous. Thanks, everybody. All right. Okay, next one 5217 Central Wasatch Front Conservation Project. Go for it. Okay, so this one is another one on the Wasatch Front. And, uh, you know, it has a, a large fire component. Um, emphasis as well. You'll click on that big polygon there. I guess it's all of it. It kind of highlights there's several smaller polygons throughout that uh, go all the way down um, pretty far there um, over by Lone Peak and, and Cedar Hills. And it's high elevation. It's exciting to see us being able to work in this area. Um, a lot of um, interested parties along the Wasatch Front. And so the Forest Service has really done a great job of pulling lots of different people together. And we're continually working to uh, reach out to the public and educate people about uh, restoration techniques and uh, surprisingly groups that would have, you'd think, be opposed to uh, mechanical treatments are now being more open to that and seeing the necessity, especially in these areas where you know, a lot of people and trails that a prescribed fire is really almost impossible to, to do, especially with air quality so close to the, uh, the valley there. So, so it's really exciting to see the Forest Service uh, get these projects going. It's uh, 8,000 acres almost, or 8,490 acres. And any images, let's see. Yeah, uh, just not really there. It's kind of showing one of the the polygons there where they'll be doing treatments, but it'll be a, a conifer thinning. And once again, dealing with that balsam woolly adelgid uh, insect infestation as well, and trying to get ahead of that um, by removing the fur, which it, it pretty much just targets fur species. And so by removing those trees, uh, we'll hopefully prevent having a, a large, dead stand of conifer and a, a huge fire risk and, and also a, uh, not very valuable for wildlife. So it'll open up the understory, increase vegetation. Um, so beneficial for big game. And looks like we're doing 100% big game. And that's, that's probably pretty accurate. So any questions? Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, if there's no questions, uh, we'll look for a motion then. This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to Ted will be approved for funding consideration. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Uh, okay, that was Randy. All right. Thanks, Randy. Okay, roll call. Justin. Yes. Yes. Tyler made the motion. Jack. Yes. Votes yes. Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes. Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes. Randy, you'd made the second, so the motion carries unanimously. Okay. 
Last one for Central Region, 5180 Eagle Mountain Wildlife Migration Corridor Preservation. Go. Uh, Shane, are you on? All right, I guess he's not on, so I'll do this one too. All right, so um, Shane Hill is our impact analysis biologist out of the Central Region. And so he deals a lot with the um, vehicle collision aspects, as well as partnering uh, with the migration initiative. Um, and so as part of the migration initiative, um, Daniel Olson and the wildlife section collared uh, uh, mule deer on, in this area. And we've been able to track their uh, movements between summer and winter range. And we've identified a, several corridors and an actual migration route. Um, and so basically what Shane has done is he's identified from that data, this route is where the deer are taking to get from Camp Williams and they go down onto uh, Lake Mountains there and even further south, almost down by Eureka is where they winter. And then they'll go back up in summer on the Ochres. And so it's a pretty awesome uh, migration route to identify and as Eagle Mountain is expanding very quickly. They plan to, it, they have plans to be the largest city in the state. So pretty much that whole area that's open now plans to be homes and other development. So it's really critical that we take the opportunity now to preserve a corridor to allow this migration to continue. And so with this project, we also got uh, money from a NIFWIF grant. And so it's about 90,000 from them. And then we're asking for another 90,000 to uh, help build some wildlife fence along the highway there to funnel them into the corridor, as well as to uh, do some work actually in the corridor area, uh, removing that cheat grass and doing some seeding and some um, tree and shrub planting just to make it so that they have some cover there and will actually use the corridor once it's preserved. And he's working with Eagle Mountain City actively and they're putting into their uh, city uh, codes to require a certain amount of green space from developers that they'll use to protect that, that corridor. And um, there's also potential for some uh, a wildlife crossing there, obviously is our eventual goal. Um, and yeah, you can see some pictures. So we do get a lot of wildlife being hit there. Next picture. This would show, this is the opening where we would funnel the deer through. Next. And it shows Lake Mountain in the distance there, Camp Williams. So they just run across those that opening and come across the highway. Next slide. shows kind of the, the area that's going to be developed. Does he have a photo of the migration route on there? Map or anything? That's a... Looks like it's a needs assessment. So it just shows the vehicle collisions that are happening there. So we have mule deer and pronghorn that are being hit. I guess not, but um, anyways, we're really excited you know, to use this data that we're getting from the migration initiative and be able to develop a project that's targeting uh, preserve, preservation of that migration route. Uh, would love any uh, funding that can help go towards that effort. So, any questions? Robbie's Darren, I got a couple questions. Um, 
so the the coloring data from the migration initiative it does show that these deer summer up on the ochres yeah i mean there's different deer do different things but it does show them moving up onto the ochres and on camp williams as well and and then they and then right during the winter they come down and it, they use that corridor that we have identified and go on to lake mountain and even further south so yep okay i think it's great i think it's a great project with how the eagle mountain's growing i i live here so i see how many um, deer car fatalities there are and it's it's unfortunate i would um with that said, being said that i think it's great to preserve that while we have it um i'd really like to see some work done with the state to provide a an underpass there um because there's they've got those snow fences there like you said and even with the electronic signing they've put in the the highway mortality is I, it's probably increased more than decreased because they're all funneled into one spot to cross and it bunches them up and they they all go at once so um i, I again i support it i think it's great um, but I, I would like to see some efforts from you dot to to uh, partner with you guys on putting an underpass there yeah, and we're hoping by by doing this. So, yeah, like you say, there's that that um, snow fence on the north side. We'll put uh, this fence on the south side, and we're really hoping that that effort will uh, encourage UDOT to put uh, an underpass there. And we also have put in the stimulus uh, package may provide funding for an underpass there as well. And so we've requested that addition so this map here shows those corridor routes of where they're going so they're going up on camp williams and on the ochres and um in those foothills there and, and then coming down and going almost down to eureka uh, this is jack it, it looked like the project was uh south all south of uh highway 73 is the land on the north side of that is that governmentally owned or who owns that? Um, yeah, so it's, um, I believe it's private property on that side. Um, but you, uh, Camp Williams is um, working to preserve additional lands outside of their property right now. I think I just saw something where they actually have uh, purchased that already. And, um, but of course, we would work on that north side as well just this phase of the project we just wanted to focus on that that south side yeah thank you i think it's also important to bring up the uh, all the work that has been done over on cedar fort in that area for the for the mule deer but also um the private land one of the main private landowners in that area has been very um uh, helpful in improving wildlife habitat. And um, I, I wonder if he'd be interested in doing some kind of conservation easement or something through there. I don't know um, what your interaction with him has been, Robbie, but I know there were some talks before uh, several years ago about potentially doing that. Yeah, so I would love to see an easement or even purchase so that creation of a new wildlife management over in that area over where Daniel's pointing right now as well. As you saw, there's kind of two, two branches of that corridor where they're moving. So the one would be where we're talking right now on the right side. And then uh, one of the others would be over there where Daniel is now. And they, um, they're just pack in there in the winter. And, and even in year round, there's, there's deer in that area. And we've done a lot of work in that area already. Okay, that's some good discussion. And so I think we want to move ahead on this project uh, to a motion, maybe. This is Justin, Eric. I'll, I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding and, and great work, Robbie. This is awesome. Okay, thank you, Justin. Is there a second? This is Darren, I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Darren. Okay, roll call. So Tyler. I vote yes. Vote yes. Jack. Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, Darren made the second. So, Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes. Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes. Randy? I also vote yes. Votes yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So, I've been out to this area, and the probably one of the really cool things about this project is uh, just the, the interaction with the city of Eagle Mountain and how uh, how much of a proponent they are of this project and, and about maintaining this corridor. And UDOT is queued up there. They're, we're working with them and, and exploring all options. Uh, and then that property on the northern end, we're looking at easement possibilities and lots of other options. And so, um, you know, lots of aspects of this project are really shiny. Yeah, and thanks. So thank thanks, guys. I just want to make sure um, Shane Hill gets all the credit for for all that work. He's really been the leader on that, and I've just been you know, helping him. So, thanks, yeah. everyone. All right. Hey, thanks, Central Region folks, uh, for your presentations. Uh, we're going to move on to Northeast Region uh, project um, 5233 Sowers Canyon Watershed Improvement. Go ahead. Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, hi, Tori. Uh, this is Tori Mathis. I'm the habitat restoration biologist in the Northeast region. Uh, so the Sowers Canyon watershed project is one that the Ashley National Forest brought to our group. It has two main components. Uh, one is a stream restoration, uh, riparian restoration project in Sowers Canyon itself, uh, trying to uh, aggrade the stream, make riparian improvements. The forest is going to do all of that internally. They're providing all of the funding. They're going to take care of that all by themselves. So for our purposes today, I think it's uh, probably better for us to focus on the other part, which is uh, a classic lop and scatter project up on Anthro Mountain. Uh, if you turn on the adjacent projects, you'll see we've worked with the forest on Anthro Mountain for years to uh, open up and maintain these sagebrush openings on Anthro Mountain, uh, primarily for sage grouse, but also for big game. I think this might be the final phase on that, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's a lop and scatter project, um, cutting out encroaching pinion and juniper um, from the sagebrush areas, um, pretty straightforward on, as far as that goes. If you go to the funding, tab uh, you can see the you know all of the material and the the equipment use for the stream work is going through the forest uh, or their in-kind contribution the only thing they're asking for is for the lock and scatter contract estimated at uh, $65 an acre for nearly a thousand acres there so um, I think uh, Allison had uh, we had that split out. The, it's listed as 100% big game right now. I think sage grouse is probably uh, going to benefit from this as much as anything, but uh, that's up to you guys to decide. So, any questions? Thanks, Tori. Um, these photographs are all down in the stream itself. This is Sowers Canyon showing what uh, what has been done on, on other areas, um, kind of what they hope to, to see with this future phase. Uh, again, that's all internally with the forest though, so. Any more questions? Any questions for Tori on this project? All right, we'll look for a motion. This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to approve it for funding consideration. This is Darren. I'll second. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Darren. Okay, we'll do the roll call. Uh, Justin. Yes. Votes yes. Tyler made the motion. So, Jack. Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren, you had seconded, so Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes, Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes, Randy? And yes. Votes yes, motion carries unanimously, thank you. Okay, next project. 
5237 White Rocks Watershed Improvement. Go ahead. Okay, this is Tori again. Um, this is another one that the forest, the Ashley National Forest brought to us. Um, they're coming at it from a fuels reduction standpoint, primarily. Um, it was in, what was it, 2008, the Neola North Fire burned a large area in that, uh, just south of, of this area, and, and the residents have been concerned about fires ever since. Um, so they've identified a number of different uh, fuels reduction treatments. They also have some watershed or riparian stream improvements, again, that, uh, that the forest is going to be taking care of internally, some erosion control and, and other things. Um, if you can highlight the affected area, I want to talk about that one first. Um, so the affected area here is what they're they're needing funding for on this is a silvicultural prescription. Uh, the NEPA has already done, archeology span has already done, but they need this silvicultural prescription to determine what work is actually going to take place. This is um, pr primarily going to be conifer removal from Aspen, again, in, in uh, the context of fuel, fuels reduction. Um, so th there's this area, as well as others around that are working on reducing the threat of wildfire um, by taking that conifer out of the aspen. But according to their rules, they have to have this silviculturist write a prescription to say exactly how many trees, what size, where, and all of that. And so they apparently that's been a bottleneck in, on the Ashley National Forest. And so they're needing help to provide funding for a, a silviculturist to come in and provide that. Uh, prescription so that they can move forward on that. So Daniel, if you'll just uh, turn that, um, go back to the map and just turn that affected area all the way off. I'll just make it transparent so that we can see the rest of it. The, so the, there's a, a couple of different components the, the, they're looking for funding for the silvicultural prescription for this aspen treatment. Um, then there's our other areas labeled as lop and scatter. Uh, they're removing conifer from uh, from areas that have sagebrush as, in terms of that south one, uh, the one that's highlighted now, or in other um, ponderosa areas or even into aspen areas where it's um, where it's thinner and they can get to. That north polygon that's labeled as lop pile burn is more of a ponderosa area, so it would be more of a thinning. They'll uh, cut the pinion and juniper out of that pile, uh, those the, the cut trees and then come back later with uh, with their fire crews and burn the piles. Um, again, there are some uh, opportunities for stream improvements, including adding large woody debris to the, to the streams, protecting springs in there. Um, those are things that the forest is planning on. Uh, I don't have a lot of details on that because they're planning to do that all internally and it wasn't really spelled out clearly on the proposal and I wasn't able to get a lot of those details with that. Um, they do have some photos on the, the proposal. Uh, I think they're mostly in, uh, in relation to some issues on the road with uh, runoff that's adding sediment to the stream. They're going to address those. Again, that's internally, but you can see a lot of the conifer in the aspen. Um, so they're wanting to go in and take out a lot of that conifer protect the aspen stands and the nearby communities from uh, wildfire. So it should be a good project, um, good to see happen. Any questions on that? I, I've just got one, It's this is Justin. It's it's not entirely clear to me the, the purpose of it. Is this more of a, a big game project or is this more of a stream um, not restoration project per se, but stream protection project. I, you, you kind of spoke to both and in looking at the funding, it's a hundred percent big game. Should we entertain adding some sport fish uh, funding to that or, or leave it be? What are your thoughts there? Um, I, I agree with you and, and understand the, that it's not entirely clear. I think from the forest perspective, there are two main priorities. One is stream protection. The other one is uh, hazardous fuels reduction. And the wildlife benefit is for them is kind of an aside. 
I think we look at it as as a stream pr protection and possibly you know, uh, some possibility of enhancement as well as wildlife habitat. Um, as far as the funding goes, the only funding they're asking for is for the mechanical treatments in the removing the conifers. They're not asking for any funding to do the stream work. So while I think some of uh, fisheries dollars would be appropriate, they wouldn't be spent on the stream because the forest is taking care of that internally. The, the money that we get from this would be spent on those mechanical uh, fuels reduction treatments. Uh, so uh, I'll let you guys decide on that, but that's, that's my understanding of, of how it's working. Oh, th thanks for the clarification. It looks like a, gr a great project to me. If there's nothing else, Eric, I'll, I'll make a motion unless there's more discussion. All right, go ahead, Doug. Uh, I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding consideration. All right, we have a motion. This is Dwayne, I'll second it. Okay, we have a second from Dwayne. Thank you. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin, you made the motion, so we'll move to Tyler. I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren? Yes. Jeff? Wayne, you made the second, so we'll go to Paul. I'll vote yes. Votes yes. Randy? And yes. Votes yes. The uh, recommendation to approve is unanimous. Thanks. Okay. Uh, project 5304. Uh, Tabby Mountain WMA lop and scatter maintenance. Okay, we'll take a break in about 15 or 10 minutes or so. So, okay, this is Tori again. Uh, so, this is on our Tabby Mountain WMA um, there in Duchesne County between Tabiona and Fruitland along Highway 208. We have done a lot of work on the WMA to provide uh, forage for wintering elk and deer. Um, as you know, Tabby Mountain WMA is really important for wintering elk. Uh, we get thousands of elk that, that come onto there in the winter. If we can provide forage for them, hold them onto the WMA, then they don't go down into the hay fields and cause us problems with depredation. Um, so we've done a lot of work and, and going back 10 or 15 years, and some of them even, and, and some of those areas were starting to get trees coming back in to those sagebrush areas that we had previously opened up. Um, in addition, there were some areas that, that had not yet been treated. Um, so uh, Daniel, I don't know which one you're highlighting right now, if you just click on one of them. So this one, the, the yellow portion now, are areas that had not previously been treated. So I wanted to get done and take the, the conifers out of these areas, but I didn't feel like it was big enough to do just one project all on its own. Um, but now the other polygon is areas that had been previously treated that after visiting it um, in the last year or two, I decided it's probably about time to do a maintenance project. So this highlighted area is all maintenance and adding those two together, I, I thought we'd have a, a project of, of size that would be worth, worth doing. So um, it's nearly 3,000 acres now with both of those uh, lock and scatter project um, trying to preserve sage grouse or sage brush areas. There are sage grouse in the area. Um, there are uh, lots of elk and deer. As a minor component, uh, Daniel, if you'd go to the, the images, um, I want to try experimenting with something that I have not done before. Um, so if you just click on that first one there. Um, I'd like, to, well, I guess that's the wrong one. Go to the next one. Uh, uh, ORD. So I'd like to try experimenting with um, what's called a, a sometimes called Z dike structures, named after the guy that developed. Um, this is an example of one called a one rock dam. It's named a one rock dam because it's one rock tall. Um, there are a lot of dry washes and there are a lot of erosion problems on the Tabby Mountain WMA. Um, I'd like to to look at some of those that have not downcut uh, deeply yet. Um, and go in and, and try building some of these Z-dike structures 
uh, one rock dams, maybe some zoomy bowls if I can find a head cut, um, and try to prevent some additional erosion and down cutting, and maybe even um, fill in some of these washes a little bit. They're not perennial streams, but they do have water that runs through during storm events or runoff. So this is a minor component in terms of cost. Um, I've put into the budget a little bit of money to, to buy some rock because I don't have uh, much on site. Um, but I was, I've had some uh, personnel with the NRCS that, have, that has volunteered to uh, help uh, put these in. I've thought about having dedicated hunters come and, and help install these. Again, it's a little bit experimental. I haven't done this before, but if it works, we might um, increase a little bit of uh, or we might increase the soil moisture in some of these sage grouse areas and perhaps um, help recover some wet meadows in time. If they fill in, we can build another rock structure on top and, and continue to upgrade these uh, washes. So, um, But the primary component for the cost is the lock and scatter contract. So um, it is primarily for wintering elk, but there are sage grouse as well. So I don't know what the breakdown was there, but any questions? I've got one quick question again. Do we graze the Tabby WMA? Yes, we do have some spring grazing on um, parts of this, uh, of the WMA, that's it's on the south part. Um, I can't remember the the name of the guy that we got it from um but we do we do have some light spring grazing um targeting areas that are are historically had been uh chained and re and spiked and had the sagebrush removed and so we're targeting that grass um to promote sagebrush growth um it's just during the spring it's targeting specific areas most of that grazing does not come up onto this project area but um, but yes, there is some grazing on the Tabby Mountain WMA. Well, yeah, thanks for the clarification. I just saw under the species list that domestic livestock was one of the the, the benefits, and I I didn't realize we we grazed um, the the WMA. Um, okay, that that's helpful, and, and I don't have any issues with the grazing. I think that makes sense in the spring. So just curious. Any other questions on this project? All right, we'll look for a motion then. This is Darren West. Uh, this is obviously a critical big game winter range area. Um, so I think it's great and would tentatively approve the project for funding consideration. Okay, we have a motion from Darren. Do we have a second? This is Jack Halbernett. Okay. second. Jack. Okay. Jack, I think uh, we got you on that one uh, for a second. All right. We'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin? I vote yes. Votes yes. Tyler? I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack, you'd made the second. Darren, you'd made the motion. So, Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes. Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes. Randy? I also vote yes. Votes yes. The voting is unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. It's a little bit earlier than scheduled, but we had started up earlier than scheduled. So, 10, 10 minute break. We'll be back at uh, 2 21. Thanks, everybody.
Okay, we got one more minute and we'll get going again here. Okay, I think we're ready to get going. Um, hopefully everybody's back on. All right. Okay, next project. Uh, project number 5257, you uh, went to Mountain Meadow Restoration. Go ahead. Okay, this is Tori Mathis again. Uh, this is another one on the Ashley National Forest. Um, you can see uh, on the east end of the, the forest, uh, some of those meadows along Highway 191, as well as farther east around Oaks Park and uh, Trout Creek. Uh, this is uh, primarily a conifer removal from these high mountain meadows. Uh, it does get into a little bit of sage grouse there on that uh, southeast polygon, some sage grouse habitat, but otherwise it's big game summer range. Um, so it's, it's just removing conifers that are encroaching into these uh, meadows. If you can go to the images, um, they've got some really great historical photographs. Um, so this is a comparison between, uh, this is in Trout Creek Park. You can see the image on the bottom is from 1970 and the one on the top is from 2012. Uh, so you can see the number of conifers that have moved in and just are encroaching into that meadow. So they've got some good historical documentation that, that this is happening and they're going to try to reverse this just uh, with uh, chainsaw crews to go in and cut out some of those some of those trees. Um, they're hoping that the water tables in those meadows, meadows will rise as a result. Uh, should see some, some stream benefits to that as well. I asked them and talked to them about the possibility of using some of that cut material for stream restoration work in the vicinity. And they said that was a good idea, but we don't really have any specifics on what they might uh, actually do with that. So um, for now, I, I guess it's primarily a, a big game summer range habitat with a little bit of sage grouse on that one, one edge, but just clearing conifers out of these high, high mountain meadows. So on the, the funding, you see a couple of different issues there. They, part of the funding they're wanting to cut to contract or to get a contract crew to go in and cut those trees out. Another part is they, the guy that developed this, uh, Gary Brown on the forest, um, felt like some of their own people could do it cheaper and faster. Um, and so I don't know exactly how this is going to, to work out, but they wanted to provide additional funding to pay some Forest Service staff to, to cut additional acres. Um, uh, so there's, it, it's all the same project, all removing conifers, but some of it's going to be contracted out and some of it's going to be Forest Service uh, personnel uh, doing the cutting. But So the Habitat Council, um, request is ten thousand dollars. It should all be big game, I think. Any questions? 
Hey, Tori, it's Darren West. When will this project be complete? Um, the plan is that they will start cutting um, fall of 2020. Um, they have kind of a shorter time window up, up that high. Kind of needs to be done before. Um, we might be able to move into November, but you start to get snow falling. And then once the snow closes those off, it's not available again until June. So it's they're planning on doing it this fall. Uh, hopefully it works out that way. Okay. I I just I I was up there last year and I had received a slew of emails from the well, Forest Service had a controlled burn during the elk hunt out there, and okay. I, I received over nine hundred angry emails about that because they thought we'd funded it through WRI and I just if there's any way I know it's a it's a limited time frame at that elevation but if there's any way this can be done around the the hunting seasons especially the elk rut I I would appreciate that. I, I understand that and appreciate that concern. Um, the fact of the matter between timing restrictions built into the NEPA and weather, our hunting season is about the only time we have available to do work on the forest. So um, we'll, we'll do our best, but chances are we're going to be interfering with somebody sometime. Okay. This, this is Jack. This is maybe a broader question, um, but in terms of these um, historical photos, and there have been a couple of projects today where um, older photos have been used as a comparison. H how do we know that the old photos are a better reflection of what should normally be there rather than the current condition, given the very heavy grazing practices that often took place in the past? Uh, I think that's a great question and one that uh, probably should have come up at some point, but hadn't. Um, uh, it did cross my mind, but I, I probably just put it out of my mind because I, I like the project. Um, one of the, the things that we could look at is, is you know, evidence of tree growth in those meadows. Um, there are a, a few places where there are older trees that, that would have um, you know, indicated that there might be uh, that, that those trees had been growing there for longer than, than what we uh, would have liked. But primarily, in in almost all of those areas, they're just young trees that are. I I shouldn't hazard a guess on how old hold how old they are, but they're they're young trees. They're encroaching, and there isn't any evidence of other tree growth that had previously been there that I'm aware of. So I think it's, I think um, most people that have looked at this have, have said it's pretty clear that those meadows should be open, that they're, that the, the trees should be gone. Um, and our, our forest has been really careful about um, addressing those kinds of issues um, and not uh, removing trees from places where where they think it is historically present. Um, I, I think most people that look at this agree that they, the trees need to be gone. They, they weren't there historically and we'll be putting it back to what it should have been. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Paul. I, I also have a question. Uh, you know, in looking at some of the imagery, I admit that I haven't been to the site, but just looking at the aerial imagery, there's quite a bit of evidence that you know you can see some um some light down cutting and, in, and especially in a meadow system like this where even a foot or less or you know a couple feet of down cutting is going to totally change the hydraulics of the entire meadow system i just wonder if there's been um an assessment of uh you know water table change or looking at the elevations of the entire meadows and see if there are opportunities to um, <clears throat> find, you know, specific nick points where we might be able to uh, change the, the the stream conditions so that it does uh, rewater the those meadow conditions and may actually create, you know, conditions where the, the conifers wouldn't uh, continue to encroach. I'm just curious if, if that sort of analysis has been done here. Um, so it seems like there's a really good opportunity for 
uh, for that. Just looking right, you know, at the aerial imagery, uh, it's pretty pretty clear. Um, right, I I agree with you. I think it is um, that there are a lot of opportunities for some screen work here, and I don't know what kind of analyses the forest has done on this. I know I've had some informal conversations with some of their staff about uh, the potential of doing some of those kinds of projects to address um, down cutting and and the streams in these meadows. Um, but I don't know exactly what they have looked at previously. Uh, I know they have done, uh, there, there's one other project that was funded through WRI in government park where they, they addressed uh, the stream a little bit. But I think most of these have come from the from their uh, grazing perspective. And um, this project is being proposed by one of their, their uh, range personnel. And I'm not entirely sure they've had those conversations internally with their hydrologists and, and have gotten that all worked out. I've, I've had conversations and I, I think we can move in that direction, but it, uh, and again, there's probably some good possibilities of future work to do some stream restoration in here, but I don't know what their plans are exactly. Thank you. Right. Thanks for the additional questions. Are there any other questions for Tori on this project? Yeah, Tori, this is Darren again. Is this so? Is this considered more towards grazing or or wildlife habitat restoration? The the project manager is um, comes at this from a grazing perspective, um, but we know that we're going to benefit wildlife as well as, as livestock on this. It's, it's not a one or the other. So while the project manager might be looking at it from grazing, I think there are real benefits to wildlife here and we can look at it from a wildlife. Okay, I just am looking at the aerial views and it seems like the, the a lot of these acreages, it's very, very sparse, but. It is. It is. Um, most of the trees that are going to be removed are around the, the perimeter of those meadows. So the polygons show the entire meadow um, with the understanding that there are only going to be a, a handful of trees out in the middle. and Most of them are going to be removed around the edges. Okay. Okay. Um. Do we have a motion on this project? This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to tentatively approve it for funding consideration. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it, Eric. This is Justin. Thank you, Justin. Go through the roll call. Um, Justin, you seconded. Tyler, you had the motion. So, Jack, you're up. Yes. Jack votes yes. Darren? No. Aaron votes no. Dwayne. Yes. Votes yes. Paul. Uh, no. Votes no. Randy. I also vote no. Votes no. Okay. Uh, with that, we have uh, three no votes, four yes votes. Motion carries uh, four to three. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to move on to the next one. <clears throat> Project 5208, Shiner Basin McKee Bench Seating. Go ahead. Hey, this is Corey Mathis again. Um, the Shiner Basin uh, project is um, the, just there north of Dinosaur National Monument near Island Park. Um, Island Park is just to the east. Diamond Mountain is to the north and to the west. Um, this is a, a really critical wintering area for mule deer, but also for sage grouse. There is a sage grouse lek um, right on this bench, um, but this bench has been taken over by cheatgrass. If you, you turn the color off there, you can see just on the aerial fo uh, photo the, the difference in vegetation. Um, 
uh, you can uh, can see the the cheatgrass layer that's come in, um, and so the the idea behind this project is uh, it was previously sprayed with plateau herbicide to control cheatgrass, and uh, we want to go in this fall with the drill seeder and seed. Um, uh, native seed mix, uh, grasses, uh, shrubs, uh, some forbs. Um, it's all on BLM property right, right there near the uh, Dinosaur National Monument. Um, that's what the purple areas are, is the monument there at Island Park. Um, so it is uh, primarily for sage grouse and for mule deer. Uh, it's a really critical area for wintering mule deer, as we said. Um, just a drill seeding going in with the, uh, trying to control cheatgrass and replace it with the um, native vegetation that's going to be better for for our wildlife. So I don't think Natasha had any pictures on here, unfortunately. But uh, um, the uh, the seed mix there um, is a little bit more expensive. It is a native only mix. It does have a lot of native forbs in it. Um, there has been a, a push, I, I believe statewide, but we've seen it uh, here in our region quite a bit um, to focus on pollinators. And so Natasha has been uh, has been pretty involved in that movement and is trying to include um, a lot of native wildflowers and, and forbs for pollinators. But that's also going to be really good for our sage grouse. Um, and, uh, so. That, that's why the seed mix is a little bit more expensive than the drill seeding contract, um, as well as the archaeology clear, archaeological clearance. They're hoping to get that done just this uh, summer, and we can move on with seeding it probably in October. So. Any questions? Again, this is this is another project where there was a lot of mention about upland game, but all the funding is big game. Um, do, do you think there's value in in having an upland game component in this, Tori? If upland game is the right place for sage grouse, then yes, it's the right place. It is, yeah. Well, and fortunately, this is. You know, the sage grouse that spend time here are also on Diamond Mountain, and it is one of our huntable populations of sage grouse. So I think it probably is appropriate to include some upland game. Why don't we just split it 50 50? This point. Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne I, th I think that makes sense. If you want to make that motion, I'd certainly support it. No, I make the motion to. Split the funding 50% big game, 50% up the game, and consider it for funding consideration. Thank you, Dwayne. We have a motion to split 50 50. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second it, Eric. Okay, we have a second from Justin. We'll go through roll call. Justin, you had the second. Tyler? I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack? Sorry, I didn't have my mute off. Uh, I vote yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne, you had the motion. So we'll go to Paul. I vote yes. Votes yes. Randy? I also vote yes. Votes yes. Uh, so the motion carries unanimously. All right, next one. Um, project 5376, Book Cliffs West, Water Developments and Spike Treatment. Go ahead. Hey Eric, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Hi Pat. Okay. Hey everyone, this is Pat Rainbolt, uh, Habitat Program Manager in the Northeast Region. Uh, this is the Booklet West Water Development Project. A short history of this project. Um, 2018, we had a severe drought year. That's when we had a lot of the fires across the state. Uh, going into that winter, we had a very heavy snowpack, uh, particularly in the Booklet unit. Uh, and then Going into the spring of 2019, I had very low uh, survival of, of the mule deer out there and, and low birth rates. So um, during the summer of 2019, the Wildlife Board tasked our region 
to form a book clips working group. And a lot of you are familiar with that group and, and the products coming out of that now. Um, so that working group consisted of uh, BLM, CITLA, DWR, NRCS, uh, the producer in, in that area, the Farm Bureau and the U Tribe. And uh, we identified areas in need in the book clips. Uh, and we, we, we already knew this, but we figured out the book clips was really limiting in uh, summer rain. So we focused a lot of our efforts out there. And uh, the two things that rose to the top for good opportunities um, to help that deer herd and the wildlife herd out there in general were water and vegetative treatment projects. So this is a project that, that came out of that working group and that addresses those needs on the book list summer range. So uh, here's Daniel's going through the map here. Um, so you're looking at there's pond cleanings. There's eight of those. These are existing ponds that have just filled in and aren't functioning as well as they could. Um, there's three new pond constructions that are highlighted there. Um, the, uh, the herbicide treatment, that's a, a spike treatment on the sagebrush out there to, to promote the grass, uh, the grass component out there. Um, it's 460 acres. Uh, you can see on the map there, there's quite a bit of that spike treatment going on and, and PJ removal in that area. And then uh, let's go up to that first guzzler, please, Daniel. Yes, that one. Um, so that one's called the horse point guzzler. Uh, the apron on that is an old butyl apron. It's about 8,500 square feet. It's huge. It's a, a great water source that has been long in disrepair for at least 10 years. You can see the butyls kind of blown around there on the on the south side of that, uh, but um, so we we a lot of this proposal is is proposing to rebuild that. Um, that's something everyone has wanted, all these agencies for for quite some time. So good to see that finally get addressed. Um, and then the next uh, feature under that guzzler, it's uh, guzzler construction. There you go. Um, so these are two new big game guzzlers uh, with double aprons. Um, this addresses an area, Rock Springs, Cherry Mesa, Cedar Camp area. It gets a lot of use by bison. Um, we've had a lot of conflicts with bison out there with uh, other users on the landscape. And uh, this, so th these guzzlers and this project as a whole helps address uh, a lot of these issues in, in the in the book list unit. So. Um, we want to go to the pictures, please, Daniel. There you go. This is just uh, some examples of the of the guzzler use we see out there. Um, mule deer, like I said, uh, critical summer range. Uh, there's bison. It's a once in a lifetime species. Uh, very very cool to to see those using our guzzlers out there. Um, black bear out there. They get that's a, a big unit for for those animals. Um, let's see, what else do I have on there? That's an example of one of the ponds uh, in need of cleaning. That's kind of a small one, but uh, they do fill in over the years with the erosive nature out there of, of the landscape and, and they're just needed, in need of some cleaning. Also has some funding in there for um, uh, relining those ponds with clay uh, to, to kind of seal up those bottoms a little better. There's some elk on the, on the guzzler. So you see, a, Kind of see our guzzler in the picture there. It's a very low profile. They're 1800 gallon boss tanks. Uh, the apron on those, they're 40 feet long by 12 feet wide. So they collect quite a bit of, of water. So let's go to the finance. Um, so basically all the materials and supplies to build the guzzlers, the pond uh, contracting that out. The, uh, the guzzlers we build in house, we've gotten pretty good at those. Um, and uh, talk about the finance. I, Acquired a lot of the funding already. Um, in January, the BLM committed $10,000 through the range program, mainly for that horse, horse point guzzler. Uh, Sitla committed $14,900 uh, for, for the water projects. And uh, just uh, last week, uh, through uh, NRCS and, and Department of Ag, uh, our GIP proposal was approved for $92,000. $860. So a lot of this project is already funded. I'm just looking to fill in that 
that last 55,000 um, we have on here are only asking 5,000 from Habitat Council, but uh, definitely open to suggestions if you guys are, are interested in throwing some more at that. But uh, um, as far as uh, approvals go, um, all, of, all of this is on Scylla, except for that one big horse point guzzler. Uh, the horse point guzzler falls under maintenance with BLM. That's approved and ready to go uh, as far as NEPA goes. Um, with CITLA's approvals, they've, they have cleared these with art clearances and uh, gone through their processes and, and all this is shovel ready. So uh, um, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. I've got a couple. Um, the first is great job on getting so many partners involved, Pat. I think that's, it's always good to see proposals come in that have so much um, collaboration involved. Um, my, my question deals with the spike treatments on the north end of the book cliffs. That's the, the you know, 65, 70% of our deer use the north end uh, to winter as opposed to the south end. Um, with that spike treatment, and taking out sagebrush, if I if I heard you correctly, um, is that it, it? I guess what I'm getting at is, are we favoring elk and cattle and bison over deer on that unit because deer are not doing great either, or is it just that there's so much sagebrush that we don't think that's limiting, and so that's why we're comfortable doing a spike treatment? Well, uh, no, it's a good question, Justin, and and I have to give credit to the to the book list working group for the first part of your statement that that for getting all, all the, everyone at the table and, and helping out with this funding. So Tori and Miles and, and a lot of other folks were involved in that. So, um, and then the second part of your question, uh, this, this, is, this is just summer range for mule deer and elk. Um, it's on the, almost on the book cliffs divide on the south end of, of the book cliffs. So this is in their summer range where we're doing the spike treatment. The, but you're right, they do winter in the north end of the book cliffs, but that's a, that's uh, way outside of this project area. And um, like I said, there's, you know, there's tons of winter range out there, but uh, this project mainly deals with the summer range um, where those deer are, uh, are having their fawns. So I think uh, um, taking out some of the sagebrush out there um, doesn't really affect the, the mule deer so much. It really helps alleviate a lot of these conflicts we have with the elk and the bison out there. So. Yeah, my bad. I, I thought it. I thought it was north of the divide. In looking at it, so apologize for that. The the um, last question I have is um, our good friend Drew Cushing isn't here to ask it, and so but he stressed this pretty heavy last time. With a lot of the guzzler work that we've been doing, um, what what's the maintenance plan on that? Is that something that that you guys are going to build into regional uh, budgets and workloads or? with that working group, were there any commitments from the BLM or others to continue to do maintenance on these guzzlers? Um, just general maintenance, that's something we've worked into our maintenance budget that you guys usually see in January and February. Um, a lot of these guzzlers, the, the way we build them now, it's, it's really minimal maintenance. Some of these other guzzler maintenance projects you've seen, and I know there's been some issues with our um, addressing guzzlers that were built 15, 20 years ago. Um, they weren't really built right to begin with. So we feel like we've really streamlined the process and got it down to where these guzzlers just require the minimal amount of maintenance. We've worked out a lot of the, the things that break over the years, the plumbing, all, the, all that stuff we've eliminated that, that gives you the, the bulk of your maintenance issues. So these that we're building now, um, the maintenance for those in the future will come out of our, um, and it's already built into the, the regular regional maintenance budget. Yeah, thanks for thinking through that, Pat. I, I, I really appreciate those low maintenance um, guzzler projects that, and the book has got a lot of them. So thanks, this is a great project. Thanks. All right, thanks, Pat. Uh, any other questions? Okay, we'll look for a motion on this project. I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding. Okay, thank you, Justin. Is there a second? 
This is Jack. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Jack. Okay, we'll do the roll call. Uh, Justin, you made the motion. So, Tyler? I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack, you seconded. So, we're on to Darren. Yes. Votes yes. Wayne? Yes. Votes yes. Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes. Randy? I also vote yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, last one for uh, Northeast Region, 5325. Go ahead. Okay, this is Tori Mathis again. Um, this is the Ashley National Forest Aspen Restoration Project. Um, the shape file there, the polygons on the map include pretty much every aspen stand on the Ashley National Forest. Um, their idea is they want to do a programmatic environmental impact statement that will allow them to do aspen restoration work forest wide in the future. Um, and so they're, they're trying to get this programmatic EIS in place that will allow them to do work um, more efficiently in the future. As part of that, they need, um, I, I mentioned this before on, on one of their other projects, but they, they need to get archeological clearances done and they need to get silvicultural prescriptions done on, on portions of, of this area. Um, and so this, the project as it's developed right now is, is a planning project. We're planning for uh, work in the future. Um, we've been talking to them for years about trying to do work in Aspen stands. And this is a, is a good effort forest wide to, to try to tackle problems in Aspen, uh, wherever they might be. Um, we can't, I wish I could say exactly what the Aspen work was going to, to include, but that's, we're not going to know that until they get that silvicultural prescription done. Uh, in the methods box on the project details page, they outline what some of those methods might include. It could be uh, prescribed burning. It could be selectively cutting conifers um, with uh, bullhogs or, or other mechanized equipment. It could be chainsaw removal. Um, they could be girdling conifers, believing them standing. They could do the, it goes on and on. The, the, the possibilities of the work, um, it's, they're not leave, or the, they're putting everything on the table as possible, but it's going to be up to that silviculture prescription to say exactly what should happen and where. And so I wish I could give a little bit more specifics about what will happen and, and when, but this proposal and the funding that they're looking for is going to facilitate archeological clearances uh, that will allow us to do future work and silvicultural prescriptions that will allow us to do work on Aspen stands on the Ashley National Forest into the future. So it's it's a good effort that that they're making and, and I'm glad to see that they're doing this. Um, and I think it's worthy of support to see that this uh, this planning effort is is completed so that we can uh, eventually get on the ground and do the actual work. Uh, when we do that work, we're obviously going to be benefiting elk and mule deer, um, forest grouse species, turkeys, uh, other non-game wildlife as well. Um, so anyway, that's um, that's the, the Aspen project as I understand it. Are there any other questions? I, I've got a question. For, I got a question for Tyler real quick. Tyler, the, the bulk of this funding is UWRI NEPA fund. Um, what What is a NEPA fund? Is that any different than the WRI funds that we typically have? Or what, what is that exactly? Yeah, so several years ago, uh, we we had a general fund increase, an ongoing general fund increase of $250,000. And the intent language was... I don't even know if it made it to intent language, but it was basically directed to help with planning and NEPA and cultural resources. So that's what this, that's what the NEPA fund is. It's a quarter of a million dollars a year that we put towards this kind of thing. Yeah, and that ranked pretty high on, on your guys' list. We've actually stopped um, putting these through the ranking process. 
uh, in most of the WRI regions just because they don't rank very well. We have the, the regions and then at the statewide level, we'll kind of rank them um, according to how important we feel like the project is. And I'm not sure, Tori, I can't remember where this one ranked. Um, it seems like there was, a, there was two or three of these that came out of the Northeastern region. Yeah, I think we had four of these that we prioritized uh, for these plant dollars. And if I remember correctly, this one ended up number three. Um, it would have been higher, but the the forest itself wanted this one as a lower priority, partly because they've been getting some opposition from environmental groups about how generic it is that they, they don't have some of those specific treatments identified. And so I, I think they've got some NEPA issues to work through and and where the other projects that we were were also considering this funding, they had more specific uh, treatments in mind. The forest itself wanted this one as a slightly lower priority. Um, but I think in terms of wildlife, if we want to get things done on summer range on the Ashley National Forest, we've got to be looking in the Aspen. And this is a major effort that they are beginning to undertake to get some work done on aspen stands and and i think it's uh, I, I think it's worth supporting them in that effort I, I would agree i love the project i think i think this is the right approach so those are my comments go ahead paul i was curious about kind of the i guess the sequence of how this would go because it seems like at this scale developing the silver cultural prescription um that seems like that's going to be a pretty uh pretty detailed effort or pretty you know it's going to take some time to do that even before the the NEPA begins so I was I was assuming and I'm probably wrong but that the prescriptions will come out um there's got to be some sort of review I would hope on those and then and then the NEPA on the actual action is that kind of what we're looking at um, you know, I've I've had some of those same questions, and I've talked to to our Forest Service personnel a number of times about it, and they all admit that that sequence is ideal, but it's not what happens. Um, usually, what they do is they write to NEPA to say that that they will abide by this silvicultural prescription when it is developed, and then they do the prescription later, and I don't know what kind of review that silvicultural prescription receives, um, it, but the you know they they work it into the NEPA that, that they're abiding by this prescription and and I I don't know all the ins and outs of these silvicultural prescriptions, but it, it it is one of their legal requirements that they have to meet. They have to have this prescription in place before they they move forward on it, um, and it has been a, a major bottleneck for them in getting. Um, getting projects designed and uh, carried out so so do they have somebody on staff that do they have a silviculturist who actually does that they they did uh last i heard their silviculturist left to join one of these enterprise teams that they're trying to hire so i don't know if they currently have a silviculturist on staff but at, the last when I the last I knew that they did have one, they had only one, and and the workload was was great enough that she couldn't yeah. take care of being on her own. So, cool. These are great questions, uh, and this is a huge project. Um, any other questions or discussion on this? We'll look to a motion, maybe. This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to approve it for funding consideration. Okay, we have a motion from Tyler. A second. Dwayne, I'll second the motion. Thank you, Dwayne. Go through the roll call. Justin? Yes. Votes yes. Tyler, you made the motion. So, Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne, you'd seconded. So next, Paul. I'll vote yes. Votes yes. Randy. And also vote yes. Votes yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. That is that is a, a 
large scale, large, large area project that uh, hopefully if everything works out, that'll, that'll work well. So, okay, thanks uh, to the Northeast region folks for their presentations, for joining us today. Um, we're gonna move into our, I guess, final phase of the day uh, with our Southeast region. Uh, project number 5199, Salina Creek, Gooseberry Ecosystems Restoration Project. Uh, go ahead. Hi, everybody. This is, oh, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Nicole. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't showing that I was doing anything on my screen. So yeah, anyhow, you're, you're um, <laughs> all right, I'm Nicole Nilsson. I'm the restoration biologist here in the Southeast region. Um, the first project that we're going to present to you today is this Salina Creek Gooseberry project that the Forest Service is working on. Um, this is a pretty large project that the Forest Service is working on on the south part of the Manti. And as a region, we're pretty excited about it. Um, we've had some sportsman concern and some internal concern about uh, deer populations on the south Manti. And we really feel like this, this project could be really beneficial. Um, our regional internal rankings on this project um, it was our number one deer and our number one our number two elk project so you can see that this this project was viewed pretty highly internally in our region um, it has quite a few different components there's a prescribed burn component a bull hog component some lop and scatter some seeding so um, I don't know yeah just kind of click through some of them the bigger polygons the prescribed fire um, you know, there's there's just various different treatments, but it's all kind of in that that summer range type. You know, it's a little bit lower as your mountain browse zone, but you'll find animals summering in there. And we just feel like this project will have really great benefits to deer and elk on that part of the, the mountain. Um, the Forest Service has been really great to work with. This is the uh, Fish Lake National Forest. So this is kind of, we don't typically work with them in our region. They only kind of, pop into our region a little bit and so been a fantastic group to work with. So that's that's kind of the nuts and bolts of this project. Is there questions? Yeah, go through some of the pictures. So yeah, there's yeah, you know, you're getting higher in elevation. You have, you know, still juniper, but you're in that mountain browse zone. This is Paul Burnett. I just have a quick question while you're going through the images. Um, it, I noticed that a lot of the, um, especially the some of the vegetation treatments are coming down into the riparian on uh, Salina Creek. And um, is there an opportunity to to incorporate um, um, woody debris additions or other types of habitat improvements in Salina Creek, which I recall is pretty hammered. Um, yeah, I think there would be with that. with the Forest Service. Um, I haven't spoke to them directly about that, but I I don't see why they wouldn't want to do fish improvements in there. Um, I, I think in future phases we could definitely do something like that, and I think even this year, you know, just adding some woody debris we could do pretty pretty easily. This is Jordan Nielsen. Can I jump in on uh, fish treatments on Salina Creek for a second? Um, Salina Creek is positive for whirling disease. So that's probably the biggest issue that we face there. It's got a, a genetically unique population of uh, Bonneville cutthroat uh, that we've used to try and duplicate some populations on the on the same mountain range on the on the west side of the, the Mantis there. But um, it does have whirling disease, which is something to consider as we uh, try to do fisheries treatments and in-stream treatments there. That's it, just as a comment. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate that. Okay, any other questions for Nicole on this? Yeah, and I guess I should say, you know, it, it pops up there as upland game. This is part of a, a sage, sage grouse management area. So these treatments could and should benefit sage grouse as well. Okay. 
Do we have a motion on this one? I'll, I'll make that motion, Eric. This is Justin. I make, okay, thank you, I, I make the motion we tentatively approve this for funding. This is Darren. I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Darren. We have a second. Uh, we'll go through the roll call. Justin, you made the motion. So, Tyler, you're next. I vote yes. Tyler votes yes. Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren, you seconded. So, we're on to Dwayne. Yes. Votes yes. Paul? Yes. Votes yes. Randy? Yes. Votes yes. Voting is unanimous and is approved. Okay. Okay. We'll move on to, to project 5220. Is that you again, Nicole? That's me. I'm going to be presenting all of the, the Southeast region ones. So you guys okay. have to listen to me for a while. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, Miller Creek 3.0. So this is a project that we've brought to you guys before. Um, it's kind of a, a watershed level project where we're doing upland treatments and riparian treatments all at the same time. So these drainages come off of the Manti um, at where the Sealy fire occurred. So we've had some you know, post fire damage to some of the riparian areas. And then we've also been working on some of the winter range conditions in those areas where we have pinion juniper encroachment. So you can kind of see some of the bigger bigger blocks are pinion juniper treatments. Yeah, you can see there's the, the yeah, you can see in the yellow, those are all of our pinion juniper treatments. And then we want to continue doing BDAs along Miller Creek where we've we this last year we put in over 80 BDAs along the a stretch of Miller Creek. So we have a little bit more to go on um, some other private lands and just downstream a little bit more from where we're working currently in Miller Creek. And then I'd like to move to the north to our Gordon Creek wildlife management area and start improving stream conditions in, in that area. Um, I guess my big hope and dream is to have the best riparian conditions on our WMA that are that are around and kind of have it be the showcase of the region so that we can show landowners what what BDAs can and can't do for you. So that's that's kind of it. I think I think some of the important things to highlight in this project is all the collaboration we've had. And if you wouldn't mind going to the the contributors part of the of this proposal. Because I mean, there's so many. If I start naming them, I know I'm going to miss a few, and I don't want to miss out on who all we've been working with. So there's Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they're they've been really active in this project with their partners program. Um, Wild Utah Project is they've helped us get volunteers come out, and they've done a lot of the monitoring. Uh, the Turkey Federation very active in this project planning and implementation. Um, DWR obviously, but we've, you know, internally we've had, you know, our fisheries group, our big game group, our habitat group, like all of us are, are collaborating together on that. The BLM's been pretty heavily involved, especially in the upland stuff, but they're really getting interested in the the BDA part, and they're they're wanting to see how they can do this on BLM lands. Um, the Forest Service, they've been actively involved. We've had many different land private landowners that are a part of this, um, the Division of Oil, Gas and Mining, their abandoned mine program. They've started contributing and collaborating with us. Um, they've been working on some abandoned mine closures in this area. So some of that has has to do with stream stream crossings. And so they've collaborated with us because they don't want to impact our project. And we've we've helped them with some of their, you know, how to make these fish friendly, some of their their restoration needs. Conoco Phillips has donated manpower and supplies, and they've been an awesome partner. Uh, Sitla has been active in this, and I think in past phases they've they've contributed financially, or maybe that was a different project. But Sitla's really on board with this project, um, riparian and and the upland part. So we just we have a really robust group that helps us plan and implement this project, and I think that's that's worth highlighting about how special this project has been. And Jordan, you've you've been really really heavily involved. Do you have anything you'd like to contribute to that? 
I think that covers it pretty well. I, uh, if you have the chance to to go drive by this sometime, the, it's pretty impressive how much sediment is still coming out of that drainage. And uh, that contributes to the Price River that has a TMDL for total dissolved solids. So basically the salts that are coming from all of that erosion, uh, these BDAs are collecting it really well. Uh, some of them are filling up in less than a year and aggrading the stream three to four feet. Uh, so as far as the stream work goes, I, I'm no expert in upland stuff, but as far as the stream work goes, uh, it's been uh, an impressive process to watch as we've put uh, some of these low tech structures in and, and allowed them to do their work. And I think maybe a couple other items worth highlighting is um, we've, we've got monitoring in on past phases of pinion juniper treatment and current treatment on small mammals and herps. And so we're just trying to decide how some of these projects impact some of these other wildlife species that aren't as you know, widely known. So yeah, we've, we've used our non-game uh, fisheries group and our non-game wildlife group to help us do that. And they've, they've been really active in the planning process of this too. So it really has been a great internal collaboration as well as external. So yeah, any questions? Uh, this is Jack, I, I have a question. Um, when a BDA fills up with silt, uh, does it still provide some benefit or what, what do you do when that happens? Absolutely, and the way that we're we're putting these in is, you know, sometimes we have really, really deep head cuts. Um, it, Daniel, if you wouldn't mind going to the, the past phase and showing some of the pictures, but some of these cuts are, you know, 20, 30 feet deep. So we kind of have to stagger how we do them and let them fill up and then put BDAs on top of those to kind of get it there. But even the ones that fill, eventually that gets us to our floodplain. So then we, we have the ability to dissipate flood energy from flooding. I mean, like that picture right there that Daniel's on, at this point, that's that can reach the floodplain. It's a graded even since that picture and it can reach the floodplain and dissipate the flood energy. So yeah, they definitely still provide plenty of habitat. And then sometimes on the downside of those BDAs, we get pools. So yeah, it gives us more complex habitat. And Jordan, do you have more to add to that? Yeah, uh, even when those fill up, that just means that water table came up to the level that they've filled to. So it, as long as that sediment stays in place, which they do because they fill up and they're, you know, we have some that you can't even tell that there were posts there anymore. And uh, it, it just maintains that water level a much higher. So these areas, like in that picture, um, that water tables come up and we have uh, rushes and sedges that kind of blanket the banks now, which prevent erosion and, and it looks a lot better. It's better for game, better for grazing and uh, better for flood control. Great, thank you. Great, any other questions? All right, do we have a motion on this project? This is Paul. I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration. It's a great project. Okay, thank you, Paul. We have a motion, is there a second? This is Jack, I'll second the motion. Thank you, Jack. With a second, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin? Yes. Votes yes. Tyler? I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack, you had seconded, so we'll move on to Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne? I vote yes. Votes yes. Um, Paul, you had made the motion, so we'll go to Randy? Yes. Votes yes. So this project um, is unanimously approved. I just want to say this is probably one of the one of the landmark collaborations in our division right now, and and uh, you know I I'm just super happy to see us continue this project and the, the great work that Southeast Region and Nicole and all the others that are, are, have done on this. So, okay, enough of that. We're gonna move on. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah. Six more. Okay. Project five two zero two. Reduction, what is reduction, Nicole? Um, I don't know, because I didn't title it. <laughs> so 
it, it, it's above it. It's the Swayze Dry Wash Grimes Wildlife. Oh, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Swayze Dry Wash Grimes Wildlife Habitat Improvement. Okay. Yes. I mean, I heard somebody earlier say sometimes you don't always get to title these. And so sometimes you get really long, complex names. But this one is also a, a really great collaboration. And, and I feel like a lot of what's happened with that Miller Creek project that I just presented is in our region, just kind of rolling out to all these other projects. So this one started out as our, our Forest Service fuels person came to me with their Swayze project, which you've seen other phases of that. Um, he came to me, wanted to know what he could do to help improve it and make it a better project. And I, I had been working on the Grimes project that's just off of the Mesa down below near the town of Orangeville. I said, well, why don't we team up together? Like these these projects are working with the same populations of wildlife. Like we we really need to team these up and do these together. And then pretty soon we're working with the forestry fire and state lands person who's doing some fuels reduction work around some private land there. And he he's coming to, a, to me and to the, the group, like how do I make my project as good as it can be for wildlife? So we've, we've kind of combined these together to really help improve each other's projects by adding, you know, that way they can help my project be more of a, a fuels reduction where it's so close to town and I can help their projects become wildlife projects so that we're, we're getting the most bang for the buck out of these, these projects. So you can see there's some conifer removal in the riparian areas right there outside of Joe's Valley on Lowry Water. And then you move south and there's some pinyon juniper and it's in the mountain browse zone. So a lot of times we masticate basil resprouting shrubs like service berry and mahogany to stimulate growth on those. So there will be more, more mastication in those areas. And then as you fall off the plateau down lower into really critical winter range, we're doing um, mastication of pinyon juniper in encroaching or sorry, wow, I'm repeating myself, encroaching pinion juniper for doing mastication. So that's that's kind of this project as a whole. Oh, and then there's some some treatment areas above Farron in, you know, there's isolated pockets of winter range along this. So we're working on reducing encroaching pinion juniper. So this this project really kind of focuses on, you know, winter range and transitional range and in our region with our regional rankings. This came out as our number four deer and elk project both. I mean, sometimes it was so hard trying to decide which one is better than the next that it was it was really hard. But this one was viewed very, very highly by by our regional biologists. So are there any questions? So well presented, I guess not. <laughs> okay. Nicole, I would just say thanks for all your efforts on the South Manti. That's an area that uh, sportsmen have been concerned about with mule deer for a long, long time. So a great location, great project. And the South Manti is a, definitely a challenge because we do have isolated pockets of, of habitat. So sometimes it's hard, you know, logistically to get people and equipment in. So when we when we get it figured out, it's it's a really good thing. And so I'm impressed with our partners. Great. Um, do we have a motion on this project? I'll make a motion. This is Paul. Um, I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project funding consideration. And compliments, Nicole, you do a great job building partnerships. This is Dwayne. I'll second it. Okay, thanks. We have a motion from Dwayne, from Paul and a second from Dwayne. Uh, we'll go through the roll call. Justin? Yes. Welch, yes. Tyler? Yes. Welch, yes. Jack? Yes. Welch, yes. Darren? Yes. Well, yes. Dwayne, you had the second. Paul, you had the motion. Randy. Yes. Votes well, yes. Okay. Uh, voting is unanimous in favor. All right.
Okay, next one, Nicole, 5260 Mill Creek Watershed Restoration Partnership. You and your okay. partnerships going on. Well, that I think people really have seen what's happened in with the, the Miller Creek project and and they're kind of coming to me because sometimes, you know, various personalities have hard times working together. But if you can get, you know, one central person that's kind of trusted amongst them, you can you can really build something really big. And so that's kind of what we've done with this one was we got multiple partners together and just kind of sat at the table and said, What what are you working on and where could you help? help move this project along and so this one's a partnership with some nonprofits, uh rim to rim restoration um, forestry fire and state lands the blm the forest service um, myself uh, i'm probably missing some partners in that but you could see that it starts all the way in the town of moab and works up the mill creek drainages until you end up on the forest and so you you kind of hit um summer range for deer and elk on on that forest service lands you get turkeys in that area especially in the the drainages but up there on the the forest in the oak we we see turkeys a lot and this is one that dustin mitchell the local biologist when i was showing him he he was really excited especially about the stuff that's happening on the the forest service um the LaSalle unit has has been struggling it's um i'm struggling to find my notes but it's well well under objective for for deer and so anything we can do and fawn recruitment's been pretty pretty bad too so those areas on the forest service would really help with fawning habitat and overall deer condition so we're we're really excited to see some of that and then as we come up the the riparian area from moab up towards the forest service you know we're improving riparian conditions so we're just having great benefits to to the riparian area so any any wildlife that shows up in those has a great benefit and I, you know when we talked about this regionally we had a lot of excitement amongst many of our different different biologists about this project so that's that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it what is there questions on on this project I, I've got a question it's not necessarily specific to this project, but there's been a couple of years thus far that have got counties to partner and throw money at it. How, just, I mean, I don't want this to be a long discussion, but how, how are you guys engaging counties to the point where they're willing to fund some of these restoration projects? Because I think that's, I think that's exceptional. You know, I really have to say that that's, that's all of the partners that we get to the table that they bring bring other partners such as the counties to the table and and the county's really interested in the the fuels reduction to that to these by removing tamarisk you know and those drainages lead right into town so you know they can they can see the benefit from that aspect and you know when we when we all work together we can structure these projects so that they have that wildfire benefit as well as a wildlife benefit so that that's kind of how it's it's mostly the partners that are bringing them to the table Thank you. Um, this is Paul. Is there a sport fish uh, component here? No, I don't. I don't think we really could claim too much sport fish. Maybe more native fish. Did I did I claim okay. some sport fish on this? I think it was I think it was in the habitat funny guy. If if not, I was just gonna move that over to the native fish. I know it all comes out of the same, but and and Jordan probably can speak a little bit better than I can to um any native fish in, in Mill Creek or or mm -hmm. yeah, sport fish, I'm sorry. Jordan log off. He's on, he's muted. Randy, maybe do you have any uh, insight there? I don't have a whole lot of insight. I don't think there's too much sport fish value. I'm not saying there's none, but I don't think there's a whole lot. I mean, I think looking at those percentages is probably maybe a little overweighted towards sport fish because if there's any contribution, it's pretty pretty trivial there. I, uh, I, I, would, I would maybe just propose moving the, the sport fish 
funding or allocation to uh, to non game fish. So so it's thirty percent non game fish. Okay. Do you want to put that in a motion? Sure. So I'll make I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this. If there aren't any more questions, I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this uh, project for funding consideration um, and move the 20% sport fish to non-game fish. So it should be 30% non-game fish. And I'll second that. Okay. So Daniel, did you get the those percentages? Or Allison? Yep, they're changed on the display. Okay. And Paul, you made the motion, correct? Yep. That's and correct. The second, and the second was from who? Randy? Who made the second on that one? Yeah, it was me, Eric. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Okay. Justin? Yes. Oops, yes. Tyler? Yes. Votes yes. Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne? Yes. Votes yes. Paul, you made the motion and Randy, you had seconded. So um, motion carries unanimously. Cool. Okay. All right. 5218, LaSalle Abajo prescribed fire. Go. Okay, so this is a prescribed fire project on the south zone of the, the Manti LaSalle National Forest. So it's some of it's on the LaSalle's and some of it's on the Abajos as well as Elk Ridge. Um, they kind of set it up this way so that when you get the right fuel conditions in certain places, you can burn. So hopefully one, one of those different areas is um, in, con in prescription for burning. That, you know, when it's right. So that's kind of what, why you're seeing so many different areas targeted there. Um, so theoretically, probably only, you know, one or two of those polygons would be burned if if this was to get funded. But we've we've brought this in the past and it's working, I, I feel like, pretty well because most of the time they do fi find a way to burn a little bit of it and, and get some acres towards wildlife. Um, Anytime we see prescribed burning here in the region, we get really excited. Um, so this is our number, as with our regional rankings, this one's our number one turkey, number two deer, and number three elk project, I think, if I have that right. So you can see that as, as a region, the biologists just think really highly of this project. Um, the LaSalle's and, and the Abajos both kind of have the same thing going on. Um, the, they're well well below objective for deer. Um, bond to doe ratios are really weak. So projects like this, especially on summer range, could really help body conditions and really improve improve habitat for wildlife. So that's that's the prescribed burning on the South Zone project. If there's any questions. Yeah, I've got one, Nicole. I th I thought we already burnt Lackey Basin years ago. Is it is this a different project on the south end of the Salles, or is this so, more the higher yeah. stuff? It, this is all part of Lackey Basin. So actually, it burned as a wildfire. They called it Lackey, but it was more in Carpenter Basin, which is just to the west of of Lackey. Um, they have burned some of the in a prescribed fire, burned some of the lower Ponderosa stuff. So this would just be going up the mountain a little bit more into the Aspen zone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll ask a question real fast. The LaSalle burn area you're looking at looks like it's within a couple miles of a really critical cutthroat population that we have. I wonder if you've just discussed this with our aquatics folks to make sure they have no concerns with it. Yep, we have definitely had conversations with Calvin on this. You know, we've the Forest Service is very aware of those those populations. So yes, in the way that it's we're trying to design it. I mean, you can never say that the wild or a prescribed fire couldn't get outside of your lines, but the idea is to keep it on on the other side of the drainage from that. So yeah, but yes, we have communicated with Calvin. 
Okay, thanks. All right, uh, Daniel, can you look at the financials on this one again? Okay, are there any other questions about this project? Hey, Nicole, this is Darren. Did you say this one would be beneficial to turkeys? Yeah, I mean, especially on the the stuff on the Abajos and Elk Ridge, it was our our number one regional ranked turkey project. Um, kind of the thought process with that is, you know, we have a pretty good turkey population if we keep you know, keep that habitat really good for them. A lot of times we use that as a trans translocation population. So we would keep and maintain that so we could keep moving them. Okay. I just been looking at this and it shows it's ranked as a hundred percent mule deer or excuse me, big game. Yeah. I think it would, would be fair to, to use um, some upland funding for, for turkeys on that. Dwayne, good number. Uh, I'd say 15. Nicole, you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Are turkeys really upland game? Yes, they are. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I've released turkeys in one of those polygons by Elk Ridge. So I, I'd agree with you, Darren. I think 15 is fine. Justin, try not to talk about your staff like that, okay? <laughs> but, okay. At least turkeys? <laughs> okay, never mind. All right, uh, do we have a motion on this project? I'll make a motion as Darren to tentatively approve this for funding consideration. Okay, we have a motion from Darren. Is there a second? There's Dwayne, I'll second it. Okay, Dwayne, there's a is the second and uh, just to clarify does this motion include the adjusted uh, allocation uh, to 85 and 15 is that correct Darren I guess sorry what was that your motion includes the adjusted allocation uh, from 100 percent big game to 85 and 15 correct Yes, sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Okay, we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Justin? Yes. Votes yes. Tyler? Vote yes. Votes yes. Jack? Yes. Votes yes. Darren, you made the motion. Dwayne, you seconded. Paul? I vote yes. Votes yes. Randy? I also vote yes. Votes yes. Okay, motion carries unanimously with adjusted... Uh, funding percentages at 85 and 15 percent for big game and upland. Okay. Project 5230 shingle mill phase two go. Okay, so this is a, a project with the Forest Service and private lands, forestry fire and state lands just south of Monticello. Um, so the Forest Service has has been working on some of this project. Um, can you turn on the adjacent polygons? So we've we've done other phases of this project, and you can kind of see, <laughs> well, there's a whole lot of other colors there, but you can see kind of near the blue polygons. That's what we worked on this last year. So we're masticating encroaching pinion juniper and masticating some of the oak to try to stimulate growth so that you, we have different age classes and we don't have a, a monoculture of just one, one age class of oak. Um, so we're we're really excited about this project. Uh, Forest Service has done quite a bit of work and then Forestry Fire and State Lands has been working with a landowner. Um, we also have, the, have worked with the NRCS on this. So on the private lands, the, the landowner is funded for NRCS work. Um, this, this came to the group last year, but we didn't quite get all of our art clearance done in time to implement this year. So we we pulled back on actually implementation in the current year and we're going to try to implement next year. But that's that's a really great partnership with the NRCS where 
you know, they're they're seeing how we can make WRI and NRCS programs join together and help benefit wildlife on on private land. So that one's funded with NRCS dollars, and all we would really be asking for is anything any additional cost to help cover cover that. So. Yeah, I feel like this has been another, I feel like I say this a lot, but this has been another really good collaborative project, especially, you know, with the Forest Service NRCS, Forestry Fire State Lands, myself to to bring together this bigger project. And yeah, I love it when the Forest Service puts these together, some of the the different photos. Um, sometimes they put together different, you know, year of the the stand. So, yeah, that just kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at. We have encroaching pinyon juniper into the mountain browse zone, and it's really critical for for deer, elk, turkey, everything on the blues. And like I said in the the last proposal, the Bajos, the they're well below population objective. The fond to ratio really has been struggling, so this really could help help out quite a bit. So, any questions? All right. If there's not any questions, could there be a motion? This is Tyler. I'll make the motion to tentatively approve it for funding consideration. This is Jack. I'll second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion from Tyler to approve and a second from Jack. Uh, go through the roll call. Justin. Yes. Vote yes. Tyler, you made the motion. Jack, you approve. So Darren. Yes. Vote yes. Dwayne. Yes. Vote yes. Paul. I vote yes. Vote yes, Randy. And yes. Vote yes. Voting is affirmative and um, motion carries. All right. Two left. 5290 South Book Cliffs, phase eight. Phase eight. Wow. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, this one really has been going for a while, but this one was developed uh, actually when Daniel was the restoration biologist here. So the idea with this project was to treat all of the winter range benches along the South Book Cliffs, but the way that we the project was designed was so that we could work with grazers and no grazer was impacted for too long. So we had kind of a strange rotation where you would jump all over so that we could rest seating and still allow grazers in a, a different part of their allotment or different allotments that they had. So this one, since we've been keeping on track with getting this funded and moving forward with our treatments, we've we've really had a lot of buy-in from the, the grazing community on, in this area. So this year's treatment is outside of the cottonwood drainage on the benches there. Um, it's really crucial winter range for deer. Um, there's You find turkeys on the, there's a piece of private as you go up, it's agricultural land. You know, so the turkeys come out in there. So it's, this project has benefit to the turkeys that come off of that that ag land. Um, another really kind of neat part about this project is uh, last year, our our non game group they've been doing pinion jay surveys, and they they one of their their survey areas was in this this area, so they did kind of detect some pinion jays. So they've went back and actually this morning I got a message from our non-game biologist and he said they did find signs of a colony. So this is a, we're going to try to work with this project and see if we can, you know, continue to do treatments in this area and not impact pinion jays. So it's kind of a, a great collaborative project with our non-game group, with the grazers on the South Book Cliffs, with the BLM. Um, trust lands has been involved. Um, that one trust lands block that you can see in there, that was chained. Um, I can't remember now, I think in like 2006. So we just need to do some retreatment on the re-sprouts. So that one's just lop and scatter. There are some bull hog polygons in this. So that would come with aerial seeding, uh, two year resting period for the grazers. But the grazers have been really, really pretty excited about what's happening. So we've we've had really good buy-in. 
So that's the South Book Cliffs Phase 8. Oh, yeah, I guess I should mention, so they they did this year when they were doing some of their elk captures, they used some of the polygons as areas where they found elk and, and captured them. So they were telling me not only good habitat treatments, good good capture locations. <laughs> So any questions? Okay, if I don't hear any questions, uh, do we have a motion on this project? This is Justin. I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve this project for funding. Thank you, Justin. Do we have a second? This is Dwayne, I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Dwayne. I'll do the roll call. Justin, you made the motion, so Tyler? About yes. Felt yes, Jack? Yeah. Felt yes, Darren? Yes. Felt yes, Dwayne, you'd seconded, so we'll go to Paul. I vote yes. Felt yes, Randy? I vote yes. Felt yes, motion carries unanimously, thank you. Okay, last one. And then after this project, we have some housekeeping things to do for Habitat Council. So uh, don't jump off too quickly, Habitat Council folks, and then uh, we'll go from there. So 5185 Mantela Sal, North Zone Prescribed Fire, go. Okay, this is a very similar to the South Zone fire, um, but it's on the North Zone of the Manti. So just above um, Orangeville, Farron, Emory, they've developed different burn units so that when when conditions are right, they can can go in and burn these different areas. So some of it's Ponderosa understory burning. Some of it's actually getting into aspen and and burning in that to create aspen regeneration. Um, you can see that it's kind of around Joe's Valley Reservoir to the north, and then um, the the Pines area just outside of Emory. Really good habitat for for deer and elk. So this was our, in our regional rankings. This is our number one elk project and our number three deer project. So um, I know that we debated long and hard over the north zone prescribed fire versus the south zone prescribed fire, and eventually you just kind of had to flip a coin and decide. So these were both viewed very highly by the regional biologist. Um, the Manti is below objective, so this really could help. Uh, bonding conditions. So yeah, that's that's the North Zone prescribed fire. And I think if, if you can go through some of the pictures, that would be really helpful. They did a really good job with their pictures on this one. So yeah, this is kind of the Trail Mountains prescribed fire that burned a few years ago. You can see that we got really awesome aspen regeneration afterwards. And that's that's kind of what we're hoping for again. Maybe a little less jumping the line, turning into a wildfire, but so yeah, that's that's the project. Are there any questions? What was the Habitat Council amount on that one, Daniel? Okay, 10,000. Okay, any questions? All right, do we have a motion on this project? This is Darren Westall. Make a motion to tentatively approve this for funding. Okay, thank you, Darren. Is there a second? This Tyler, I'll second it. Okay, we have a second from Tyler. We'll go through the roll call, Justin. Yes. Both yes. Tyler, you have the second. So Jack. Yes. Both yes. Darren, you have the motion. So Dwayne. Uh, don't hear you, Dwayne. <laughs> I couldn't find the button. Yes. Okay. Both yes. Paul. I vote yes. Both yes. Randy. I also vote yes. Both yes. The motion carries unanim unanimously. 
Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Nicole, for presenting thank all of the Southeast too. region things. I think you see there's a lot of great work going on in Southeast region collaboratively, and I think it's pretty fantastic. So, I okay. appreciate you guys this time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, I want to thank everybody from our Southeast region and all of our regions who've joined us. Um, we're going to talk about a few more things just from a Habitat Council standpoint here. Um, now that we're done approving projects uh, for today, um, we'll mention again our next Monday or our next meeting is May 14th, which is our funding meeting. And so um, I don't know, either Daniel, you want to talk about that or Tyler? I guess more Daniel than Tyler. But. So the next meeting is the funding meeting. Um, you've all received this spreadsheet that uh, has all of the projects put together on it. Um, looking at the very top up here, these are the old numbers. We hope to have those new numbers here shortly um, with the extra 400,000 um, that will be added to this. So this is the total amount that Habitat Council is um, funded typically it's 2.9 million that we receive every single year. Um, this year we're getting the additional 400k added on. You can see this is what's requested right now and the difference. And then that's broken out by each of your different uh, categories. So for big game, upland game, waterfowl, sport fish. So at the funding meeting, uh, at some point. These numbers will have to be reconciled to um, be fairly close to zero, not necessarily, but somewhere in that vicinity. So as you guys kind of work together um, with uh, the DWR uh, and representative and the um, public representative, just work together to kind of work those out. We'll also come up with some suggestions on how to, to move those forward as well. Anything else, Allison, you want to say about the spreadsheet? Um, only thing to mention would be that uh, the, the spreadsheet will change once we get all of our sportsman uh, external conservation permit uh, amounts entered in by the groups. So um, don't stress about that, how high those numbers are as far as how much over you are, because um, that will change quite a bit. I've been watching the numbers come in on the other spreadsheet today, and they've uh, those numbers will change a bit. So, and that don't and stress that funding yet. meeting is tomorrow, uh, correct? Yes. So we'll um, you know kind of solidify all those numbers tomorrow, and then I'll update the spreadsheet. Um, so you know, don't stress about those numbers until maybe the first of next week. Okay, and then you can also see on this on the, the spreadsheet there under uh, just above the word sport fish, you know, it shows an I guess an overage of about 32,000. So this was to, I think it was Tyler that made the point that if, if our approved amount from the legislature of an additional 400,000 goes through, um, you know, there might be additional monies there left to spend out uh, for sport fish, but we'll see. Yeah, their amount would be an additional 160 yeah. approximately. So that's that leaves about 130,000 that would be unspent at this point. Okay, any other questions about the spreadsheet and where we're at with funding right now? Eric, this is Tyler. A question I've got, I'm just curious, are you guys receiving um, direction from the director's office right now to add that 400,000 or is there still a possibility it'll be withheld? Uh, our, our direction is that it probably won't be withheld, but we've been told to hold off, I guess, considering it currently general fund that's just it's spending out existing monies that's part of our restricted account and so we're not seeing how that could be held back 
but we have been essentially told to hold off for the time being. So just, just so I understand, I'm sorry, just so I understand this. So for instance, on the waterfowl, this means that 75% roughly of the requested amounts need to be cut. Yeah, and I think the big player there, Jack, is probably that Till Lake project that Farmington Bay brought that was like a $200,000 project. That could be one of your big players right now. Okay, are there, um, yeah, alternate sources of, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just wondering if there are other things I should be taking into consideration as I uh, you know, go over those numbers. We already have to put out Allison with PR, correct? What did you say? PR is already accounted for in the numbers that are showing up here, correct? Correct. Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah, that's a big request for a small amount. Okay. Were we going to try to get SFW or to cover some of those matching amounts like they did last year? Yes. And they, there are some proposals that already have that. I'm not sure if they're reflected on this though yet. So I need to just um, do a email with uh, SFW and our waterfowl guys and, and Get them to tell me what for sure they are going to commit. Um, we don't have those projects on our ECP uh, funding list. Those will be external. I mean, they'll be expo permit dollars that would have to go on those projects. So I'll just have to set, meet with them separately to get those numbers. That could help a little bit. So I think. Jack, I, you know, you, you ask a good question and, uh, you know, the way Habitat Council is set up, I mean, that, those are the percentages for waterfowl that are allocated. And so I'm, a lot of that gets taken up with, um, you know, waterfowl management area maintenance and, and that kind of stuff. And so I guess I'm going to be looking at some point, I mean, I see that and I see, you know, I don't know something to, to look into, and and so I'll be looking at at uh, Blair Stringham and Justin here at some point, maybe to have a discussion about about where we're at with our funding mechanisms for waterfowl management areas versus you know other sources that are you know possible. And I don't know, just want to just want to hit everybody up at least internally in the division to see if there's something we can change there to free up some, some of the Habitat Council money at all. Yeah, other, other yeah. I think, and I, I don't know where this conversation needs to take place, but it seems like there's a real structural problem because most of the, well, a good portion of the requested money is just annual maintenance. It's not, you know, these fun habitat projects that everyone's, you know, like we've been listening to all day of doing things that's, you know, rebuilding dikes and putting in, you know, culvert and stuff like that. So it seems like those should be handled out of the normal DWR budget and Habitat Council fund should probably be directed towards things that are true habitat projects. But that's, you know, maybe that's a, a discussion for a different venue. Yeah, I think that's something that we're going to have to, like I say, work through our director's office and in there with Justin and Blair and and I don't know. Well, Eric, we just did. Um, we just we just talked about those things. So um, yeah. after our last meeting, with Drew's conversations um, on on funding and those types of things, we uh, are for maintenance and and what sh what should this these dollars be used for? Um, I walked away from that meeting thinking that waterfowl management is so intense i mean you, you don't have all the structures you don't have all the maintenance you don't have all that uh needs for a lop and scatter and so um, but but when you're controlling water adjacent the great salt lake and doing a bunch of that it's it's extremely intensive 
and there is a cost associated with it. And that's one of the reasons Habitat Council was established to begin with. And so um, I don't think the, I, I think Jack brings up some good points. It's not like there's this flush account where you can go do all this really fun and amazing things. Um, sometimes it's just doing the dirty work to make sure that that infrastructure remains and so that we can make sure that some of these areas have the right amount of water, um, water depths and different things like that uh, come fall and during the hunting seasons. And so uh, I'm not entirely sure what the answer is, Jack, but um, you know, this is this is one of the reasons that the Habitat Council exists is to to help fund some of that really intense waterfowl maintenance that some of the other programs don't have. So So that so, oh, go I, ahead. Have, I have the same I had the same question, I guess, is you know, when we talked about things like replacing the water pump at uh, Farmington Bay, so that you're still saying that's Habitat Council type work. I, I'm I'm saying it's eligible for Habitat Council. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it, it, you know, and, th and that was part of the conversation last time was, should it be used? Should it not be used? Well, if you if you look at the code and the purposes, it's it's eligible, and um, and so it, it boils down to should we be using it or not. If we want to have that philosophical discussion, we can certainly have it. But there's I mean, in, in visiting these WM, these waterfowl management areas, there is some real intense management that occurs there, and there's some real cost to doing what we're doing. Um, so I, I don't know. If there's the other thing that we have stacked against us is we don't have conservation permit dollars for waterfowl because they're not a conservation permit species. And so they, you know, you know a lot of times with big game and turkeys and some of the other stuff, they'll have that type of funding source. Waterfowl doesn't, unfortunately. Um, so I, things are always a little tight in that arena. Yeah, and so maybe some other background on this, you know, the percentages that are listed here, you know, those those are those are listed by statute. And so we can't really deviate a whole lot from those percentages, but I guess, you know, Justin, we did talk with the director's office here last week, but I think our conversation was, was not very specific to you know waterfowl management areas and so i think i'd still like to have some additional discussion about are there ways that we can leverage other sources of funding to maybe you know do some of the these other maintenance activities so that we can fund you know more new projects for waterfowl or or how do we go through a process to change our our statute or our our rule to adjust those percentages then and uh, like you say, you know, conservation permit funding is 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 not allowed for waterfowl. Is there a way that we can change that? I bet that there's some waterfowl groups that might want to contribute. Um, you know, like like we do with big game, and and I don't know. There's it's a it's a time where we can maybe think about you know thinking outside the box with with waterfowl, and 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 we have such a rich history. You know, as Jack knows better than any of us uh, with waterfowl in, in Utah. And, and uh, we need to, you know, continue to try to maintain, maintain that history and, and, you know, that habitat. So. Well, I, you know, I don't want to you know, rob Peter of yeah. the turf battle kind of situation, but, you know, maybe I, I think, um, and I don't know who to uh, appropriately request this with, and I don't want to take up a lot of everyone's time after a long day, but, you know, maybe um, it's time to kind of have a, a discussion between some representatives of the waterfowling community and people from DWR about how to, um, you know, better accommodate the, the needs of the waterfowl program. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to having those conversations, Jack. There, there's... There's no doubt that there's some good things. And I, and you know, last year, I'm grateful that groups like SFW stepped up with their expo permit funds and, and bought some marsh masters and, and did some other things like that, which is really gonna help us bring less projects um, through Habitat Council because we have the equipment to fund some of that. And it's, it, we can tie that into what we're doing on these landscapes. So um, yeah, I, I'm open to ideas, so. Thank you. Yep, good discussion. 
Okay, uh, Daniel, anything else from a process standpoint that we need to talk about in regards to March or May 14th or any other items? No, I have I think one thing. Or ideas is the only other one. Justin brought up one idea. Um, be thinking of some of those ideas and we can plan some of those for the next May 14th meeting. Okay, sounds good. Danny? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that we have a uh, habitat management plan to review on that May 14th meeting. It'll be presented from the southern region, the beaver habitat uh, management area. So uh, I'll send that out shortly um, so the council can review that. It's not as long as other ones we've had in the past, but uh, we'll get a presentation by uh, the southern region on that management plan for the council. Okay. Yep. You're correct. Okay. I, I've got a quick question. Does this funding meeting typically go the four hours? I had something come up at 1130 that day. Um, so I'll be there from nine to 1130 for sure. But um, it, is it one where I should probably get Blair or someone else to, to fill in for me? Or are we typically done putting money to projects pretty quick on this? I can't remember. I want to say last year we didn't go the full time, so it should probably go fairly, fairly quick. But. I would say, though, that uh, it's important to be there for as long as you can. So when we have, you know, there's decisions to be made. I think that uh, you'll want to be making Justin, I think so. Okay, anything else we need to bring up right now? Okay, sounds good. Um, we'll get emails about uh, minutes of this meeting and emails about agenda for the next meeting. Um, and let's see, be thinking about um, potential uh, summer tour of course, pending, you know, COVID rules at the time, you know, we don't know what that's gonna look like. So I'm sure we could have a tour as long as we're maybe traveling, not with a whole bunch of people. So I, I don't know, we'll have to see how that goes. But be, think, be thinking about that. Um, hey, I think that's about all we have today. Um, then we wanna make a motion to adjourn. I'll adjourn. make the motion. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn from Jack. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Second from Tyler. All in favor, say yes. 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 Okay, motion carries. We'll adjourn for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for serving on Habitat Council. Thank you, everybody. See you guys. Thanks, you guys. Daniel, anything else you need to discuss? Uh, thank the tech team, Mike and Paul. Thanks so much. Appreciate all your work. Our pleasure. Thank you. you. You both do a great job, so appreciate it. Uh, do, we okay. wanna, do we wanna talk about tomorrow at all? You bet. Well, yeah. Still on.